call upon uh, Councillor Lovelace to mention something, and then we'll have a moment of silence. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. It is with great sadness that um, I need to share with you that Hunter Marsden has passed away. Hunter uh, was diagnosed with cancer at the age of eight, grade three student at St. Margaret's um, Elementary School. So for the past five, six years, he has fought a really hard fight. And um, last week, he lost it. He was um, inspirational and a strong, strong, beautiful little boy who actually is a teenager. Um, he, he was um, so inspirational to the entire community of uh, Hammonds Plains St. Margaret's and uh, to his mom, Tina, and his dad, Sean, and all of his family and everyone, all of the medical personnel who responded uh, so compassionately to Hunter over the past few years at the IWK and at the Toronto Children's Hospital. We thank them for their work uh, with Hunter and uh, may he rest in peace, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that. We'll take a moment of silence, uh, colleagues. Thank you. Okay. It is January the 9th. It is 2024. This is our first uh, meeting of the new year. We have uh, a couple of pu public hearings um, tonight. I want to begin um, acknowledging that we're in Mi'kma'ki, which is the traditional and unsurrendered land of the Mi'kmaq people. And in this municipality, in this council, we honor the peace and friendship treaties that go back to the 1720s um, and acknowledge the importance of uh, the First Nations, in particular the Mi'kmaq here in this territory. Okay, um, now. We're, so the meeting's called to order. We are now going to go right into a special uh, presentation from PVFC. That's the Property Valuation Services Corporation, um, which is always something we look forward to at the beginning of the year to see where things are. And uh, so, I'm not sure if I know who do we have here, uh, Madam CEO. We welcome the folks from PVFC to come forward in any event. I'm sure you know your names and you'll share that with us. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm Rebecca Vorstmans with Property Valuation Services Corporation and with me is Jeff Cadell. He's our Assistant Director of Operations and he's gonna be going through a presentation for you today. Um, and then we're looking forward to taking your questions. Very good, welcome to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and good afternoon, Council. Um, just want to start, uh, I'll, if we have a, a number of slides here, we just want to run through. Well, just a few reminders around uh, who PVSC is and, and what we do. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, market value and the mass appraisal process. We'll uh, speak to uh, a summary of, of, of some uh, assessment role results in HRM and then discuss the, uh, the inquiry and appeal period. So just a reminder about uh, who PVSC is. Uh, we were created under the Property Valuation Service Corporation Act, and we are responsible for assessing all property in Nova Scotia as per the Nova Scotia Assessment Act. We are an independent, non-profit organization, and we are funded by the 49 municipalities of the province. We're governed by a board of directors, and currently we have 130 employees at PVSC who work remotely across 50 communities in Nova Scotia. 
Uh, being an active organization in industry events and collaboration is important to PVSC. It's an opportunity for us to learn and share ideas with other assessment jurisdictions. PVC is actively involved in national and international property assessment industry events such as conferences, panels, research and benchmarking activities with other jurisdictions. And recently uh, at an international conference, PVC was recognized uh, through an independent global research activity as the most advanced jurisdiction in technical capacity and market sophistication for the application of mass appraisal. That was a combined research project uh, between uh, uh, professionals at the University of Ulster and, and from South Africa. The Nova Scotia Assessment Act stipulates that all property in Nova Scotia is to be assessed at market value. And inherent in the mass appraisal uh, process, all properties are valued at the same date each year. And that date is known as our base date or our date of valuation. The date of, the date of valuation for the 2024 assessment role is January 1st, 2023. Also in that value, we consider the state of the property at December 1st, 2023. That's known as our state date. So just a little bit about mass appraisal. Mass appraisal, it's the, the definition of mass appraisal is the process of valuing a group of properties as of the given date using common data with standardized methods and statistical testing. And PVC uses this mass appraisal process to determine the value of all 647,000 properties in Nova Scotia. Our property assessments are based on market evidence. That means we use sales data from the months leading up to our base date to help establish value, market values for all properties in the province. There's a number of contributing factors that, we, that are key ingredients in helping establish those values. Of course, one is, is sales data. So all sales uh, in the province uh, uh, are received by PVSC and our assessors review those sales to help understand the various markets within HRM and, the, and understanding what is being purchased. The other key ingredient is property attributes such as location, property size, uh, quality of construction, age and condition, and so on. And that's what is important also at our state date, but also feeds into our sales analysis. It allows us to draw a correlation between building attributes and sales prices that are being paid for those properties. We use that data to help us establish values for other similar properties, even those properties that haven't sold. At PBC, and not unlike appraisal theory, we have three approaches to value at our disposal. Um, all three internationally accepted valuation standards are, are used depending on the type of property and depending how often those properties transact in the market. The sales comparison approach is the most preferred, is the industry uh, preferred uh, approach for residential property. And the majority of our residential properties are valued uh, through the, the, the direct sales comparison approach. And that, is allow, that allows us to analyze sales data using those attributes to draw a correlation between <coughs> distinct attributes of properties that have sold and their sale prices, which then allows us to, uh, to, uh, to make determination of value for similar types of properties in those same market areas. We use the income approach to value for income producing properties and we may also use the cost approach for very unique types of properties uh, that may not transact often in the marketplace. Some important dates to note, of course, the assessment role, the no assessment notices were delivered uh, yesterday, January 8th, and the values on those assessment notices are reflecting market value as of January 1st, 2023. And as I mentioned earlier, within that value, we are considering the state of the property as of December 1st, 2023. With notices being delivered yesterday, that starts the 31-day appeal period for all, uh, all property owners. And if property owners wish to appeal their assessment, they must do so by midnight on February 8th. 
Just looking at some activity uh, that occurred in HRM at, at PVSC over the past year during 2023, we, re we re reviewed and inspected uh, about 4,700 building permits. So that involves our assessors receiving those building permits from the municipality, reviewing them and inspecting to help us keep our data current in our system. And even though we, don't ins we can't inspect all properties at December 1st, we inspect properties as close to December 1st as possible to ensure that we are accurately, accurately reflecting the state of the property at December 1st. We received and reviewed almost 12,000 uh, uh, sales, so property transactions uh, at PBC over the past year. And of course, that is what that sales analysis, that data, uh, and what's important for the assessor when reviewing sales is understanding the validity of the sale, ensuring that it represents market value, understanding what was purchased, and ensuring we have the data correct as that feeds into our sales analysis, which allows us to value other properties. And we also reviewed and processed uh, roughly 5,800 assessment appeals over the past year. To help us prepare and communicate and be effective in defending our values, it's important that we regularly monitor uh, and analyze uh, appeal volumes, uh, arguments being made by both property owners and tax agents, and the decisions arising from those, from those appeals, especially tax policy and how that may impact assessed values uh, in the coming years. So it's something that we, uh, we feel it's important to understand that uh, monitor that so we can report back to staff at, at HRM uh, so uh, uh, appropriate budgeting can take place for, for appeal adjustments. And of course, PVC will be monitoring if there are any effects uh, related to Halifax's uh, tiered commercial tax policy. Just want to speak briefly on uh, the various levels of appeals. When a property owner first appeals uh, their assessment, if they do so by midnight on February 8th, the first step in that process is reviewing uh, that appeal, reviewing the information with, with uh, one of our assessors. And our assessors will uh, review the property with, uh, with the property owner. Uh, they'll speak to them. They may arrange for an inspection to validate the, uh, the information we have on file. But the assessor will also review market data with that property owner uh, to establish whether the assessment uh, is reflecting uh, the range of market value in that particular area for that for that property type. If the property owner uh, at sorry at at that stage, the the assessor will either uh, amend the value under appeal or confirm the value if it if we we find that the the data is ac accurate and yeah the, the uh, and that the uh, the value is representing market value uh, or the value may be confirmed. Uh, if the property owner is not satisfied with that decision, they have the opportunity to continue the appeal to the Nova Scotia Assessment Appeal Tribunal. And at that point, uh, the, the appeal is in the hands of the tribunal, which is independent from PVSC, and a hearing will be held with the assessor, the property owner, and the member of that tribunal will make a decision. And if PVSC or the property owner are, are dissatisfied with that decision, there is the opportunity to appeal uh, to the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. Just, just a, 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 a brief summary of the assessment role in, in HRM. Uh, we can see here the total values uh, in each of these categories uh, from 2023 to 2024. So our total residential value is up uh, close to 79 million. And that was a 17.5% increase over, over 2023. When we factor in the capped assessments to the residential properties, we're at about 58.9 billion, which is an increase of 8.6% over the previous year. Total commercial up to 17.5 billion, and that's an increase of 8.7%. And that brings us to a, a total roll uh, increase of 15.8% up to about 96.4 billion. And I should note that each of these categories and, and as well as the total assessment value includes uh, all classifications, whether it be, resi uh, whether it be uh, uh, the, the residential includes resource property, but this, all these values include taxable and exempt values. 
Just a few sector highlights in the commercial file. Oh, sorry, just want to talk a bit about uh, some unique events that we had occur in, in the province this year. Uh, these, uh, in referring to the wildfires and the floods this, this past summer. Um, I talked about the state data earlier and it's important for PBSC to have accurate data on all properties as of the state date of December 1st. And PBC worked very closely with staff here at H HRM, the EMO, and directly with property owners to identify properties that were directly impacted by, by those events, uh, either damaged or destroyed. We arranged pro inspections with property owners, we communicated with property owners, uh, all that to ensure, uh, ensure that we had uh, data correct on those properties as at uh, December 1st uh, of 2023. And over the coming year, we'll continue to monitor building permit activity, rebuilding efforts in those areas, as well as the market and how the market responds to, to those events. And just some of the sector highlights from the commercial file. Uh, I'll speak briefly on apartments, four and five unit apartments, the retail sector, industrial, and, and offices. Um, and despite rising costs of building materials and labor, commercial development continued uh, over the course of the year. Business industrial parks continued to see significant market growth. We saw low vacancy and high demand in Old Burnside and Bears Lake. Uh, the, these types of properties continue to be sought, uh, sought after investment, especially in HRM with, with good access to highways, airport and, and rail service. In the apartment uh, sector, uh, apartments continue to be a strong investment, both the buying, the remodeling uh, of existing buildings and construction of new. Rental rates, uh, we saw some increases and vacancy uh, continued to be low. The retail sector saw a steady tendency and some increased leases, but continues to stabilize after the pandemic with small rental rates increasing in some areas of HRM with other areas being stable. Office buildings, however, remain flat with stable rents and stable vac vacancies with longer term leases, which is really reflect in the sector's response to the shifting workplace requirements. So I'll just speak uh, briefly on the appeal the, and inquiry period. So as I mentioned, with notices being mailed yesterday, January 8th, that starts the 31-day appeal period. Our assessors are all available uh, to take questions from property owners if they have questions when they receive their assessment. The, the, the assessors will be very happy to speak with the property owner. It's a great opportunity to, uh, to speak to market value and help the property owner understand the market changes in their particular area. Uh, but of course, the 31-day uh, the appeal deadline is, is February 8th, so certainly uh, property owners have that option to appeal their assessment. Uh, and they can do so by signing the, the uh, appeal form on the bottom of their notice and either emailing it, mailing it, or faxing it to us by midnight on, on February 8th. So just some key uh, contact information, property owners, have access to the 1-800 number, 1-800-380-7775. They may all co also contact us by email, and that email will get to, uh, to an assessor to, to return their call. We have a dedic dedicated uh, line available for municipal staff to call and reach out if they have any specific questions for us. And we ask if, if uh, any councillors present receive uh, questions from uh, property owners in your area that, that you refer those property owners to us so we can have a discussion on their, on their assessment and, and discuss market value with them. So I guess uh, any, any questions, we're, we're available to, to answer those for you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there's no uh, recommendation, but uh, uh, PVFC will answer questions folks uh, may have, beginning with Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, and thank you for this presentation. I also want to uh, sh just share my appreciation uh, for the staff at PVSC and the responses uh, to my many questions, um, and also to my residents 
um, and, and our commercial uh, business operators who lost their businesses. Really, really appreciate um, your help, Rebecca, in particular. Uh, we've just, um, you know, it has been a difficult time and obviously trying to understand the complex reality of what these new assessments mean to the tax bill in the future and what it means to that family's investment in their property. So I just want to say thanks for your help. Uh, so we do have uh, some confusion in the community with regards to the definition that PVSC used, uh, which was, quote, area of significant impact, end quote. So that, unfortunately, we haven't seen a map from PVSC as far as what that area actually looked like. We do know that individual property owners have received their letters and, and they will be responding directly to you. I will be uh, sharing your phone number and your email address widely. I'm also encouraging people to go to the website um, because you can have access online to your account information from PVSC just by signing in, which is wonderful. We appreciate that resource as well. But that map, I think, is quite confusing. The other question that I have, Mr. Mayor, is around cemeteries. So cemeteries uh, are assessed at a fair market value, uh, like all properties are assessed at a fair market value. Many cemeteries are exempt from paying property taxes, yet we end up with a cemetery on the Bedford Highway, which is eight acres, and it's assessed at $11 million. It's not developable lands. You cannot put any housing or anything on that cemetery. So I'm just wondering, my second question to you is if you can explain how you would assess a property that's a cemetery at a fair market value when it has absolutely no developable opportunity whatsoever. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Go ahead, folks. Yeah, exactly. So uh, all property in, in the province is, is, is assessed at market value. That's section 42 of our, of our assessment act requires us to do that. Uh, any, any land is, is no exception. Of course, land can be uh, classified uh, as residential, resource, or commercial. The assessment act uh, defines uh, residential and resource, but it does not define commercial. So. Therefore, if uh, land does not meet the definition of residential resource by default, it's, it's assigned the commercial classification. And uh, also, as pointed out, uh, land can either be, or any property, uh, uh, regardless of the classification, uh, can be taxable or exempt. Uh, Section 5 of the Act lists uh, very specifically properties that can be exempt, non, uh, cemeteries owned by non profit organizations are included in, in Section 5, so therefore those properties are exempt. Uh, with respect to this property, I, I don't have the details on that. We could, we'll be happy to, to dig in further on that, uh, on that property, but, that, but all, all property is, is required to be assessed at, at market value, and we, we look to Section 5 of the Act to, uh, to help us determine whether that property is taxable or exempt. Mm. It does inflate the numbers a little bit, though. Um, so can you explain the map? for residents who are wondering about that significant area of wildfire? Yeah, so we, we had uh, a number of people on the ground. We were coordinating things with, with staff here at HRM and the EMO as well. Uh, we had assessors inspecting all, all properties in those areas and driving through the areas to, uh, looking to see how the neighborhood, because uh, it really was a neighborhood event yes. uh, that, was, that was impacted by, by the, the, uh, the fires. So um, we have, uh, Certainly, if, if property owners are interested in speaking to us specifically about their property in that area that was impacted, we have a dedicated resource who can take in, inquiries from, from those property owners to help them understand what our process was uh, and how we, we derive the, the value on the property, ensuring that we have uh, the, the, uh, the physical data correct as of the state date. Uh, the, the map itself was was based on the information that we were able to gather in the, in those areas, and and make a determination, uh, I guess, on on what we felt was a reasonable area to include in that in that uh, in that that map where our adjustments were made. Okay, thank you so much, and we have until February eighth to appeal. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Outhit. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for being here, folks. Um, I wanted to continue. There's two things that I had written down. One was Union Street, and the other one was graveyards. So Pam, Pam beat me to graveyards. Um, 
Because I've also had the calls from the church up on Larry Utech West who uh, have a graveyard on the Bedford Highway assessed at approximately $12 million, which doesn't make sense to me because there's, I, I can't imagine what there's market value to a graveyard. I mean, you're just going to dig them up and build condos or something. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. But it does impact uh, what they pay for, uh, I think it's fire, uh, fire hydrants, fire protection services, and this sort of thing. So they are in the process, and they missed the deadline of appealing this because uh, obviously they're a nonprofit, they're a church, there's no money to be made in uh, graveyards these days. In fact, a lot of them are struggling just to handle uh, perpetual care commitments that they have with, with rising costs. So I'd like to understand a little bit more about the graveyard situation. And the second thing is, uh, in a situation like Union Street, they were flooded, uh, you know, seven feet of water in some cases, white water coming in their back doors and, you know, all the videos that I saw. And subsequently, to my council colleagues' credit, we did write to the province saying, are we going to keep continue fixing these homes or are we going to buy them out? And so far, it sounds like they're handing money out to them again for the third or fourth time. Um, but what happens when, in a situation like that, where for six months, a uh, house A wasn't habitable, and B, because of all the media coverage and whatnot, there's every reason to think why those properties have dropped in value like a stone. So how do you how do you deal with uh, a Union Street like situation, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah. Sure. With with those properties that were impacted by by the flood. My understanding is we communicated with those properties through through letter and, and many of those people were in contact with us and yes. we would have arranged to gather information uh, with respect to the, the state of those the physical state of those properties. And really it, it's uh, the yeah, every assessment role uh, is reflective of the state of the state of a property as of that December 1st date. So so whatever the condition of the property is at December 1st is what's reflected on, on the assessment role. With respect to market value, yeah. it's something that we, we continue to do. It's, it's, uh, it's a big, big part of our business. And I spoke earlier about the sales that we, re that we receive in our, uh, into our system, and we review, we, all, our assessors review all of those sales. So we, in, the, in areas like this, in areas like the fire impacted areas, we continue to monitor, monitor the market to understand how the market will respond to, to those situations, whether it be how it's, you know, whether it's portrayed in the media or or the or the the actual uh, uh, properties themselves. But in a uh, case like Union Street, you could have streets all around them mm -hmm. where the where the prices in you know everybody wants to live in Bedford, of course, and the the prices are uh, are going up. But that street could have plummeted. Do, do, does your research take that into account? Uh, for for sure, that okay. would that would be a, a unique market area that we would want to pay okay. attention to and monitor the market uh, right. market transactions that, in that area. Resale value of market value of graveyards. Help me understand why there's any market value to a graveyard. Yeah, I mean, we, we, use, we use sales in area. Land is valued through, through the sales approach. Yeah. Uh, so we, we would look at, at land sales in, in any area, in any particular market area, to understand what, what uh, that land is selling for in those particular areas. I can't speak to any particular well any particular value assigned to a specific property. We can right. certainly take a look at that. Yeah. No, it, just, it, it doesn't make sense. It, to me, land would have a value if you can use it for something, a park. It can be developed. You can build houses or a factory or something on it. But something like a graveyard, I can't imagine that there is market value. This is what I'm struggling with. Yeah, well, it, it's something that we can look at. If, okay. if, if, you know, if that property owner has, yeah. has, uh, has questions, we can certainly have an assessor review that with them. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation and good afternoon. Uh, you had a slide up there that uh, you showed the number of permits, the number of property transactions, and the number of appeals. So my question is around appeals. You had 5,870 appeals. Uh, how many of those appeals were successful? Was there a common theme and the reason why they were successful? And you also, later on in your presentation, you talked about doing inspections of the properties that uh, were either impacted by uh, fire or floods. During any appeals, uh, is there ever a time where an inspection takes place with some appeals? So if you could just speak to those, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, yeah, just uh, on your... Your mic, uh, yeah. On your first question on the appeals, 
So about uh, over 5,800 appeals in HRM. Of those 5,800, uh, 980 of those uh, were amended. Okay. Uh, so about, about 20%. And was there a common theme why they were amended, or they're all very, very depending on each situation? Rather? Yeah, it, it depends on the situation. We, we, uh, and I guess maybe going to your second question, uh, uh, yes, the assessor may arrange with a property owner to inspect the property that's under appeal to ensure that we have uh, our, our physical data on record for that property accurate. Um, so that could be a source of, okay. of amendment, but it's. But at the end of the day, we, we look at market value and, and, and we, we establish whether that assessment is reflective of, of market value or not. So in the case of, okay. of, of fire properties, yes, uh, we've inspected those properties, but if, uh, if the, the owner would like us to inspect again through the appeal process, we'd be happy to do so. Okay, but I'll ponder request. It's 31 days, do you, do you have any stats around that not being a long enough period of time for people to make the appeal? They find out on day 30, <laughs> you know, human nature being what it is? Uh, I, uh, there's no stats that I'm aware of, yeah. We, we, yeah. Okay, thank you for the okay. presentation and the answers. Appreciate it. Thank yep. you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Just a, a quick question, that, that 50 and 70, is that uh, up or down? What's the trend on the number of people who are appealing? Is it sort of consistent with the number of uh, properties? Yeah, it, it, was, it, was up. it was up slightly last year. We, we, we had some significant value increases uh, last year in the 2023 roll as well. Um, but it, it was up. I don't have the exact percentage it was up, but it was up. Uh, but I believe our confirmation rate, which I spoke of, which I spoke of was actually up as well. Thank you. Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. And follow up from uh, Councillor Lovelace's questions about uh, properties destroyed by fire or no, also Councillor Oathead's uh, properties affected by floods. Um, I know the municipality has some exemptions or some uh, uh, program of rebating some property tax, but I'm wondering why can't property valuations reevaluate a property? You know, it's, you know it's, it's, this is not a one off situation. We had 150 homes lost in the Upper Ten Town. And, a fire region, and then we also have the amount of homes flooded in Bedford. I'm just kind of curious of why, under Section 42.2, that the, the director may, from time to time, prescribe a past date as the base for determination of market value of a property, for the purpose of subsection one. You know, part of the assessment. Why could you not reset a value for those properties so they would know if they're, they're still going to get a tax bill from the municipality, but at least they're going to be more reflective of what the true value of the property is at that state, of, at, that, at that particular state, because. I think a lot of these properties will be more than December 1st before they ever get rebuilt or whatever the case may be, or maybe partially rebuilt. But my question would be is the state of the property, uh, not the whole may be lost, that could be written off in regards to the assessment base, but the actual state of the property itself, it could be burnt trees and residue left over from fires, contam contaminants and stuff. There's, a, there's a, a lost value to the property there as well. So I'm kind of curious how you guys would assess these particular situations. Yeah, for, for sure. So, yeah, it, I mean, it, it's really important in mass appraisal uh, that that base date, that date evaluation, is is the it's a common date that we value all all properties at. But it is also important to look at the state of the property at December first. So, certainly, if if the the property was destroyed, uh, then that owner would be receiving uh, an assessment based on land only. Um, we, we've also, and I think in the map that was uh, referred to earlier, we, we are making an adjustment to properties in that area to account for how that neighborhood has changed over the previous year. We don't have sales data uh, at this point mm -hmm. to understand how the market is going to respond to it, so we, we're, we're taking an, a, a proactive approach in, in, in making an adjustment to properties in those areas, but we'll continue to monitor the, the market as, as sales come in in that area to see how, how the market is actually responding to that. And two more questions. Uh, do you have any data on how many houseboats you have assessed on the tax rolls so far in the municipality? And second, in regards to the new changes we allow for secondary suites uh, and stuff, do you know have an inventory of how many more residential dwellings are on a residential lot, you know, just kind of curious how you guys are going to be monitoring those type of increases will be a, an additional auxiliary suite as a separate unit on the same on the same lot. 
I don't have any numbers on house boats. Mm. Uh, and uh, of course, as those secondary suites are built, we're, we, we would inspect those through building permits that, that, we've, that we've received from the municipality. Uh, they would be added onto the same uh, assessment account, uh, another dwelling unit added. I don't have those numbers with me here today. Perhaps it's something we could, we could gather and, and get back to you. And in the past, I assume, uh, Mr. Mayor, we'll be getting a district by district uh, analysis of the data. We've had that in the past. I'm sure we'll be getting that again. So looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, there's so many different ways to look at housing and buildings in our municipality. And this is always a really interesting one, um, particularly around data and its assessment increases and transactions. Um, so I just, had a f I just had a few questions. Um, one, in your presentation, you showed the difference between the overall assessment increase, which, was, which is really quite large, and I don't know um, how that might compare year over year in recent history, but it feels like a rather significant um, increase in assessed value um, versus the capped um, assessment increase. And I'm just wondering if you can uh, speak a little bit about where that um, increase in the capped um, versus non-capped is coming from? Like, is the increase coming from new homes? Is it coming from sales? Um, how does it impact, you know, in, in that capped amount? Um, I mean, all the property taxes get capped. So when you buy a house, if I'm correct, you buy your house and then you're, you're capped automatically. No, when, I'm just wondering, when does the cap kick in? And, and how can we tell where the burden of the increase is, whether it's on um, new homes, uh, new uh, transactions, new, you know, new acquisitions versus um, what's happening uh, with, with, the cap, with the increase in the capped home. And with the capped properties, they do have an increase in assessment that's tied to inflation. So could you, I believe, uh, could you just talk a little bit about how that increase works? Um, and and the the other part was about the apartments. You listed apartments down there, and um, apartments, multi units. It's great to see that we have more apartments and multi units coming on board. Um, are those those are assessed as commercial? I believe. Or are they assessed as residential? I'm just wondering what they're and and so when we look at the commercial tax increase. I'm just wondering how much of that commercial tax increase is related to traditional commercial activity, like for businesses, um, versus um, things like uh, rental housing. Sure, I'll, I'll start with your cap question. So the, the cap assessment program, that's a provincial piece of legislation. We administer that on, on behalf of, of the province. Uh, each year, uh, the province provides us with a, uh, the cap rate. Uh, so for 2024, the cap rate is 3.2%. That's based on the Nova Scotia Consumer Price Index. And uh, of course, so the, the, what, what the cap is designed to do, or the intent is to limit the increase in the taxable assessment. So if a residential property is eligible for the cap, uh, there's no application process. The, the will automatically calculate both a market value assessment and a capped assessment for that property. We'll, we'll use the lesser of the two and report that as the taxable assessment. So the municipality will use the capped assessments to calculate taxes for those properties that are in the cap program. What's not included in the cap is new construction. So if there's new construction, uh, a portion will end up with a portion of the, the, the property assessment may be uh, capped, but that the, the value attributed to the new construction will not be capped. So that gets added on over above. So that property will not only see the 3.2%, but will also see some value added from the new construction as well. When a property transacts, when it's purchased by someone outside of the family, the property is not, not eligible for cap the year following the sale. So if a property was purchased in 2023, it won't be eligible for the cap in 2024. And then we'll use the market value assessment as the starting point. If the property remains eligible for cap going forward, we'll use that value to calculate the cap going forward. 
on ap uh, apartments, um, apartments are actually classified as residential. So they're not part of the commercial uh, value we, we talked about. They'll be part, they'd be part of the residential value. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you for the presentation, I appreciate it. There's always questions you have or information you get from these uh, presentations. Um, just a quick question. There was um, the ability to drop off your appeals or mail them. And I also think that there was the option to email. Okay, as far as security goes, how do you, how do you confirm that email was from the actual property owner? It could have been from someone else in the home or someone else that may be contacting you? Yeah, for sure. So with, uh, with the, the assessment uh, appeals, there's a form as part of the notice that, that must be signed. Uh, legislation requires that those appeals must be signed. Uh, so even if they're coming to us by email, re we request uh, that the, the property owner fill out the form, they can scan it, take a photo of it, attach it to the email. So we're still getting that signature from, from the owner. Same thing if it comes uh, by fax, we have a designated fax line actually comes in as, a, uh, as an email to us. Uh, but the, the important part, it, it still must be signed by the, by the, by the, uh, the owner. Okay. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kent. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, thank you very much for the work that you do. I've um, been doing this a long time, getting lots of uh, phone calls, lots of interest in tax, tax bills, um, and, and you know that. So the calls that we can defer to you is very much appreciated. <laughs> we don't ever always have that option in this role. <clears throat> so thank you and good luck with everyone from District 3 on their behalf. Um, I, I, I have a question that isn't specific to the presentation to, you did today, but as I think about the work that we do here and the impact on properties, specifically properties that are now um, and more recently and likely to be more in the future, adding auxiliary suites, adding secondary buildings and infrastructure on their parcels. Um, uh, two questions. One is, can you help me understand how you will be approaching those? Because those would be in, in uh, zoned properties that we never would have seen them before. Every property is allowed now to do some version of that, um, uh, with a few caveats, of course. How do you approach that kind of uh, assessment, um, given the nature that it could be something really unique to a parcel that may not be anywhere else around them, because they're often associated to the market in the area, right? The second question ha is, have you seen an uptake on that, uh, an uptick on those sorts of properties yet. Um, it would give us a bit of a sense of, of uh, when, when residents, not uncommon for residents to make alterations to their own home and their yards with their decks and their, their garages and their infrastructure and they don't realize the impact. So they apply for a permit, we hope, <laughs> and or they are assessed and they suddenly are reminded that wow, all that work is actually captured in some way. Um, but they don't always think about that. And, it, and I think that it would be helpful for me as a counselor, and I, I'm guessing many of the members here, to have an understanding of, uh, of how that would be, how that would look to them in, in, in um, us being able to help them understand and we'd probably refer these ones to you, but we're gonna get those questions. Is why did that change so much? Well, you just built this, this, and this, right? So just, can you offer me a little insight into what we could expect and maybe what you've seen so far? Yeah, and you're exactly right that we, we, we do rely on building permits that are issued by the municipality. We, we receive a copy of those and our assessors follow up yeah. on, on those permits, uh, most of those properties will be inspected to gather that new data. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen uh, secondary units being built in, uh, in HRM uh, through our inspections this, this past year. I don't have the, the numbers on how many of, of those we, we saw. Um, in, in terms of how we value those properties, 
uh, eventually, I think as that uh, has become more widely utilized and more of those properties are built, we'll have sales data. We'll have actually have market data to help us establish values on those properties. As I mentioned earlier with our three approaches to value, sales approach, income or cost, mm -hmm. in some of these cases, if we don't have sufficient sales data, uh, we would defer to cost. Uh, so that, that we, we could form the assessment through that approach if, if we don't have uh, sufficient market data. So, but ideally we'd be valuing those properties through the, uh, through the sales approach with sales of other similar type properties that have sold with secondary suites helping us to establish yeah. what, what those values are. Yeah, I could see that in, in, in time you'd have that kind of data. But right now where this is fairly new and, and, and we're seeing, uh, but, and with the housing crisis of course and the need for housing, we are going to see um, commercial type income come in potentially on a parcel that has never historically had something like that. So in your, in your three options, are there scenarios where all th one or two or three might be applied? Like how does it work if a property has an income building secondary unit? Yes, exactly. So we, we typically value properties with at least four units. Uh, those properties can okay. be valued on the income approach. Okay. Uh, less than four units, it, uh, the, the, the better approach and through appraisal theory, the, the, the better approach is to use either sales or, or cost. So okay. ideally sales if we have the sales, uh, but we will defer to cost if we don't. Okay. All right. Thank you very mm. much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one quick question on the cap for clarification. Um, you know, I really appreciate the way that you explained uh, the cap and with regards to the destroyed properties, um, you're assessing just the land uh, based on the state as of December 1st, so that's that makes sense. As they rebuild then and move into their new home um, for the year of 2024, so by December 1st, you'll have a new state on that property. What happens to the previous cap that they had? Because we're talking about new construction, except that it's many times just the same home that had already been destroyed. So what I'm hearing is they lose their cap, even if they've lived there for 20 years. So can you just explain that for me, please? Sure, with, with the cap and the capped assessments in those particular uh, cases, you're, you're correct. If it's, if it's land only for, for this year at, at the state date, that, that land only will be valued. As we monitor building permit activity in those areas and, and rebuilding efforts uh, that will be ongoing, we'll, uh, we'll reflect what will be there next year at next year's state date. Uh, with respect to the, the cap, there, there will be a new market value. Um, with looking at the legislation around the cap, uh, our best interpretation to, to, to look at the intent of what that program is, uh, the process that we'll use going forward is that the property owners will retain the same differential between market value and, and cap as they previously had uh, on, on the home prior, prior to the fire. Okay, so not necessarily will they keep the same cap value, but it'll be the differential between the market. Essentially the savings. That right, they, the savings. That were already there between the cap and, and because the Because next year the province is going to give you the next cap increase amount that you'll have to apply. Yes, Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate you coming in. This obviously forms a, a bit of a basis of our budget discussions that are upcoming, so we appreciate you coming to Council and uh, discussing it with us. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Appreciate it very much, uh, Ms. Vorstermans and Mr. Cadell. Thank you. Okay, folks, we're going to move now to community acknowledgements and announcements. Councillor Hensby. Well, Mr. Mayor, I want to first acknowledge the passing of a great uh, Dartmouth citizen, uh, Craig Keating, uh, a young gentleman. We, we known, I've known Craig most of my life and stuff, and he was quite a philanthropist, a, uh, a great person for, for the community, uh, especially for the African Nova Scotia community. He was very generous with his, with his, um, with his time and resources. Wanted. Thank his family and 
and blessings to, to, to his to his. Also, I want to acknowledge that there's going to be a public uh, information meeting coming up on uh, next Wednesday, the 17th of January, for uh, case number 2023-01496, public information meeting at the, at the rink in Musket Albert Harbour regarding the uh, Twin Oaks Birches and the Harbour G Garden Village proposal in Musket Albert Harbour. It's from uh, 7 o'clock till uh, 8.30, so hopefully people come up and show. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'd like to just acknowledge as well the passing of Greg. A number of people would have, would have known uh, Greg, and he was a very generous uh, person. And I think that um, the comments of Ross McNeil in uh, this morning's All Nova Scotia were very appropriate. He was a big man in every way, big hearted, and uh, he died very young. So to his family, um, our deepest uh, sympathies. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, just want to uh, send out a reminder that uh, January 11th, so that is what day after tomorrow, uh, is the deadline for nominations to the uh, HRM Volunteer Awards. I say that because the, uh, the Volunteer Office has let me know that we do not have a single nomination from District 14, which I think is ridiculous because I know there are lots of volunteers in our uh, in, in the district because I see them practically every day out uh, doing their work. So uh, uh, get out there and nominate your favorite volunteer for the awards and uh, you can get more information by emailing volunteerhelp at halifax.ca. That's volunteerhelp at halifax.ca. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council, you don't mind if that goes for all the districts? Uh, <laughs> that's a very important part of our processes here. Thank you very much. So do you want to consider the approval of the minutes from uh, December 12 and the Special Regional Council of December 2-1? So moved. moved by the Deputy, seconded by Councillor Kent. All those in favour? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Order of Business, uh, Mr. Clerk. There are two added items for this meeting today. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, item 18.1 and, uh, I sorry, item 18.1. Somebody want to move the order of business? Moved by. And 17.4, my apologies. And Thank you. Camera. They're on the agenda now. Councillor Blackburn uh, puts forward Moved, seconded by Councillor Lovelace. All those in favor? Opposed? Councillor Russell, if you're watching, we're thinking of you. And uh, get some rest. Don't be watching Council. Um, consent agenda, colleagues? Councillor Hensby? I have a question. Move from consent, please. 15.3.1 will be removed from consent, so I don't think there's any point in going on with our consent agenda. Business arising out of the minutes calls for declaration of conflict of interest. Motions for reconsideration, none. Motions of rescission, 9.1. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for this opportunity for a uh, sober second thought on our surplus policy decision on December 12th. Uh, so the intent of the surplus land process is to, to determine if a particular property is required to fulfill municipal policies or programs. However, HRM surplus process does not consider stormwater. It doesn't consider wetland, it doesn't consider wa water courses as, quote, required to fulfill municipal policies or programs, end quote. But in August 2018, Councillor Austin put forward a motion to request more authority from the province for wetlands. In fact, that's on our agenda later today, item 14.1. And that motion was a request to acquire wetlands through the land development and subdivision process. Well, that's exactly what 21 Fox Hollow Drive is. Uh, and I'll put the motion on the floor once I, once I finish. So this lot happens to be, uh, uh, happens to have a much longer history than this subdivision process. 
uh, that was dating back to the 1960s and 70s. In fact, this lot has been used uh, for wetland storage since the beginning of the rail line, when that was built in the early 1900s. And you can still see that rock drainage uh, corridor along the back of the property. Now, I had moved, uh, Mr. Mayor, for a supplementary report on 21 Fox Hollow Drive, and that was defeated um, by, uh, by a tied vote. And I found that surprising because I just have to raise the fact that Halifax did declare a climate emergency almost five years ago, actually, on January 29th, 2019. So today I'm bringing forward this rescission motion for three reasons. One, because we have some new information that was put forward by a professional engineer certified to install septic systems. And he has worked in no less than 12 counties in the province of Nova Scotia. His site plan offers council uh, an opportunity to make an informed decision on this lot and its ability to support an on-site septic system. Council, I think just before you go into the reasoning for this, um, we need two thirds to consider it, do we not? Generally speaking, in the circumstances, particularly where I think there was a, a motion to amend the main motion at the last meeting, it's probably uh, reasonable to okay. see if council wishes so I, to even debate it. I'm happy to put the motion on the floor, Mr. So, yeah. well, first, so I think the first of all, we just have a have to decide if council will hear the rescission first of all. So that's a vote that we can do right now, John. Correct. So the motion is, will we consider the rescission? Not vote on it, but consider the rescission and, and hear debate on the rescission. Is everybody clear on what we're doing? It's two thirds on the rescission. Two thirds on, but just, you don't need right. to have a, a motion. There's no motion on the floor to decide whether or not to accept the rescission. It's on the agenda. Yeah, so we need two thirds to consider the rescission. Right, so may I put the motion on the floor? Uh, well, that would be the rescission, I think. So this is to, to decide whether we rescission. consider the rescission, yeah. Am I right to Ian and John? I, in, in the circumstances, it's not unreasonable to okay. have council decide first whether it is they, whether they wish to debate this matter or not. If, if the decision is to go forward on two thirds to have a debate, you still require two thirds to then approve the motion of rescission at the end. Okay. So you have to vote twice on the same motion? Correct. First of all, to consider one, one is to consider whether whether, whether consider council it. wants to spend the time okay. to debate it or not. So we'll vote on I the machine. I have good reasons. <laughs> well, is everybody ready to vote on whether we hear the rescission? Two, th th Two thirds. Requires ten. ten votes. Okay. Is everybody clear on what we're doing? Okay. Okay, so we will hear the rescission. Councillor Lovelace, that was 12 to three. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So now I will put the motion on the floor. Thank you uh, to our solicitor for that clarification. I move that Halifax Regional Council rescind Council's decision of December 12, 2023, declaring 21 Fox Hollow Drive, PID 40684557, surplus to municipal requirements. Seconder? Seconder for that. Right. Councillor Hensby seconds. Councillor Lovelace. Okay. So the first reason, as I was saying before, was about um, the new information that Council now has in front of us. Um, my second reason for putting this rescission forward is that um, Council's designation uh, process for surplus land doesn't include a thorough assessment of the land's capacity to meet the requirements of various provincial Department of Environment and Climate Change regulations for groundwater, septic systems, wetlands, water course alterations, yada, yada, yada. So we're gonna talk about that later today during item 15.6.1. Now my third and most important reason for putting this forward is because of affordable housing. So council, moving forward with this, council is knowingly placing the burden of additional costs and at a time to the construction of affordable housing on this lot. So rather than conducting due diligence to ensure the land is suitable for housing, the municipality is placing the burden to, burden to assess the land suitability for septic groundwater. The costs of the permits to infill the wetland, the costs of the provincial permits to alter the water courses, 
those are all being placed on nonprofit organizations. That's unacceptable. I, I personally believe that to be unfair and unjust. HRM is intentionally allocating additional costs and also the time. You think about the time now that a nonprofit has wet area costs between four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars. Those costs to build homes are escalating. And in November, Statistics Canada data show that residential construction costs went up by eight point four percent in Halifax. So with these three reasons. I am going to remind you of our decision in August 2022 when I asked Council almost the exact same question. Please remove 100 Kingswood Drive parkland from the surplus designation list. And we did that. Why? Because we value as a municipality the role that wetlands play for stormwater and within the broader community. In fact, yesterday, um, was a great opportunity for Councillor Austin to speak about the importance of wetlands and forests and trees um, in our communities on News 95.7 with the hot seat. So the intent of this process, colleagues, is to identify suitable land. That's what I believe it should be. We should be identifying su suitable land to support affordable housing, but also to enable it quickly and without extra costs. So if we're increasing cost to affordable housing construction by essentially giving affordable housing organizations a piece of wetland to build on, I don't think that we're meeting our strategic priorities or meeting our values. And as the St. Margaret's Bay Housing Coalition has asked for so many years to have access to the former Head Harbor School site for community housing on Peggy's Cove Road, staff has not put that forward. Staff has not removed the barriers to access that land, uh, which is owned by the municipality, and provide that to non-market housing uh, developers. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate this opportunity. I look forward to the discussion. And I, I do appreciate the opportunity to stay aligned with our stated strategic priorities to support affordable housing, address climate change, and ensure that we're providing land to nonprofit housing developers where they can build quickly and affordably. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, and I appreciate uh, a, a second try at this for Councillor Lovelace. Um, I mean, she talks about new information. Uh, council or the municipality did not solicit any new information, so we have no idea if it's veracity or quality. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure at this point we can just discount it. Um, the other... <sighs> We're presuming we would know what any potential purchaser would do with this site, whether they would put a single home, a duplex, whatever. Uh, a single home could still be affordable housing. Look at Habitat for Humanity and their model. Uh, so would a single family home fit on here? Uh, looking at the alleged information, it might. Um, and so if any potential purchaser wants to look at this property, they can easily determine whether it suits their needs or not and just not buy it from us. Um, and so we've done this before. In fact, I had a, a piece of property in my district, uh, I wanna say 2018, 2019, surplus, put it out there, several people looked at it, no one's bought it. It's still in our possession uh, and there's some issues with it. And so just because we declare it surplus, surplus doesn't mean we're burdening any person or organization with it. They can look at it if they decide not to buy it, they don't buy it and then it's still ours. Um, and I also remind the councillor that any councillor can bring a motion forward to council ask staff to look f at a piece of property and consider it surplus uh, for acquisition by any group just talk to councillor hensby's uh, 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 an old hat at this uh, so anyway i still think we need to go forward with this if it's not suitable no one's going to buy it uh, and the other thing is the new owner would have to get the permits regardless even if we said ah it's good for septic it's good for this it's good for that the new owner has to be the one that gets those permits because they're the ones doing the build so regardless of what we do in our due diligence it's still a burden on the new purchaser to get those permits in hand to build anything so anyway for all those reasons i think it is uh, suitable to keep it on the list of surplus put it out there if no one wants it if there's if no group can use it for affordable housing it won't be used and it just stays this wooded area uh, around this area. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. CAO on this. Thank you. Through uh, Mayor to Council, I just wanted to provide some clarification that what we have right now is really a two-step process. The first step being declaration of a property as surplus for an intended purpose under the administrative order. 
And then the secondary step, once it's declared surplus, is due diligence before it's brought to market. And it, the due diligence would be conducted before anything is put out to market. Right now, the process is structured that way because it would be cumbersome and not cost effective to be spending the time to do the in-depth due diligence before the property is declared surplus. Thank you. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Kathy, for the clarification on the process. And um, that does make sense that uh, you can't do the due diligence until we know that there's a willingness to actually declare it surplus. Um, you know, I did take a look at that property, and you know, I think the last time this came forward, we, you know, discussed the size of the lot, um, which was very comparable to um, many of the other lots on that street, and in some cases even larger. Um, I was concerned about the access that that lot provided to the trail system in behind and would hope that going forward, if we were to you know, continue to have this as a surplus lot and to look at developing it, there would be a way to um, maintain some kind of right-of-way through there. I mean, construction costs are current reality that must be faced anywhere in the city, whether it's in Tantallon or downtown Halifax, Spryfield or Clayton Park. Um, you know, the increase in construction costs is, is just the reality that we need to work with. Um, you know, I looked at this lot in this community and I, I recalled um, a project that I heard about uh, years ago in Peterborough where a not-for-profit housing organization was buying properties in, in neighborhoods and, and building homes for uh, single mothers with children. I'm specifically looking for residential communities that offered access to schools and and um, and you know a, a residential type atmosphere, um, so that people had options about where they wanted to raise their families. And they would build these homes that would fit in with the communities. Um, often they would have you know maybe two or three units within them. But in terms of providing options for affordable housing for people choice is really important um, about where people choose to live, where their families are, where their communities are, where their connections are. And I do really believe that having affordable housing throughout the municipality mm -hmm. in all kinds of shapes and forms is something that's really important. Um, I still see this as a good location for affordable housing. So close to the service centre in, in Tantallon, the grocery stores, the trail, the cafes, the you know doctor's offices there, um, and and so you know as um, much I, as I am too concerned about stormwater management, that's uh, that's something that can be figured out after the fact. But we can't get to that point unless we know there's a willingness to even look at this for surplus housing, for surplus property and for affordable housing. So, um, you know, and I think that's worth doing is, is taking it to that next step. So I, you know, based on that, um, I don't think I can support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this feels like such a, a complicated situation in a lot of ways because you want to make the right decision. And so it's like, which part of this is accurate? Is it a building lot or isn't it? Like, I almost want to say I want to know one or the other. If it's not a building lot, then it doesn't make sense that it would go for affordable housing. But if it is and can be a building lot, then it does make sense for all of the reasons that Councillor Cuddle talked about. I drove up in the area myself as well, and it is close to all kinds of things, and it is a nice community, all of those kinds of things. So um, to our, our CAO, um, thank you for that clarification. Um, but if I could just ask for a little bit more on that second step of the process, please, because when the decision is made for the surplus property. I'm trying to remember, and if you could help me remember that, that report, because from the report, I felt that enough due diligence was done by our staff to say it could be a building lot. So 
that nuance is what has me confused in trying to figure out how to vote on this, to be honest. So uh, is it a building lot? Isn't it? If, if in that second step of due diligence, it looks like it couldn't be because of the septic issues, uh, then does it revert back then to HRM property? Thank so, you. Yeah. Through uh, Mr. Mayor to the councillor. Um, so it wouldn't have come to council with a recommendation to categorize it, categorize it as affordable housing and surplus if staff didn't have enough comfort that it could be suitable for affordable housing. The second step in the process, if this proceeds, the due diligence work would be done before it's put out to market. Okay. If it's uh, found through the additional due diligence that no, it's not suitable for affordable housing, then the staff would bring it back to council to recategorize it as something else, and council would have the decision to do whatever they wanted with that property. And we do have staff from real estate here who can come speak in additional detail to what due diligence encompasses, if you wish. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, I see Mike Weil joining us. Good afternoon, Mike Weil, uh, Manager of Acquisitions, Disposals and Industrial Lands for HRM. Uh, the due diligence can vary across categories of what the surplus property is categorized as. Um, HRM's affordable housing uh, section of planning and development is working on submission, uh, affordable housing submission guidelines and policies. So within that, that'll ultimately determine um, how far in advance state of due diligence they would like to take that. I mean, we go through ensuring property title migration, um, in these instances, certainly where it's a property that is in a setting that doesn't have central water and sewer, and with the concerns raised, it would seem a natural uh, expectation to have this type of due diligence done. And uh, again, that could be done through, through HRM as opposed to passing on the burden ultimately to a, a, a nonprofit affordable housing charity. Very quickly, Kat, yeah. Stephanie. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So does that require um, an amendment? Like, it seems to me that if the due diligence is going to be done, then we let that path play out. Um, and then it will either confirm that it's not a building lot or not suitable for a building lot or it doesn't. Uh, so given that, I put my faith in the due diligence of uh, real estate to, to do that work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Arthur. Thank you, Mayor, and, and the Deputy Mayor scooped me because this is exactly where I was going to go, asking a little bit more clarification from either Mike or, or the CAO. But I'm sort of getting two messages here. I'm hearing that because, and, and CAO, if you could clear this up for me, I understand that there's that second level of, of due diligence that would have to be done once we determined this was uh, surplus or not. But I'm also hearing, but because we were brought it forward for consideration as affordable, we've already done some extra due diligence. So help me understand that. I mean, so have we, in order that it came this far, would we have looked at, and if not, I'm, I'm thinking this is something we could do going forward, because I agree with you, CAO, that we don't have the resources, the manpower, the time, whatever, to go ahead and look at every piece of land proactively. But if we specifically want to bring it forward as an affordable, should we, uh, affordable housing option, should we not have done some extra due diligence that looks at transit, looks at water, looks at cost of, of uh, improving the land and whatnot? So did that happen, or in this case, or going forward, can we get that extra lens, if you will, before we consider it as, as uh, potential affordable housing? I'll ask if uh, Mike Wall would like to respond to that in terms of what the initial assessment is, is that's done to ensure that properties are suitable for what category is being proposed. Okay, that would be helpful. 
Certainly, when uh, I'll, I'll go back to uh, 2020 when council amended uh, administrative order 50 to include uh, affordable housing. I guess at that time it, it was staff will identify properties known to have potential for residential development respecting types of dwelling units and types of residential units were in the opinion of council and gives a few more criteria. So at this stage, it's really identifying that potential. So staff had looked at it, uh, staff from the affordable housing units had uh, looked at it in particular, particular before putting their hand up on, on this being a potential um, affordable housing property. So in terms of any due diligence, physical due diligence, such as uh, wetland assessment or, or um, uh, septic application, that wouldn't have been done as part of this uh, initial stages. I mean, that is does involve quite a bit of work. It would involve hiring consultants. Okay. And, you know, as well, you would tend to want to know what type of development is going to be placed on a piece of land. This one's, you know, probably generally stated it's only going to be one or two residential units at most that you would expect there. But in a broader policy, I guess if you look to change how that was done, um, you would really want to know on a bigger property what types of uses could be, uh, it may be proposed for that before you go and have a study done so you can match the study to what the proposal is. But yes, to be sorry to circle back around to make sure I, I clearly answered that, we wouldn't have conducted any physical right. due diligence in terms of external consultant studies on, on wetland right. delineation and or uh, septic applications. And, and I believe a septic, you know, a, a septic study really is only, uh, is really only approved once you make the application to the province and get that final approval. Yeah. So I, I see the dilemma we're in, where staff believes that this is a, an opportunity for affordable housing, and that's great, we want those, but we haven't gotten into the detail yet that the councillor and some of the neighbours are looking for. So it is a bit of a dilemma, so thank you. Thank you. Counts uh, do you want to close? Do you want to go now, Councillor Lovelace? Sorry? Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, so just to be clear, um, if this motion fails, the second level of due diligence will be done to look at whether or not it still meets the requirement for surplus for affordable housing. Uh, through the mayor to the councilor, cor correct. I would say with the attention brought forward by council, it would be the logical next step of staff to, to ensure that was part of the due diligence where these concerns, specific okay. concerns were raised. Um, we will convey this information to uh, the affordable housing group and, and work collaboratively with them to ensure any of these criteria are met. And is it possible that we would do a deeper dive to make sure uh, because of the conversation here and all of the interests that that level of due diligence might be a little bit um, more in-depth than what would be normally done? Uh, certainly, if we went ahead with this, we would look for a consultant to give the full final opinion of, of what this lot could be, uh, you know, accommodate and, and what the limitations may be and, and based on that, uh, determine what, if any changes are may be recommended for the ultimate use and, and categorization of the property. Thank you very much. I appreciate your answer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we're going to pay the consultant anyway, right, to do the assessment. That's going to happen. Um, do we need to pay the consultant? Probably not, since it's parkland. It's already parkland. It's wetland. As to your point about uh, single mothers, 100% we need housing for them. Difference between Peterborough and Spryfield and Upper Tantalan, we don't have water or sewage. So we need the land for septic fields. And you cannot put a septic field in a wetland. So it's important to consider, um, did staff go to the site? Was there a physical assessment of the site? No, not at all, there wasn't. But local knowledge of that property is telling you, is telling us, that as well as a, an engineer's report, that the placement of the dug well along the property line and where the watercourse is and where the wetland is, 
really limits where a septic field can go. We cannot put a septic field under the road or against the road. So uh, I'm just saying that at the end of the day, we're going to pay consultants. Do we pay? Do we bother doing that, or do we remove this from the list and continue to support the affordable housing? projects that are taking place in District 13 on Scholars Road, on Hammonds Plains Road, soon to be at the crossroads. Um, you know, the, the assumption that there's no affordable housing projects in Hammonds Plains, Upper Tantallon is just inaccurate. I see I'm losing my audience, so I will stop, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. There's nobody else on the list, so we're going to vote on the motion of rescission of Councillor Lovelace. Is everybody clear? Two-thirds required. So that is defeated. Consideration of deferred business, none, tabled matters, none. Public hearings tonight, two, two at six o'clock. Correspondence, Mr. Clerk? Correspondence is received for item 1.1, 9.1, 12.2, .1, and 15.11. All correspondence has been circulated to all members of Regional Council. Thank you. Petitions, colleagues? No petitions. Information items brought forward. Councillor Lovelace, Legislative Update 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, really it, it, timely to bring this forward. You know, this is a great compilation of all of the uh, considerations I think that uh, HRM uh, Council has put forward to the province for many years. Um, there are a number of them. And one of the things that uh, the main reason why I brought this forward was to talk about the relevance of all of these items. Uh, there was a memo that uh, Council received uh, a couple weeks ago regarding uh, the, the, how can I say this politely? Uh, the restrictions, I guess you could say, placed upon Halifax Council and the municipality with regards to what it is uh, that our um, advisory committees can do. Our regional watershed uh, board, our uh, community planning and economic development uh, standing committee. And so my, my question really is to consider, number one, you know, with all of these legislative requests that have gone to the province over the years, are they actually still relevant? Should we be going through these line by line, just like we do with our, um, with our uh, motions to determine, do we, is this relevant? Do we still really need to do this? Now, some of them knowing with Bill 329, for example, it's only a you know, specific amount of time and then we assume or hope that the province is gonna lift those restrictions. But I think it might uh, be a beneficial um, uh, opportunity for us to actually consider whether or not these are still relevant. That being said, I am conscious, Mr. Mayor, of the fact that we have the service exchange agreement underway right now, and perhaps it may be best to wait. Um, and so uh, to my question to uh, Madam CAO is, is whether or not uh, these, any of these are on the table during the service exchange agreement. Through Mr. Mayor to the Councillor, there are a few items here that have come up um, through discussion with provincial staff when we're sitting at the table discussing service exchange. With respect to um, whether or not there's merit in reviewing the list of requests to see if items should come off. Um, of course, any of the items that are on this list are ones that have been approved by council or supported by council through council reports. So it would really be up to, um, I would suggest members of council to identify opportunities hmm. if there are okay. items here where the position of council may have changed. I am certainly not aware of any at this point in time where I sense that there's been any change in the desire of council. 
and we will of course continue to pursue them um, with the province and just because something doesn't get done in one particular sitting of the legislature doesn't mean that it won't come forward in future sittings of the legislature because it, it depends on what's on the legislative agenda, you know, for that setting. True. So if there are any uh, opportunities here for the municipality to gain funding, uh, I would think that those items should be in front of the province um, to ensure, for example, that we reduce redundancy between both orders of government, and I'm thinking about the traffic um, reduction, the, the reduction of the traffic speed, for example, to 40 kilometers, where HRM is sending our traffic engineers to do the assessment. We then go to the province and explain to them this is what the municipality would like to do. The province then does their own assessment to determine, you know, it just seems really redundant and quite a waste of time and, and taxpayers' money. The, uh, I would agree, uh, Mr. Mayor, through to the councillor, of course, the ones that would help uh, with our financial sustainability challenges or with some of our strategic priorities would be the higher priority items. And those ones we are having active discussions with the province on, for example, photo enforcement radar. We've okay. got some discussions going underway um, through the Joint Regional Transportation Authority now. Now. So we are making headway on some of these. Unfortunately, it may not be as fast as Council would like. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And yeah, when this was an information I wanted to want to have it brought forward for discussion, uh, I've also shared it with my MLAs to, to show them the importance of some of these matters that are still outstanding that we want to make sure that we get them on the legislative agenda as soon as possible. So uh, I suggest we may want to resend it to all our colleagues in, in, the, in the legislature to show them that we are a eagerly awaiting for these amendments and things or these these powers. We like to have amended whatever because uh, for instance, later tonight we'll be talking about infill water lots and stuff and houseboat potentials and stuff. And we don't even have a legislation on houseboats yet. And I've also met with a manufacturer uh, who, who's planning on building some of these houseboats in Porter's Lake. So the, my question is, is when are we going to have rules to regulate them? So <laughs> that's one of the things I've been waiting for. Plus there's a host of other items on that uh, long list of legislative amendments we want. So. I would encourage uh, all members of council that if you have a friendly colleague in the government, use your persuasion. Thank you. Thank you. Count Anybody else? Um, I would just say there are, there are some things on this list that all parties at some point in time have supported um, and uh, voting for uh, permanent residence is one of them. And I've been to um, law amendments on that in the last five years, and both opposition parties supported it. Um, <clears throat> but when opposition parties become government, sometimes priorities change uh, or, or get swept aside by things that are deemed more important. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lovelace, for bringing that forward. We'll go to uh, reports. Uh, 1511, second reading proposed bylaw respecting charges for street improvements. Supplementary report, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much. I'll put the motion on the floor that uh, Halifax Regional Council adopt the revised amended uh, bylaw S452, amending bylaw S400, the street improvement bylaw is set out in a revised attachment one in the supplementary report dated October 6, 2023. Second. Well, Mr. Second Mayor, some of the correspondence we received today uh, from a couple of my constituents in East Preston on, on Lake Mist and stuff and uh, Lake Eagle Drive are expressing concerns of why I've changed it from a per lot, uh, from a per foot frontage charge to a per lot charge. And, and uh, as I explained to staff and, and look back at my emails that, that I asked that the letters be sent out per talking about this per lot charge because all the local improvement charges I have ever done in my district have been done on a per lot basis. And, uh, and I've always wanted to keep that consistent. So um, there's a request by a couple of the citizens to postpone this uh, motion at the present time so I can clarify those matters with the, with the residents and stuff. So I, I, I don't know if I want to uh, postpone it for, for the next meeting of council, but it's up to the will of council if they wish to proceed as is or, or postpone it. I don't see anybody else on the list. I assume that folks want to vote on it. Unless Councillor Hensby, you have something else? Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, if, if I can ask for a deferral so I can clarify with the residents because uh, some of them are expressed concern and I just want to give them an opportunity to be heard. So, so I'll have a meeting with them in the, in, in the community to discuss the. You want to defer to the next meeting? Yes, please. Or to a meeting in the future? Next meeting. So next meeting, okay. Councillor Hensby, second Councillor Lovelace. Seeing nobody on the board, we'll go to the question on that. That motion is deferred to the next meeting of council. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. 15-1-2, proposed amendments respecting remuneration for members of council. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, move that the Halifax Regional Council adopt the amendments to Administrative Order 17, the council member remuneration administrative order as set out in attachment two of staff report dated December 21st, 2023. Seconded over here. Uh, Councillor Outfit second. <coughs> no discussion. So, Mr. Mayor, I feel like the conversation was held in December and I would ask to call for the question. question. Ready for the question. Passed. Talk to my wife about that. 1513, Canadian Capital Cities Organization. Um, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, really appreciate uh, staff's work on this. I've had uh, uh, lots of conversations with Raymond Carriere from uh, the CCCO and, um, you know, talking about uh, where's Halifax? How come Halifax hasn't, uh, you know, renewed uh, our membership with the Capital Cities Organization? Um, this is uh, a, a good opportunity for HRM. Uh, so I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 renew membership with the capital, uh, Canadian Capital Cities Organization and two, provide a proposal to host the organization's annual member conference for the 2025 annual conference event in September 2025. Seconded by Councillor Cuddles. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I don't have anything more on this other than to say that uh, CCCO is pleased to have us back at the table and um, I believe that the annual meeting will be happening in Winnipeg this year following the winter uh, meeting that's in Ottawa. Uh, so uh, it's nice to bring our capital cities uh, together in Halifax in 2025. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hensby. Well, Mr. Mayor, I always kind of wondered about this organization because um, in some provinces they have a, a capital city commission and like Ottawa and stuff like that because of the nation's capital. But I'm just kind of curious in regards to this, uh, this structure, does any of the other capital cities in the other provinces get any uh, assistance from the province because of them being a, a capital city? Do they get any provincial subsidy or assistance or cooperation with, uh, with any of this organizational matters of so being a capital city? some of the burdens it puts on us. Through uh, Mr. CEO. Mayor to the Councillor, um, I'm most familiar with uh, Ottawa. I'm less familiar with what arrangements might exist between other provinces and their capital city. I would say that having a capital commission provides both benefit, but it also provides additional complexity in terms of um, arrangements for municipal servicing across uh, boundaries that sometimes get blurred. Um, we feel one of the benefits in being uh, back at the table as a member of this organization is to learn more about those relationships between the capital cities and their respective provincial governments. Thank you. And we should get the same financials uh, benefits that the NCC get uh, as well. Ready for the question, colleagues? Thank 
Carried. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lovelace. 15 to 1. Um, second reading on uh, Bill Bylaw N200 respecting noise. Council, what's your wish? 15 to 1. Councillor Cuttle. Thank you. Um, I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt bylaw N208, amending bylaw N200, the noise bylaw, as set out in attachment B of the staff report dated September 27th, 2023. Second, Second Councillor Stoddard. Any discussion on it? Councillor Cuddle? Anybody else? Um, no, I think we've discussed this and. Uh, yeah, but unless anyone else has any comments. Um. Speak now or forever. Get ready for the vote, ready for the question. <laughs> That's carried. Was it? Did I see a number? That's carried, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cuddle, we will move to the Rural Recreation Strategy and I believe we have a presentation from, uh, is it Diane, Lorenjane? Welcome, thank you for joining us folks. Angela, how you doing? Thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, good, good afternoon, Mayor Savage and members of Halifax Regional Council. My name is Diane Lavandia and I am an area manager with Parks and Recreation Programming Division. I'm happy to be here today to present the Rural Recreation Strategy. This presentation will be a high level overview of the strategy and I'll be happy to answer questions that you may have at the end of the presentation. The CFMP2 is a comprehensive document that covers numerous aspects of recreation service delivery. It recommended a rural recreation strategy be developed to better reflect the needs and interests of rural communities. It is important at this time to distinguish between equality and equity applied in the data analysis. Although both address fairness, equality achieves this through treating everyone the same, regardless of need, opportunity, and circumstances. Equity achieves fairness by treating people differently based on a context of need, opportunity, circumstance, and consideration of historic and structural inequities. The strategy will strive to support rural recreation in an equitable manner, recognizing that service provision by community centers and parks is continually evolving and aims to recommend actions that support the rural recreation service delivery model. Residents of rural HRM participate in physical, social, and cultural activities to engage and connect with their communities. Rural residents view rural recreation as a hybrid of organized municipally operated activities, self-directed outdoor and indoor activities, and community-led events and activities. This diagram illustrates the three methods of recreation used by residents in rural regions and demonstrates that they often overlap. Where are the rural communities in the municipality? What is considered urban, suburban, and rural can be subjective and often lies on a spectrum. However, this strategy considers all areas outside the urban and suburban tax boundary as rural. These boundaries are used to identify who to engage and to give scope to spatially analyzed gaps in recreational opportunities. Furthermore, as shown on the map on this slide, Rural parts of the region are divided into four distinct areas. 
their commuter west, commuter east, Muscadaba Valley, and Eastern Shore. The two commuter areas are closer to the urban core and exclude relatively densely and include relatively densely developed exurban ex subdivisions as well as concentrated communities of significant size. Rural residents in the com commuter areas generally have higher household incomes than residents in the urban and suburban tax boundary and higher than those in the further rural regions. Conversely, the Eastern Shore and Muscadaba Valley regions are characterized by an aging and declining population and have some of the highest rates of economic and situational vulnerability in the municipality. Rural recreation includes a range of organized, unstructured, and self-directed activities. It takes place in fewer municipally operated facilities and relies heavily on community operated facilities. Rural communities have an abundance of outdoor and wilderness areas, beaches, coastlines, long-standing cultural traditions and events, community-led programming, and local stewardship of community facilities and outdoor sites. This strategy demonstrates there are unique challenges and barriers to providing recreation opportunities in rural communities across the municipality. The strategy models a similar approach to other types of municipal strategies, such as the long-term aquatic strategy of 2019 and the playing field strategy of 2022. It is guided by parks and recreation's vision and guiding principles. It was also informed through stakeholder, community, and counselor engagement and evidence-based analysis. Today, I am submitting a strategy that considers the unique identities, assets, and barriers of individual recreation individual rural communities across the municipality. The vision for rural recreation distills and defines rural residences and organizations' aspirations for the future. It represents what the municipality would like to achieve through the objectives and actions of the strategy. Rural recreation programming requires an approach that uses a rural lens, supporting volunteer-run facilities and recreation services, valuing and enhancing local existing assets, and collaborating in partnerships with others providing or affecting recreation service delivery in the rural regions. The guiding principles in this strategy include rural lens for recreation service delivery, asset-based community development, and building partnerships. A rural lens for recreation service delivery provides a tool that staff may consider using to ensure a rural sensitive context is applied to decision making. To further expand on this lens, when used as a tool, it encourages the municipality to consider the unique circumstances that impact rural residents' ability to participate in lifelong recreation. It identifies high priority communities based on distance and economic barriers to recreation where extra support and investments are needed to facilitate participation in parks and recreation. And finally, this lens outlines context sensitive approaches based on community engagement findings that recreation service delivery providers should use when planning, designing, and providing all aspects of recreation including programming, parks, facilities, and partnerships. Engagement and analysis identify the two greatest barriers to accessing recreation opportunities are travel time and economic barriers. Priority areas ranging from high to low categorized rural communi communities identifying those that need more immediate attention and resources. To lessen the barriers residents in the high priorities face when trying to access recreation opportunities, the municipality may consider allocating parks and recreation funding planning, programming, and maintenance to these areas first before considering allocating the supports to low priority areas. Using an asset-based de community development approach, this strategy focuses on the challenges of providing enhanced recreation assets and services in rural areas. It focuses on existing community assets and how they can be harnessed to improve recreation op opportunities in even the remote, remote communities. Through consultation, it was learned that there are several municipal and provincial departments and arm's length organizations working to support the creation, preservation, and programming of rural recreation in the municipality. 
This strategy recognized that each of these organizations, business units, and departments is working towards a common goal of providing more recreation opportunities to residents. A coordinated approach that includes collaboration and partnerships will help to ensure less repetition of services, best use of resources, and stronger and better use programs, services, and amenities. The strategy's themes are derived from engagement consultation and data analysis that provided valuable information required to understand the existing context when it comes to rural residents' experiences and barriers to accessing recreation opportunities. The strategy demonstrates a meaningful shift away from applying urban solution to rural challenges. Designed to reflect and respond to the unique and involving rural experience, it outlines six common themes based on the priorities identified in our public engagement. Out of these themes, 60 action items have been developed. The action items are identified in the strategy in more detail, and I will review each theme's overall objective and provide an example action. Theme one is equitable access to indoor facilities. The objective is to make indoor recreation facilities available to rural residents regardless of location, population, or socioeconomic factors. Within this theme, there is direction to encourage and support community-operated facilities to collect rental and participation usage data on an annual basis to leverage funding and other supports. Theme two is equitable access to outdoor recreation opportunities. The objective here is to provide equitable, safe, accessible, programmable, and clearly identified access to the variety of rural recreation assets throughout rural HRM. This theme contains the direction to develop an evaluation framework to determine where new and improved amenities such as picnic shelters, storage sheds, garbage cans, and parking should be allocated in the existing rural parks using future parks data analysis, rural recreation programming, and the rural lens for recreation service delivery. Theme three is volunteer support. The objective is to provide the support needed for volunteer-based organizations providing recreation opportunities to rural communities to continue to strengthen and thrive. To address these challenges, the municipality may consider prioritizing requests for training and support from community groups starting with the high priority areas identified in the rural lens for recreation service delivery. Theme four is programming that meets rural needs. The objective here is to provide residents with access to a variety of programs and opportunities that meet local needs and interests. In this theme, there is direction to operate the recreation van year-round in the most remote communities to provide programming and equipment. On to theme five, interdepartmental and intergovernmental partnerships. The objective is to provide assets and programming related to recreation in collaboration and coordination with other government entities. The direction to create biannual planning meetings to discuss and collaborate on forthcoming plans and programs affecting recreation opportunities in the rural regions with both interdepartmental and intergovernmental representatives is found in this theme. The final theme is advertising and communication that reflect rural communities. The objective is to reflect the culture and communication needs of rural communities in the municipality's marketing material and communication strategies. The first action in this theme is to develop a rural communication strategy that reflects the municipality's unique rural communities, local culture, and communication preferences and needs. To ensure follow through with the actions of this strategy, a business unit and time frame are assigned to each action. Staff have reviewed the recommendations of other ongoing initiatives and are recommending that they be categorized into the following groups. Short-term recommendations, zero to one year. Mid me Medium-term recommenda recommendations, two to three years. Long-term recommendations, four to five years. There will be a progress report presented to regional council after one year. The recommendations, based on the extensive analysis that was completed regarding rural recreation, the following recommendations are proposed. 
It is recommended that the Halifax Regional Council, one, approve the rural recreation. Diane, I'll, I'll just stop you there because those are going to have to be repeated again by somebody when they oh, okay. go on the floor. So I'll say thank you very much okay. for your presentation. And I will go to Councillor Cuddle who can put the recommendation on the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council approve the, recre the Rural Recreation Strategy, Attachment 1 of the Staff Report dated October 11th, 2023, to direct the Chief Administrative Officer to carry out the actions contained in the Rural Recreation Strategy as part of the multi-year budgeting and business planning process, and three, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to return to Regional Council via Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee with a progress report after one year of the adoption of the Rural Recreation Strategy. Second. Seconded by Councillor Stoddard. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, we had a, a a good presentation and discussion about this strategy at Community Planning and Economic Development um, Standing Committee, uh, where I think all the councillors were invited to come and participate in that meeting. And I know that we had some, some guests there. I have I see the Deputy Mayor nodding her head. Because for those of us that have rural areas uh, in our districts, this um, has been a, a long anticipated strategy and so we're really happy to see it here um, being presented and at finally at Regional Council and looking for approval so we can start to um, move on getting more programming, assets and um, activities happening in our rural communities which, um, you know, in, in in many ways have felt, I think, rather neglected. And I think through this work, we've, we've recognized that there are some communities that um, have a lot of capacity and a lot of opportunity and a lot of things going on, um, but there's also communities that are kind of being left behind. And, um, you know, where there's opportunity to do more investment and more programming. So, you know, I want to thank um, Diane and staff and everyone who's worked on this for the work that you've put into it. It's a very comprehensive plan. There's a lot in there. Um, I think overall the, the themes, the vision, and the action priorities um, are, are, are good and a great, a great starting place. Um, coming back with the review after a year is going to be critically important so we can see how this actually finds its footing and how it's starting to make a difference um, in, in our rural communities. I, I would have, um, I do have uh, just a couple comments. One, and, and it's like every time you hear a presentation, right, you hear a little bit more and, and you hear it maybe a little bit differently. And, um, you know, you raised, you, you spoke about an example of uh, having a strategy for things like sheds and parks, right? And I just want to be careful that, it, you know, when we have a strategy that we're not creating strategies within strategies and creating more red tape and burden for kind of getting things that need to happen in a in an agile and fluid way, I think about rural communities, and you know, if if a group starts up and they're starting a baseball league in in Sambro and they need a shed, like we shouldn't have to defer to a strategy to say, well, you know, you're on the list for a shed in 10 years. You know, it's like how do we how do we really work with communities in particular and helping to build their capacity and enable and facilitate things to happen. Um, which is also my, my second comment, which is about interdepartment and intergovernment. And just really looking that we have to also emphasize seeing our stakeholder communities as part of that picture and, and really spelling that out. I, even in the title, intergovernment and, and uh, interdepartment, um, it doesn't emphasize the role of our community organizations, I think, high enough. I think we, I think we need to really spotlight that and highlight that in, in everything we do because we rely on those community organizations so much for deliver, delivering recreational services and opportunities in, in the communities. Um, so I'm going to leave that there. I hope I uh, don't know if there's any other questions from uh, my colleagues, but uh, thank you again. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you for this presentation. And I see that we also now have a uh, Stantec report that kind of gives us the, the background of, of where a lot of these ideas came from. Uh, I appreciate the work that staff have done and sincerely appreciate the time that you've spent in my district uh, to meet with nonprofit organizations who 
are really filling the gap and doing a lot of work to keep people active, to bring people together, including seniors and you know young parents. And it's really important when we think about building a community, how we can ensure that we continue to enable and encourage people to, to recreate, to recreate, to, to have fun. So one of the questions I have for you today is how does this strategy align with our aquatic strategy? I am uh, just missing how that works together. I know District 12 is getting a new splash pad. Um, we have an indoor, sorry, we have an outdoor pool uh, that um, is bursting at the seams in St. Margaret's Bay. We do not have um, enough out, you know, outdoor activity. I know that there's some um, great um, opportunities here to work with our beaches and to work with um, getting uh, kids to uh, have swimming lessons and so, so on and so forth. But I'm just trying to understand how this aligns with the aquatic strategy. Um, and also, I, I feel a little bit like this rural strategy is focused, as you had said, Diane, on existing community assets, not necessarily on um, meeting the needs of um, capital projects, for example. And as you know, we've just uh, heard yesterday or the day before that the Hubbard Area Rec Center is going to be closed for the next, I'm not sure how many months. For yeah, for the winter. So, and, and that's devastating for the community uh, to find out, knowing that they can't now access a space indoors to, to be together and to hang out. So I'm trying to figure out how that sort of action actually aligns with the rural recreation strategy. Um, and I think too that as we as we look at um, you know a, a, a rec van year round, I love that. You know, I, I love the idea of being able to go into um, remote communities and and provide them with resources and and um, and equipment so that they can have fun, whether it's skiing or or skates, um, whatever it may be in the winter months. Uh, but it is well loved uh, when we know where that rec van is going to be and we've got the schedule and it's out there in advance, uh, parents absolutely appreciate it. Tourists also appreciate it um, when the rec van is in East St. Margaret School, for example, and uh, you know, you, you've got children in the back seat and you think, oh, you know, we're, we're running the roads here with the kids. It's a great opportunity to, to just stop and have some fun in, in a playground. Um, and I think when we look at how we deliver recreation to community with community, so in other words, knowing what it is that they need because they provided that very important advice to us. We know what they need, we know what they want. Um, you know, I just feel like there's a piece missing with um, the uh, multi-district facilities and how then are we gonna be working uh, with St. Margaret Center, for example, to get more activity happening on their space. They've got lots of room outside, but HRM is not delivering uh, programs at the St. Margaret Center. And so, you know, I'd, I'd love to see what could happen, for example, at that skate park and um, have more uh, equipment available. So that's, those are my comments for now, and uh, I appreciate um, you bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any, uh, Melanie? Thanks for the question through the mayor to you, Councillor Nalini Naidu, Director of Strategic Planning and Design, Parks and Rec. I'm going to address the question on facilities. On the, he specifically asked about aquatics, but I just wanted to kind of speak generally about the Community Facilities Master Plan to renewal. And uh, in the 23-24 business plan, we identified that we'd be scoping out that project this year. So we are going to be doing some internal work. We've already started and presenting to the Parks and Rec directors and the Rural Rec strategy, which we'll see how today goes, hopefully gets approved, we'll start to inform all of the work that comes forward and have a different lens. And okay. while the capital question wasn't necessarily about um, outdoor rec assets, I think it was more about facilities, but, yeah. we, but the same thing. Uh, we'll start using the Rural Rec strategy as part of the, the lens that will inform some of those decisions around the percentages or when we do recap, when how we think about capital. So I think it'll be an informative guide for us as as the people that have to build the draft budget for council to review. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear from uh, Deputy Mayor before we take a break. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Diane. Uh, always good to, to listen 
to do this presentation. I heard I was a guest at CPED. Thank you very much, Madam Chair of CPED. Um, and was very pleased when Councillor Blackburn's motion was made to look at the review after one year. Because when you look at the number of recommendations, at least half or more are within year one. So originally it was going to be more than one year. So I'm happy to see that. And they're really, it, it, it's a nice plan. Um, I think year one is going to tell us an awful lot about what needs to happen and an update in year two and year three. What I'm a little bit concerned about was, you know, back at CPED, I had asked for uh, to see this Dantec report and we only got it this morning and we're talking the rural rec strategy and making that motion on it today. So um, this morning I didn't have a chance to read it, to be honest. Um, but one of the things that comes up is the rural rec strategy is outside the urban and the suburban tax boundary. And when I came to council, a lot that I heard around in suburban, when I talked to parks, it was like, well, wait till the rural rec strategy, that's gonna answer that. Wait till the rural rec strategy, that's gonna answer that. So the suburban piece, there are areas in suburban in my district that are within some service boundaries, but uh, maybe have water, maybe not have wastewater, maybe have transit, maybe not have transit. So um, I do feel that there's a gap in the strategy when we determine that it is outside the suburban tax boundary. And I'm really concerned about is that, have we actually designated now a gap? Um, because there's, there's that concern around, there's so many green spaces that developers have given us and we're trying to figure out, you know, what does park development look like, all of those kinds of things. There are areas in the suburban part of our districts that are so bridging rural and suburban. For example, you know, you're not going to drive from Middle Muscadabit to or Chaswood or Upper Muscadabit to a multi-district facility. Um, are we gonna have a bus that's gonna take people? You know what I mean? Like that's not gonna happen. In, in reality, we know that's not, not gonna be something. So I guess I just want to be cautious of understanding the effect of, of this being outside of the suburban tax boundary. Um, so that, that's a, a worry for me. But the other part of it, I think the rest of it is a really nice plan. Um, I'm sure that after reading the Stantac report, we might send some emails off to say, I'd like to understand how this impacted the decision on this strategy, but at this moment, I'm not able to do that. But I do thank you very much for the work. It's nicely and appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Okay, colleagues, we'll take a break. We will come back at 20 past three, which means we'll begin at 20 past three. Just to be clear now, that includes the Dartmouth side.
Thanks. Okay, folks, we're going to resume in one minute. Do we have quorum? Uh, I don't know if folks know, but Michigan cheated last night. Uh, Tracy, can you tell people that Michigan cheated last night that Washington should have won that game? Okay, folks, Councillor Outhead, you're making quorum. We're going to resume. Thank you to uh, Diane and to Angela for coming back. Uh, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for this long anticipated report, as well as had a quick opportunity to look at the uh, interim report from Stantec. I just want to know if the, the missing pages and the maps and stuff, will they be included for future reference and stuff is one thing. Uh, second, um, will this report, I, I have it highlighted in my February newsletter, which will be out in the streets this week and stuff, um, talking about the rural recreation strategy. I want to know if we're going to go back to our community groups and organizations in regards to here's the report, what do you think of it, how can we help with the next couple of phases. I don't see a, a follow-up plan with our community groups in rural areas, so I was kind of wondering what, what that may, uh, may appear like. Um, you know, there's certain things I want to see in the report, like for instance, with minor ball, I've always said, if you build me three fields, I can close six. You know, the, you know in regards to trying to create some ball field campus uh, capacity, there's always been a request for a second ice pad at Muscadabit Harbor. I'm getting the countless requests for an, a pool somewhere on the Eastern Shore, and but, uh, as I said, we don't have the population base to support such a, such a piece of infrastructure. And I'm also getting constant requests for skate parks and stuff. So you know, it just that it, it seems like we're, ever ending getting requests for different types of facilities and stuff or, or access to facilities. But I want to say thanks to a lot of the community groups and organizations out there that I do have out there that have their own community-based facilities like Lawrencetown Community Center, the Seaforth Hall, the Ports Lake Community Center, and the Bald Center. Name those plus the three legions that serve my area. You know, without those facilities in our communities, I don't know what kind of community program would be available. As well as we have three fire halls that used uh, Mushy Boom, Oyster Pond, and Chesil Cook are used heavily for community recreational activities and, and, and have various church halls. So we have a lot of community organizations out there that provide recreation beyond the municipality, but we also have a number of municipally owned but volunteer operated facilities in my district that uh, I'm grateful that we now have a contribution plan to help them with the management and the programming of the facilities, but it's our other organizations that don't have that support that we need to give support to. Like I, I, we often give them tax relief for their facilities. I usually give them a lot of district capital grants. They apply for community grants, whatever the case may be, but there, there's something that's missing and a lot of our volunteers are burning out and they need some kind of support. So I'm not sure how this report may try to address that burnout issue. And another significant uh, issue that's coming to the forefront now in Muscadabra Harbor is the, the future of the Eastern Shore District High School. They're building a new facility with the, with the uh, with a new uh, what I call the Eastern Shore Academy in the in the Chesapeake Industrial Park. So I got Gatesbrook Junior High School and, and Eastern Shore District High School become vacant properties with probably within a year or so. I assume the French School Board may be using the Gatesbrook facility temporarily as they build a new French school, probably on site in Porter's Lake. But I want to know what can we do with the Eastern Shore District High School facility? Uh, there's a community aspirations to keep it as a community hub. I see an opportunity where we can probably relocate our recreation, fitness, and library to the site and keep it as a community hub, maintain the gymnasium for the community access and use. Um, so um, there's a situation there. We have a significant piece of infrastructure in the community, but there's no game plan for it. And we need to formulate a game plan for it. 
Uh, I've had discussions with East Shore and Malay about it and with other community groups and organizations. There's a lot of ideas running around about what could be utilized, what could be put in that facility, but we need, uh, we need a, a navigate a plan for it. So I'll be probably requesting in the near future, uh, Madam CIO, that there will be a request for a staff report to try to formulate some type of um, community planning uh, advo advo advocacy group meeting to, to, to talk about what can we do with this facility because it is listed as our municipal property uh, so prior to 1978 so it's supposed to come to us if ever declare surplus by the school board and, and not within a provincial interest but I'm still waiting to hear from those uh, bodies when that occurs but um, so my question is what further consultation with community groups we're going to have to follow up with this report what support can they anticipate and the, and, the, and the other thing is the high school itself To you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor Hensby. Um, in terms of support or letting the public know, the, public, the document has been made public and um, we'd be happy to do follow-up engagements and visit communities, set up our poster boards, tell them we're not selling anything but we just want to let you know about the rural recreation strategy and, and see if we can uh, generate some conversations. One of the objectives in the strategy is to um, have, uh, you know, kind of um, a advisory committee with uh, the smaller community organizations uh, working with the CDs and the CRCs and our partners in facility planning uh, to, to have those conversations as to what the challenges are and how can we provide the support. I do know that we're going to work with our partners in the, in the grants um, with the community grants uh, program and see what we can do to help leverage funding for those organizations in terms of just giving our points of view and, and making sure they're using that rural lens for recreation service delivery. Um, the final question was the, the high school. Yeah. Um, we will follow the direction of council and CAO and if uh, the facility is deemed something that we can use, we'd be more than happy to to take a part of that over and create more programming. I've talked to the uh, community programmer in that area and just mentioned that the, it's a possibility. She was ecstatic. Yeah, she was ready to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I don't, don't really have a, a question. This is just more of a, a, a thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the volume of work that has gone into this and uh, uh, just very pleased to see intergovernmental partnerships as one of the main themes because, you know, they're out in the rural areas. Uh, we, for the most part, rely on school buildings to provide that, or to fill that infrastructure gap. And that comes with some, some real risks. Uh, you know, as, as we have seen uh, a few times, in, uh, in my district in particular where, uh, you know, we, we have recreation programming that has been set up and good to go and all it takes is for a school to change their janitor schedule and all of a sudden, you know, we've got dozens of people that have no recreation options. So uh, I just, uh, you know, very glad to see the intergovernmental uh, partnerships as one of the themes and uh, I just, uh, you know, ask that you, uh, you make that, uh, that connection as proactive as possible so we know when changes are coming before it happens. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the report. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the access to indoor facilities, sort of wearing my library board hat, and um, to find out what sort of synergies there might be um, with rural libraries and recreation, and if you could say a little bit more about the possibilities and challenges there, please. For you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, we have initiated conversations with the rural libraries. Our, our community programmers um, have, uh, because of the work behind this, I guess I would say, that we have we've spoken with them and we talked about, you know, how do we not obviously work across purposes and how do we um, kind of expand upon our offerings and build upon um, what we can do in the community by working together. Um, I, I know that in Sheet Harbor, uh, Jody Taker works closely with the library there in terms of offering some pre-programming in particular. 
but we are more than happy and I think it's, it could be a key to work more collectively with libraries in, in rural areas in terms of even just facility development or, um, and again, capacity development. So they, they, have, um, they have a different look at things and it's, it's a complementary look at things, I think, with recreation. Um, but if I could just follow up, do we, do we have libraries in the right locations that would support the rural recreation strategy um, or would there need to be more buildings or do we have enough? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Uh, we we haven't we've looked at we are a limited number of libraries in rural areas currently. Um, we would have to work with them to see what their future vision is as far as uh, the population and where they see the gaps are and needs for future development of net new libraries within the rural area. So we would work with them on that in connection with the programming as well, just to make sure we're meeting the needs. And is that part of the facilities approach in general, or? We don't have a whole lot of control over uh, what libraries do as far as building libraries go, um, but with the community facility master plan v revision for version two that we're scoping out now, we will be looking at what the recreation needs are and we could certainly communicate and consult with libraries when we're moving forward with what that is gonna look like. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, so I just want to uh, sh sh say a few short words with one question. Um, the, the question will be, does this include Cow Bay? I just need an understanding. It's rural, but it's not really rural like the rest of the rurals, although I've been championing for services and, uh, and accountability and our uh, support of our rural uh, uh, districts for a very long time, for as long as <clears throat> I've been in this political world. Um, but it's always unclear for me of whether or not the Cow Bay area, where does it fit? And you've all heard me say in this chamber, uh, sometimes it fits into a certain category and then it seems like another time it doesn't, um, and, and it's difficult uh, to, under, to, to land sometimes when people are asking questions around it. The other part that, that I want to just express is how pleased I am for the municipality and of all of my colleagues with districts who are rural. And thank you all for the work that you've done and how well have you have heard, heard us representing those constituents that are in our rural areas. You, I think this strategy has met the, um, I guess the test of, of us as, as members of the council to articulate the importance and the uniqueness um, and the stories around the experience in our rural areas. And so I'm really proud to be on council when we are doing this. I feel like this was something uh, when I was here in 2004 to seven, that that was on the table. I remember the regional planning process where we were still just ramping up to where that would be adopted and, and those conversations were part of it then. Um, certainly now uh, I want to applaud the, the councillors who are here now to have in our short period that we've been here that we can see this as a success. This is a game changer I think for the, the constituents and the, and, and the communities that not only we serve but you as well and all of your staff. And so I just want to applaud you for the work that you've done on this. It's, it's, um, it's, it's exciting, but it's also really, really important and time for, for this kind of uh, attention and to see it formulated in a strategy, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is no, to, to me for the work that we do, there's no better way. And to hear Nalini speak to, that's the lens that we'll look at it, everything through, and that's what we'll be able to, to, to follow the progress and all of that. That's really, really what I felt I needed to hear. Um, uh, so I, I guess today I'm wondering, is that on behalf of my colleagues who are in the rural area, but it's still in our best interest as, as councillors for the whole municipality, because we have uh, sworn an oath to do that, to take care of everyone. Um, but just if you could help me understand where Cabe fits. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. Um, I believe Cow Bay is 
not in the rural boundary based on what our definition is. Um, we had to choose a boundary so that we could do the analysis. And it's not a regulatory boundary, it's, it's just a, um, you know, it's, it's just a way for us to analyze. And so any communities that may, like Cow Bay, or um, as D Councilor Deagle Gamming was speak about, speaking about, any communities that aren't in the boundary or outside of the other boundary, um, we can meet with them. We can do um, niche engagement. Uh, we can, um, you know, we pivot, yeah. really. And um, I think that, mm -hmm. To your point, that rural communities are unique and they're they're nuanced, and um, it can just be a uh, difference between being a coastal community versus a more inland community, yeah. and how that uh, how that service delivery changes uh, in considering those factors. So, yeah, not to worry. It's not a physical boundary, and we're more than happy to work with uh, communities that uh, have that need and put the request in, or just yeah. if you say, please, can you go meet with uh, the Cow Bay. Uh, community organizations, then we'll say for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Real quick, uh, I just have a quick question on the Stantec report, which I'm just going through right now, uh, which we received earlier today. What is the date? When was this uh, Stantec report completed for rural recreation strategy? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the council. I believe it was uh, 2020. Okay, 2020. And it's not a complete report, though, right? That was just their initial yep. submission. Yeah. Yeah, that was the initial submission. And at that time, uh, it, it it says that HRM had, I guess, in 2020, 5,717 hectares of parkland, which is about one percent of the municipality. So that's something to think about when we're divesting of our of our parkland, Mr. Mayor. Um, my next question uh, is in regards to looking at um, some of the communities that are mentioned in, in there. So Stantec report mentions that the subdivision of Kingswood is densely populated. Kingswood homes are on two, three, up to six acres of land. I would not call that densely populated, but it is within the suburban tax boundary. But Upper Hammonds Plains, which is within the rural tax boundary, isn't mentioned in this rural recreation strategy. So you can, ha can you help me understand where Upper Hammonds Plains is? Because I'm not seeing them in this rural recreation strategy. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, Upper Hammonds Plains is outside the urban and suburban tax boundary and I guess I would just say that we haven't mentioned every community for sure in the strategy. If there, they, again, they're if there are any- They're a historic African Nova Scotian community though, and we have through our economic road to prosperity talked a lot mm -hmm. um, at council and ensuring from an equity perspective as you were talking about earlier and looking at equality to ensure that we are taking, you know, what it is that those communities are, taking their needs into, into account and working with them, especially yep. considering the work that we've been doing through the community plan as well. So I just, I guess what I want to do is throw it over to you to, um, you know, uh, look at ways that you can incorporate uh, the needs and the wants of, of Upper Hammonds Plains into this rural recreation strategy, because it's, it's missing. Well, I can tell you that um, the community developer just recently, I think it was before the, yeah, it was before Christmas, uh, met with a community group in Upper Hammonds Plains just to talk about community needs. Excellent. And so, and Good. she's also met with um, some folks from Pockwalk. So we are aware and we are speaking to them Okay, great, thank you. I just, I just see that there's a gap. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Just to clarify on the expression used, the tax boundary, I thought we amended our tax uh, structure that any net operational cost of a municipal facility be covered by the municipal general rate as well as any capital contribution required will be also paid by the general rate and not by a local area rate. Could you just clarify that that is the policy for our recreation facilities in the rural areas? <laughs> Who wants uh, don't fight over it. <laughs> Maggie? 
Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the uh, councillor. Um, could you repeat the question, please, Councillor Michael? The question about the tax boundaries being I've been heard a couple times. I believe we changed our tax structure that any municipally owned facility, recreational facility, outside what well, is in the rural areas if it had net operational costs of also of any capital cost requirement would come from the general tax rate and not by any local area rates i'd have to confirm that through finance i i believe you're correct councillor but i i would want to confirm that before i answer that definitively yeah. it is i'm pretty sure but when i heard the expression <laughs> i want to make sure it was clarified that we have no differentiation differentiation of tax structure but it could come in discussion with our community, other other community organizations that are still owned by the communities and stuff. Like we're we try to assist them with tax exemption and grants, but I think that we should also look at some kind of recreation contribution plan as well. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Diane. Thank you very much. Ready for the question, colleagues? That's passed. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for the uh, great work and hard work. Community uh, Planning, Economic Development Standing Committee, uh, the Sharing of Stories, HRM's Culture and Heritage Priorities Plan. Councillor Hensby. Well, Mr. Mayor, I ask this to be taken off a con uh, consent because I had a request of Councillor Purdy to have a statement read in regards to this policy plan. But are we going to have a presentation of this at all? Because I think it's a significant. Uh, story that should be shared with our with our residents. I wasn't sure if they were planning to have a presentation today or not. Does council wish a presentation on this? Uh, well, I think it's, it's, it's quite an endeavor with uh, this cultural heritage priorities plan. I think it'd be good for the- Who do we- um, who do we have? Uh, Aaron. 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 Okay, Aaron, can you give us a brief presentation on this? Okay, Aaron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and hello, members of council. My name is Aaron Murnahan, Principal Heritage Planner. <clears throat> Catching me a little bit off guard with regard to the presentation, I will have to be a little bit ad hoc, but we do have a few slides for you today. Um, so I'm pleased to present to you uh, the Sharing Our Stories Plan, also known as the Culture and Heritage Priorities Plan. This was a document that was directed by the 2014 regional plan as uh, one of six priorities plans. It's the last of those priorities plans to be tabled for council. And it will essentially uh, provide direction to the municipality on the investment and programming for culture and heritage uh, for the next 10 years. So it's an action-oriented action plan that will directly inform uh, regional municipal planning strategy and will direct culture and heritage policy, investment and programming for the next decade. It will identify projects, actions and timelines to guide internal operations, prioritize the work of the municipality, support creative industries and ensure the region's unique stories, art, culture and history are preserved and celebrated. In terms of engagement, um, staff relied very heavily on previous engagement activities as part of this plan. So things like Centre Plan, uh, the 2014 Regional Plan Review, uh, the Nova Scotia Cultural Action Plan, and it was decided internally that we would focus very heavily on traditionally underrepresented communities uh, as the focus of engagement. So we focused uh, on Mi'kmaq Indigenous, African Nova Scotian, Acadian and Francophone, immigrants and newcomers, 2S LGBTQIA plus, 
persons with disabilities, heritage and museum organizations, and the professional arts communities, most especially as part of this. We had over 40 in-person and virtual meetings. There were 46 separate organizations engaged as part of the plan. We had dozens of one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, representatives from community groups and organizations. And we also had a public survey and uh, interactive website. There were three phases to that engagement. Uh, the first was just um, essentially representing the plan to the community and its, its uh, intent and getting some very basic feedback and that ramped up to much more focused engagement on the individual actions that came out of that first round of engagement. In terms of the plan structure, it is focused around a vision, a very high level vision that speaks to the municipality's commitment to culture and heritage and supporting uh, various communities within the municipality. And under that, we have a number of pillars. Those are stewardship, connection, celebration, and access, as well as goals, including expressing culture through place, developing cultural capacity, and valuing creativity. So those goals and those pillars support the vision of the plan, and each action, and there are uh, about 44 actions in the plan, each of those directly connect to both a goal and a pillar and help support uh, the vision of the plan. In terms of developing our actions, uh, we really took a three-pronged approach to developing each individual action. Um, we used uh, best practice and jurisdictional scans from other jurisdictions, other municipalities, to see what they were doing uh, in terms of their more recent cultural plans. We took the results of internal and external stakeholder and public consultation results and used those really to, uh, to speak to what were the priorities of the community with regards to what actions should, should be developed. And finally, we looked at previous council direction uh, over the last several years, things like other strategies, other uh, plans, the regional plan, um, seeing what council had already asked us to focus on and ensured that those were uh, reiterated within the plan's actions. In terms of implementation of the actions, uh, each action has been broken down into one of four categories, and that's how the action list, which is Appendix A within your report, uh, is, is, uh, is laid out. So those four engagement categories are empowering communities, co-creation, collaboration, and informing. And each of those speak to the level of engagement or level of involvement of uh, communities or communities or organizations in the implementation of each individual action. So empowering communities, that would be us playing a very supportive role and allowing community groups or organizations to really develop or implement actions um, just with either staff resources or funding from the municipality, all the way down to informing, which might be um, actions that don't, in, don't require a lot of community involvement, but really are uh, actions that would be fully implemented by the municipality, or ones that we had already engaged on previously. And in terms of prioritization of each of the actions, you'll notice in that appendix, in that action table, that each action has a priority level, and that ranges from rapid implementation, that is immediate implementation, through to long term, and that could be up to 10 years. And I'll just run quickly through each of those implementation categories. In terms of empowering community, some highlights include exploring the development of regional archaeology strategy, identifying and conserving areas of historical and cultural significance in partnership with communities, and supporting community-led projects for the identification, celebration, interpretation, and protection of sites of significance within HRM. For co-creation, we have improving municipal heritage conservation protection and support for a more diverse range of cultures and time periods within the region, developing a friendship accord with Mi'kmaq communities, essentially a memorandum of understanding with those communities, strengthening the role of municipal archives in being stewards of our civic history, and working towards community action plans and advocating for legislative authority. For collaboration, we have developing an interpretive master plan to guide investment in commemorative and interpretive initiatives, 
amending Administrative Order 46 respecting asset naming policies to promote the increased reflection of Mi'kmaq, Acadian, and African Nova Scotian history and culture. Implementing the HRM Accessibility and Inclusion Strategy when planning civic events and creating a public art master plan to guide the administration of HRM's public art collection. And finally, for informing, we have developing conservation management plans for all HRM-owned heritage properties, supporting inclusive digital access to municipal culture and heritage assets, strengthening HRM's commitment to diversity and inclusion by embedding inclusion advisors within all business units, and conducting a review of municipal grant programs related to culture, art, and heritage. In terms of the financial implications, uh, there is approximately $350,000 earmarked for the 2024-25 municipal budget. 300,000 of that is to support the hiring of three African Nova Scotian planners who would work directly with uh, uh, African Nova Scotian communities in community planning initiatives. And that had been reflected uh, previously in the uh, Road to Economic Prosperity Report and previously directed by Council. The other 50,000 for uh, next budget year would be for consulting services, also to help uh, with identifying sites of importance to African Nova Scotian communities for our heritage property program. Uh, the rest of the expenditure would be from uh, essentially years 25, 26 out uh, by about 10 years. And it's important to know that in terms of budget, um, the costing is very high level. And it's really hard to determine exactly um, you know, how much these initiatives will cost to implement in, in the coming years. But uh, we, we wanted to provide Council with at least a very high level idea of how much the plan would cost to, to implement. And then finally, in terms of the approval process, uh, this went through the Heritage Advisory Committee and previously was presented to CPED and now it is before you for a single vote. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Hensby, do you wish to put it on the floor? I move that the Halifax Regional Council 1 endorse the direction contained in the Sharing Our Stories HRM's Culture and Heritage Priorities Plan as providing attachment A to the staff report dated October 23rd, 2023 as the framework for amending the existing regional plan and secondary planning strategies and developing new planning documents and other municipal policies and programs as may be necessary to implement the Culture and Heritage Priorities Plan direction to direct the Chief Administrative Officer to include funding options for actions contained in sharing our stories, HRM's culture and heritage priorities plan for consideration in the 24-25 budget. And three, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide progress reports every two years on the implementation of the plan. Second, Councillor Cuddle, Councillor Hensley. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and I uh, appreciate the, the, the endeavors that this uh, took. Uh, it was one of the last pieces, I guess you could say, of the original re regional plan when we started way back in, I think, 20, 2006. And uh, I guess you could say it's the final plank of the plan. And so hopefully uh, as it moves forward, we can get the other pieces in place. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussions with the other, about various community groups and organizations about the preservation of historically significant sites across the municipality. Uh, that should be a, an interesting um, uh, endeavor to, to uh, fulfill. But I'm also looking forward to how much more support we can give to our local community organizations that have their community-based museums, not just our municipally owned assets, but other community facilities out there that are they're out there preserving our heritage and culture assets. And I'm hoping somewhere down the road there might be some kind of plan in here for our old cemeteries and abandoned cemeteries. We have a lot of built history out there that are being, in my opinion, neglected and forgotten about and I think are abandoned in old cemeteries. You know, by legislation, they follow the municipality. If if, the, if there's not a congregation out there that can maintain these uh, these uh, these assets, so I think we have an obligation there to look at trying to preserve, protect, and probably promote some of our genealogical assets that are out there. So I'm hoping there'll be some direction in, the, in the plan for that. But Mr. Mayor, I have also a statement here that the Councillor Purdy wanted me to read on her behalf. She's not with us today, uh, but she wanted me to uh, have this read in her, in her, in her stead. Words of uh, Trish Councillor Purdy. I just want to weigh on this motion as my comments and vote were not recorded at our December CPED meeting due to a technical glitch of some sort. The meeting was cut short online. 
In my comments during the December meeting, I said how excited I was to see this report in the CPED agenda, as it is not often we get to vote on a feel-good report. However, as soon as I read the financial and staffing implications, my heart dropped. I am not able to support this plan because I am not there to vote. I want to have my comments on record, so thank you, Councillor Hensby, for reading this on my behalf. HRM is a municipality. Our mandate is not culture and heritage, but it's basic necessities like infrastructure, public safety, garbage collection, and recreation. There are two other levels of government responsible for culture and heritage, and it's always, uh, as it is already, our tax burdens on our citizens are, are increasing at an alarming rate, showing no signs of slowing down. To add additional financial pressures to our budget at this time is just not prudent. HRM already has a method of supporting existing cultural and heritage groups with funding through the grants, our grants program. If there is a need for increased funding to support the cultural and heritage through grants, I would be happy to consider that. However, to agree to an eventual 26 full-time employees over the next several years with the minimum average budgetary pressure of 2.54 million uh, is not the right direction in my opinion. And this dollar amount is extremely conservative based on the 23-24 rates. Uh, the, the report also states it should be noted that there are not, these are not the total cost of the program and the costs that have been identified to this point. As these are estimates for future years, these costs are expected to increase over time with inflation and contract uh, increases. Footnote page nine. While I appreciate the intention behind this proposal, I cannot and do not support the adoption by HRM at this time. Thank you. That's remarks from Councilor Purdy. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Morris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Aaron, for the report. Um, I just wanted to ask a few questions about some of the um, items that were recommended, and I wonder if you could say a bit more about when HRM will be uh, targeting to make more services available in a more uh, diverse group of languages. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, the heritage property criteria changing? It was mentioned in the report that we might be developing more diverse um, criteria and that we might declare more modern properties as heritage properties. So I'm wondering if you could t tell us a little bit more about that, please. And you know, this report, uh, I believe, started about 10 years ago, the initial part, so 10 years later, um, and it's a very modest sum. I guess I disagree with Councillor Purdy. Um, we're talking about, you know, after 10 years of work and this cultural strategy, which I think is excellent, we're just coming forward asking for $350,000 in the budget this year. Um, there's not going to be anything for the municipal archives for three to five years. I'm just wondering why it's so modest to start off with when we have this great plan in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Councillor, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, with regard to the first question, I know that uh, my colleagues from Diversity and Inclusion are here. They may wish to elaborate a little bit on, on my answer to you. Um, just re re going back, uh, on the rationale this, that was provided on each of the actions, there is an action that speaks to providing uh, more services in a, a wider variety of languages and speaking to things like um, the municipal website and um, you know the minutes from meetings and things like that. Uh, so as far as I'm aware, uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion are developing uh, multilingual policies and procedures, and those are in process. I can't speak to exactly where those are in process, but it was identified as an action that would uh, roll out between years one and two of, of the uh, CHPP action plan. Um, so I, I would invite them to elaborate if they wish, but I'm not sure if that is enough to answer your question. But it is something that that, that particular business unit is working on. Um, with regards to the expanded um, evaluation criteria for heritage properties, so um, we developed our heritage property evaluation criteria back in 2006, and we've registered somewhere in the order of 40 to 50 properties since that time, uh, if not more. Um, and it's certainly becoming more and more apparent that there is interest in registering a, a wider variety of properties that represent a wider variety of cultures, time periods, um, social class, 
Uh, we even uh, registered a boulder in Spry Field, the Rocking Stone, <laughs> uh, something we may not have done 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so certainly reviewing, it, it's, it's certainly time to review the evaluation criteria, and that is directed by the plan, but it is something that's been ongoing now for about six months internally. We're now just in the process of engaging with diversity and inclusion around uh, Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian um, um, stakeholders in terms of how they would like to be reflected in that criteria. But you had asked specifically about different time periods. That is something that we're looking at is uh, why can't we represent more modern forms of architecture? And the thought now currently is that, you know, if it's a very good example of a more modern style of architecture, it's likely that we will uh, be able to consider it. We can honestly consider anything, it's just whether it scores well. So we're going to be providing more opportunities for different types of buildings and sites to, to be represented on the registry. And in terms of the modesty of uh, the financial ask, um, I would say that staff are sensitive to the budgetary challenges that council are under. Um, this plan isn't necessarily about expanding what we do greatly, it's about doing what we do better. It's about being a little bit more efficient with what we have. Um, there are certainly a lot of uh, efficiencies that are likely to be found once we start consolidating our grant programs, things like that. Um, so it's, it's really about spending the time to ensure that different business units and divisions are working better together to accomplish uh, the needs of our citizens. Um, but uh, probably the biggest expenditure would be the expansion of our diversity and inclusion business unit. And uh, I think we've, we've had a lot of success with the diversity and inclusion advisors that have been embedded in other business units. And the biggest thought is that uh, that really should be expanded because it's been hugely successful. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. I think there's, there's more there perhaps during the budget process to discuss, but I appreciate uh, those answers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Aaron. Ready for the question, colleagues? That's carried. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move to environment and sustainability. This is an annual progress report on Halifax. I see we've been joined by uh, Shannon and uh, Kevin. Um, you have a presentation, um, Shannon Miedema? Welcome. We have a presentation. The, the motion is read in such a way that I think maybe we'll just put the motion on the floor first because the motion really just deals with will we see this. So um, go ahead, uh, Councillor Mansing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I put the following motion on the floor that the Halifax Regional Council receive the Halifax Annual Progress Report 2022-2023 for information, discussion, and a presentation. So moved. Second. Shannon, go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Savage and members of Regional Council. Shannon Miedema, Director of Environment and Climate Change. Happy to be here today to present to you our third annual progress report on Halifax, our Climate Action Plan. And fittingly, uh, I don't know if you saw in the news today, but um, it was released that 2023 is officially the hottest year we've ever had in recorded history on planet Earth, uh, coming in at 1.48 degrees above our pre-industrial temperatures, um, which is very, very close to the 1.5 degrees we're trying to collectively keep to as a globe. Um, 
as you know, uh, a few years ago, we came to you early in the pandemic with a completely revamped climate action plan, both a mitigation and an adaptation plan uh, that was unanimously approved and then uh, substantively resourced. And we've been moving across all fronts, growing our capacity, working with our partners to try and drive implementation uh, at scale and on time in this plan. Uh, and just a reminder, there's 46 actions. Uh, we play a role in all of them, but also depend on our partners for many of them. We have a net zero municipal operations target to try and hit by 2030. Uh, so for our own, the things that we directly control, like our buildings, our waste, our fleets, uh, and we're tracking quite well um, on that target. At the community level, so for all emissions that happen within our municipal boundary, we have a 75% reduction target to try and hit by 2030 from our 2016 baseline, a net zero target for, for all by 2050, and um, I think we've been talking a lot about the money side of investing in climate and just a reminder, we've, we've had these numbers in front of you many times, but uh, on the mitigation front, uh, investing in climate really saves us a lot on fuel costs, on maintenance and operating dollars, and we're learning more and more how the um, investment in adaptation and resilience prevent, to prevent and to safeguard against these extreme weather events we're seeing um, is having, uh, it really is saving us many, many dollars down the line. Uh, when we first started talking about this, I think it was uh, for every dollar you spend in adaptation, you're saving six. Now we're at 15, according to the Canadian Climate Institute, and I actually think the number's probably a lot higher than that based on what we're seeing. So how are we tracking? This is the real, this is the numbers. This is the stuff that actually matters on mitigation. Uh, how we're driving down our greenhouse gas emissions over time in spite of growing exponentially as a population. So these are our corporate emissions. So this is for things like our, our own fleet buildings, lighting. Um, and this is for the 2022, um, 2022 year, and we have gone down by 3% from 2021 to 2022, and since our baseline year of 2016, we've decreased by 23% in our corporate greenhouse gas emissions, and this is largely from things like LED street lights, solar on municipal buildings, uh, deep energy retrofits that we're doing, and uh, also um, the grid getting slightly greener over time with Nova Scotia Power doing what they're doing. So the community as a whole, we've seen a 6% decrease from 2021 to 2022, and since 2016, an 11% decrease. Uh, and this includes everything that happens within our boundaries. So all transportation related emissions, energy generation and building related emissions that happen. And this is pretty impressive actually because we are growing and we know we have to look at absolute emissions and not relative ones because it, it doesn't matter, uh, the atmosphere doesn't care uh, whether we're growing or not, it's how, it's how many emissions we're actually pumping into the atmosphere. So good to see that decrease. But at the end of the day, we're basically tracking business as usual for our reduction. We're about 5% reduction per year, and that's what the baseline in, the, in that rainbow wedge model um, kind of showed us at the top if we didn't do anything differently. What we actually need to do is about 10 to 15% per year uh, from now to 2030 to try and really stay within our carbon budget. And this is uh, the graph that I think Councillor Austin may have requested when we were at Environment Committee last month, the scary time, the scary time graph. So each square is a week as a reminder. First one is the declaration of the emergency now five years ago. I couldn't believe it when, uh, when, when I heard that it was five years actually, I was thinking four. Yeah, um, and then it shows you where the uh, plan was approved in June of 2020, where we are today, January 2024, and then then that week that we're in, that we are tracking towards exceeding our carbon budget, which is around 2027. <clears throat> And that's not because we're not doing a lot of really fantastic work, and it's not because our partners aren't doing a lot of fantastic work, it's because the work is so big and requires 
uh, a completely different approach and type of mobilization. So this is the summary uh, based on the report card that we just give to ourselves. So just a note that this isn't um, scoring our partners like, the, like other levels of government or utilities. This is just based on our own corporate performance um, on how we did uh, for the 22-23 fiscal year. So the good news is that um, we, we are tracking well on 77% of the 46 actions, not as fast on some, but still moving uh, pretty well, and 15% are lagging. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, there's a lot of barriers like inflation, like things you hear about at council all the time, procurement, supply chain, labor, labor force, um, competing interests, all kinds of things. Um, but we are trying to work around those with a really intentional approach uh, internally with our CAO Kathy O'Toole as our change management sponsor. We have formalized this governance model we actually were just in front of the executive leadership team yesterday on uh, just a, an update on where we are with this, where we are, um, now that our environment and climate change team has grown to the capacity that it has, we're able to really support um, other business units and divisions in the climate work that they need to be a part of. And so we have these six working groups that are formally launching this month. A lot of them are already started um, in a more informal way, but we're gonna be assigning three people per working group from our team. So we have kind of a coordinating and reporting role, then we have a change lead and a project management lead, and we're focused on some of the key uh, areas that we need to move the needle on uh, within our organization. So that's our net zero buildings work, uh, electrifying our fleet, thinking about resilient critical infrastructure and resilient communities, greening transit, and nature-based solutions. We actually have a whole stream in environment and climate change now called climate governance and a manager of climate governance and a team um, and they're really responsible for trying to mainstream climate action across uh, all staff and all, all work that we do. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of information in the report and in the report card. There's a lot of highlights. I'll just touch on a few here today. Um, one is the elect electric buses phase one. Uh, pretty exciting that we've ordered 60 buses um, and that the expansion of Ragged Lake is ongoing. Uh, the, the first electric bus is here. I don't know if any of you have seen it yet. We're pretty excited. They're, they're into testing now. Um, and as part of the expansion, we're actually putting a major solar installation in about a megawatt. And um, we're also looking at battery storage uh, for the Ragged Lake facility to try and reduce peak demand and offer resiliency during climate uh, interruptions. In terms of municipal buildings, that's actually where 73% of our corporate emissions come from. So uh, council passed an administrative order recently that requires us to build all of our new buildings to a net zero or net zero ready standard, which is really exciting. Um, some of the new buildings that kind of meet this mark are the new McIntosh Depot, the Graham's Grove Kiwanis Building, and the Commons Aquatic Facility. Um, and uh, in terms of, where am I, retrofits, um, we've been focused on you know, the key things that help reduce energy demand in our buildings like fuel switching and insulation um, and a, some of the key retrofit buildings that are underway right now or in the planning phase are the Kesh and Goodman Library, Alderney Gate, the North and East Preston Community Centers and also the Black Point Fire Station. We're also um, installing 2.7 megawatts of solar on some of our municipal rooftops um, this year to uh, move things forward and that should save us about $350,000 annually uh, in energy costs. 
terms of transportation, really exciting news this week that we now have an executed contract for the supply install and servicing of public charging infrastructure. So we're finally there. Yeah, really excellent. Thanks to Kevin and the team and all the teams that uh, played a really big role in that. So we'll be um, moving forward to try and get things uh, happening on the ground this spring. Yeah. Um, we also um, have included language in the draft regional plan on mandatory um, roughed in charging infrastructure uh, for new buildings, which is exciting. And I think many of you know that we partnered with Nextride uh, in the summer to get to every single district in our municipality for residents to do test drives of electric vehicles. Um, and these numbers haven't changed. Unfortunately, we, we would like to have higher numbers for the amount of electric vehicles purchased and secured, uh, but they're really hard to get. So we're trying to think of some creative solutions to that, but we have um, 60 total ordered and 36 delivered, and that's our potentially obnoxious, uh, but beautiful electric van that we've been driving around the city to different things, um, different types of engagements, which has been really great. And we're also done the um, design for our fleet charging infrastructure for our municipal depots, and we'll be tendering the construction of that for these, um, this winter we'll be tendering that. And then on the other side of the coin with climate resilience, um, lots of work on going there. Uh, I've, we've spoken before about the Shore Road Natural Infrastructure Project, which should be completing in 2025. Um, we have been working on building back better uh, across business units. We, with our climate action tax, we have a small projects bundled account that um, we can use for the delta on things to make it more climate aligned. And so we've been reaching out um, to provide some funds for looking at bridges that have been damaged, um, flooded parking lots, things like that, to do some design work to actually try and make them, you know, like a green infrastructure project that's going to be more resilient to the kind of flooding and things like that that we're seeing, which is really exciting. And we've also been partnered with a bunch of different kind of medium-sized cities across Canada in collaboration with a nonprofit and an insurance company thinking about um, innovative financing models for adaptation specifically. So it's easy, um, easier on the mitigation side to understand like a return on investment, for example, but the insurance industry is really interested also in, you know, obviously, um, resilience and uh, and thinking about critical infrastructure specifically. So we've been doing some interesting work there. Um, and then the, the really big piece that we're trying to finalize so that we can um, move forward with um, you know, really transparent and targeted investments in resilience um, around critical infrastructure is the risk mapping that we're doing. So uh, we've got our flood risk mapping done. We're getting our critical infrastructure inventory on GIS. Um, we have a draft of that now and we're layering uh, some social vulnerability and we're going to really get to see our kind of most vulnerable places across the whole municipality and then we can use the climate climate action tax money that we've been collecting for critical infrastructure to design and plan uh, around our most at-risk areas. So we're really looking forward to moving that forward. Um, and there's, there's a lot of other really wonderful things happening and I think there's really a growing momentum. Um, people want to see action on climate. I know you've all, um, you know, been hearing this from residents obviously with the year that we've had, but we've been given some awards and recognitions as a city for the climate work that we do. We've been getting into different places, um, things like working with major CEOs in our city uh, who have signed on to a, an ambitious, really, climate action charter, calling on themselves, like requiring of themselves to go further and faster in climate action in their respective organizations. Um, we've been trying to work on 
preparedness um, and we had the storm kits for newcomers so we gave about 750 storm kits that, that actually were translated in five different languages just to try it was actually quite the exercise um, and was really able to happen with the help of our partners um, like the YWCA and ISANS and, and partners like that along with DNI um, we are excited about the solid waste strategy review um, that's really looking at circular economy and aligning with the Halifax plan and with all the great work the planning team's done with the update for the regional plan, like an entire chapter on climate change, for example, is really um, wonderful and that's going to really enable a lot more work to go forward. We're still working on our, uh, our three program, our deep energy retrofit and resilience program. Um, and we've hired an 18 month contract position that starts next Monday to work exclusively in this area. Um, and we're wrapping up a couple of pilots that are going really well um, with Efficiency Nova Scotia and with ThinkWell Shift on the Navigator service for homeowners. And we have our financing study that was delivered by Dunsky. So all the pieces are starting to come together for that. And we hope to have a final recommendation and um, administrative order to go before council this year. Um, we are working on the virtual climate hub. I don't know if you remember, but um, it was one of the things we decided we would try and do to, uh, in response to the resident survey where a lot of people were not aware that we even had a, a climate plan as a city government. And so really trying to get um, into the public in different and more creative ways. And so there are two positions um, that IT is hiring on contract right now, and we are ramping up um, that project to be able to launch a virtual hub in the near future. And then finally, Lake Watchers just wrapped up its second year. It was really successful where they doubled the number of volunteers that they had in year one, and now we're doing the big analysis of the data and actually gonna come with like, hey, this is the state of the lakes that we're seeing right now with the 76 or so lakes that we've been monitoring and you know what kind of policy and programs do we wanna think about in response to what we're seeing. And to wrap up, um, I actually have this slide from a presentation that I did for Discover Halifax, but you know, it's becoming more and more of a conversation that climate action is a competitive advantage. And I've heard from uh, people like the Halifax Partnership that there are businesses deciding to set up shop in Halifax and there are uh, major events coming to Halifax, partly because um, there's a requirement that that the cities they choose to, to come to have uh, serious climate commitments. And so uh, that's really exciting to see and I think can be leveraged as a great opportunity and really helps build the momentum. Um, you know, the Junos are coming in March and there's a sustainability subcommittee for the Halifax host committee that I am now chair of <laughs> somehow, um, which, is, which is the first time that that's really ever happened, a, a specific subcommittee for the Junos to try and make it uh, a green Junos this year. You know, so it's really just like there's more and more opportunity. Uh, the Halifax name is getting a bit of a brand and it's leading to more and more work by us, but also by others, which is really fantastic. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. I hope so. Thank you very much. You know, we're talking about the greenest Junos ever, right, uh, Shannon? But you know what? Every Juno from this on has to be the greenest Juno ever. That's uh, that's the bottom bottom line. All right, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Shannon, and the team. Uh, thank you, as always. You know, some of the things you said, you, you started off your presentation with hit home for me. You know, 2023, the hottest year ever on planet Earth. And that's an amazing state, and for us to understand with the work that you're doing and we're doing. You know, the 46 action items uh, that is your staff, but along with partners are working on. And I really like the fact you said, we're working on the things we control. We're working on things like buildings and waste and fleet. Those are the things that we can control because we're asked all the time, why? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? The $1 saves $15. And just what you stated, climate action gives us a competitive advantage. I mean, these are things that we should be extremely proud of. However, there are many of our residents, because of the economy and the situation they're in financially, they, they struggle to understand this. And so I, you, know, you finished off your presentation about people not aware of the climate strategy. And, I think we, and I'm glad you're here. There's some work being done on that. And we and I need that help 
to help educate those. When I have Mrs. Jones, who's 80 in Woodlawn, and she, her taxes are going up, and why is this climate thing happening? I look at it, and uh, Councillor Austin has said it many times, you know, we're doing this for his kids and his grandkids, as, we, as I am, and many of us are thinking that way. But we still need to do, how do we educate? And so, there, you know, it's a question we get asked, where's the money going? And I'm trying to articulate, and we speak, and I speak in high, higher terms, well, it's the buses, it's the buildings, but we need more concrete, in my opinion. We need to know, you know, this is exactly where every cent is going as much as possible. I do, you know, so I got, I'm asking for that help. Uh, I do have a handful of questions here. You know, that first one is that breakdown of where the money is going. Uh, you know, what is the impact of those 60 buses when they show up uh, here? What, what you know, are we expecting those 60 buses to do? And what is the, the more recent timeline, timeline on those buses? Uh, glad to hear we're moving forward, Kevin, on the EV chargers. Uh, can we have a timeline on what, where that is now, please? Um, you know, we're giving, and I don't want to dwell too much into budget conversations. We're, we're going to have that. But, you know, uh, how many staff do you have now? And how many staff are you looking to add uh, in this next year? Um, net zero construction that we're doing. Are any other municipalities doing that? And if you have some examples of that, that'd be great. The last two questions, um, you know, what impact is the delay in the new building code? Uh, because, you know, I look at in my district, we've got the Port Wallace development, you know, 4,900 units, 10,000 people, and I have residents tell me, well, why isn't there a section that's all solar panels? And why, you know, so what's that impact in delaying that building code? <laughs> And I don't know, I have to be careful this last question, you know, potentially, who knows what's gonna happen in the next two years federally, we may have a change in government. And that other government that may be in place, we may or may not happen, you know, what impact does that have on our country, our province, our municipality when we talk about fighting climate change? So those are my questions, uh, Mr. Mayor, Shannon and team. Just a few questions. Sorry. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Okay, so in terms of helping communicate with residents, uh, we think a lot about this. We have a dedicated communication specialist on our team now, which yeah. is amazing. Um, we've also recently hired uh, a climate specialist who is focused on KPIs and metrics and monitoring and doing this annual report and the virtual hub and sitting on all the working groups. And so her whole job is really to try right. and make that easier and working with communications and our team and others to figure out, you know, accessible ways to communicate it also, right? Because it's really a complicated conversation and but there are things we can do, I think, to really, um, to really help. And as you progress with that, please reach out to us because we're on the front lines having to deal with the interviews, having to deal with the media, having to deal with the citizens on you know, what questions do we need answered. Mm -hmm. if you don't mind, please. Yeah, absolutely. And we have frequently asked questions, I think even online, about like the climate action tax and things. Yeah. And we have some some pretty well-developed answers because we do hear from some of you time to time to, to, to provide you assistance in responding to residents. So we're certainly happy to help with that. We have more capacity now to do yeah. that, which is yeah. really great. Um, and I think the virtual hub will be really exciting once we get it off the ground. Right. I have high hopes for that for sure. Um, in terms of the transit uh, question that you posed. I don't know if you mean the greenhouse gas reduction of the 60 buses, or you said what's the impact of the 60 electric buses? Sorry, so yeah, so we're, we're investing in the 60 electric buses. We know the high level impact of that is, but what's, how do we measure, how are we gonna measure that, that was, that, that's a successful project? Uh, right, yeah. yeah, so I think, you know, we know uh, the emissions from every single bus and ferry, and that's part of the, the emissions tracking that we do. We know what they won't be with the electric buses. Uh, we can also do the same type of tracking around cost, so looking at our reduced operations and maintenance costs for these electric buses, but considering the extra costs in terms of adding in the charging infrastructure, but then not the fuel cost, so we can do right. all of that analysis, and I think you know that kind of work was done to make the case for the transition originally, um, but we'll definitely be tracking all of that, and we'll be able to show you numbers on that. Okay. Great. Okay, um, EV chargers timeline, Kevin. 
How about you? Right on. <laughs> uh, good, uh, good evening, uh, Regional Council. Kevin Bootler, uh, Manager of Clean Energy. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. Um, so uh, as Shannon mentioned, we do now have a signed contract for the supply and install and operation of our EV charging, our public EV charging, which is fantastic. Um, we've had the 75% design drawings completed for, uh, for a little bit now, uh, but now with this signed contract, we can now proceed to 100% design drawings, which hopefully will be done within the month. Um, and uh, we are hoping to start construction on uh, a number of sites by the spring. So that is the, that is the intention. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for that work. I know it's been difficult for you. Yeah. Indeed. It's going to be so great, though. Um, so in terms of staff, so we currently for the... Um, 23, 24 year have 27 full-time employees for environment and climate change. Um, and the ask for this, com this coming fiscal year is just for one additional. So the resource plan had called for an estimated 25 new FTEs uh, across the organization over three years as a as a best guess to really try and get moving on our climate plan. And we had eight and we had seven, we had three even before the eight and seven as we were even bringing the plan to council. And um, so we still have some left, but we grew so quickly the last couple of years. We really need to launch this, these working groups and see if we have remaining gaps and we're still finding places across our organization that do have some gaps. So we're kind of holding on those additional, especially because it's kind of difficult a, you know, a difficult budget year, um, or holding on some of those to see what what the priorities will be in the in out years. But the one that we're asking for, which we'll discuss at budget, is a transit focused position okay. on greening transit that would actually sit with environment and climate change with a dotted line to transit and sit on the transit working group to really try and bring the groups together and move things forward. So that's the ask for this year. Um, and in terms of the you know the seven that we got this current fiscal year there's only one that hasn't been filled yet and it will be filled by the end of March so really uh, happy to have kept my promise on filling all of the uh, positions that we got for this year knock on wood um, you asked about others doing net zero uh, cities across Canada are doing a lot of similar work that we are Kevin do you know if there's specific like administrative orders by cities I don't know if we yeah we don't have that level of detail yeah. but I know um, yeah that cities are also okay. Do, and we could actually look at that and see if they if they do it in the same way we do with an with an administrative order or something else and get back to you. Uh, delay of building code has been an interesting conversation of late. Um, you know, we formally participated in the engagement of the province on. Uh, what tier of energy code they were proposing, which is the lowest one, um, to let them know that it doesn't align with their climate plan or our climate plan or the national uh, targets for reduction. Um, but we were still really looking forward to the adoption of the 2020 building code because in this rapid housing climate, if we're building mm. all these buildings with higher emissions than necessary, right. uh, it's really expensive to retrofit. So we're either going to totally blow our targets or spend more money to not blow them down the line. So we'd really like to see um, more sticks in place for those energy standards of buildings. But, you know, we, we're doing what we can with our administrative order, and there are a lot of others doing things without that stick. Um, just, you know, there's some leaders in the space, which is really great, and we'll see what happens with when the province decides to do that. Hmm? Oh yeah, and we recently launched the Building to Zero Exchange just two months ago. Uh, Lara Ryan, who many of you may know, who used to run the Atlantic chapter of the Canadian uh, Green Building Council, yeah, Canadian Green Building Council, yeah, Green Building Council um, has been working and the this was, uh, HRM is a foundational partner alongside Efficiency Nova Scotia, the provincial government, some universities, things like that. And it, we're trying to copy the Green Building Center of Excellence in Vancouver uh, to build uh, capacity in labor force, in industry for green buildings. Um, and so there was a, a launch event in October for that and it's being housed in Net Zero, in Net Zero Atlantic. They're the secretariat. And, we're just, and we just found out we got some funding from the 
province to really move some things forward for that. So we're hoping that with that coalition, um, that really everyone is bought into, even Construction Association of Nova Scotia is another foundational partner. So really getting lots of the right people in the room to um, talk about green buildings and HRM, we're hoping some good things will happen there. And you asked about uh, federal government changes. Um, that was a really interesting conversation that permeated COP, actually. A lot of people were talking about that at the Canadian Pavilion, and I know um, there's some strategies that are being discussed about really aligning uh, climate action with health like some that are priorities of all of all government parties, uh, which, it's, which it really is, and that's a conversation that a lot of people have been having for a long time, as well as safety and public safety and also economics. So I think there's lots of um, good conversations and messaging that could happen uh, to keep things moving. It, it's still scary, but anyhow, yeah, my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Mancini, well. don't you even think about asking yeah. anything else? Yeah, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I said thank you very much. We just set a record with 36 questions from one councillor in one session. Uh, Council, uh, Deputy Mayor, could I ask you to come up and just take the microphone up here for a few minutes and the CAO is gonna speak and then we'll go to Councillor Austin. I'll just be a minute. Thank you. My uh, comment it was prompted by Councillor Mancini's questions and uh, some of the answers with respect to uh, buildings. And one of the opportunities that, uh, you know, ex exists for us is with Halifax Water and the renewable natural gas from biosolids if that project proceeds and if the municipality were able to um, derive the benefits of that renewable natural gas that would have a significant impact on achieving our corporate targets. So that's something I believe we're still involved with. Just a councillor Austin. Sorry, did you want me to comment on that or? Yeah, we, we actually have a working group um, of HRM leaders and Halifax Water leaders uh, to follow that project and we are hoping that we can get to a place to actually buy that renewable natural gas and uh, they're, they're quite on time with their project timelines so we meet um, as needed now but it was every couple of months through the last year on that project. So. Thank you, Shannon. My apologies for interrupting. Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, and uh, thank you to Shannon and Kevin and the whole team um, there doing this uh, really important work. Um, it's, uh, you know, crisis gets thrown all around a lot, but this one, this truly is, this is the challenge of our time, um, climate change. It's going to be the, I'm convinced it's going to be the one, you know, when my kids and their kids are looking back on this time and place in history, things that we're gonna be judged on is how we dealt with this issue because it determines what sort of world we're going to leave and what life on this planet is gonna look like going forward. Are we going to continue to enjoy a prosperous, comfortable future or are we going to go down to a much darker place? And so the, the, the choice is ours. All, all, every city, province, state, country around this planet gets to make that choice for themselves, which way they wanna go. And so I've been very pleased with the work we've been doing. Um, and you know, our plan is significant and that is not a watered down plan. It's hard because it's true to the science, it's true to the challenge. It, we bit off an ambitious piece of work. Um, the piece that I'm, and that's what I wanna ask about, um, and I asked this at Environment, but I, I kinda wanna hear from the CEO on it as well, um, is you know, we have a tendency, and I think it's human nature, right? And I've seen it here at Council, right, where you, you have an ambitious plan, and the message to council is everything's good, everything's good, everything's good, and then suddenly, oops, it's not good. And it's now too late for you to change things. I think that's how things went with our active transportation minimum grid when suddenly, you know, because several of us asked about that on budget over the years and got the everything's good, everything's good until suddenly it wasn't. And, or urban forestry is another one. So this report card's great. But what it doesn't really spell out, and I'm hoping is going on behind the scenes, is how actually do we move some of these items instead of just reporting on where they are? Where, where's the plan to actually then take some of the ones that are red, some of the ones that are in yellow, and move more of them over to green? Because we moved some of them this past year, but you know, if we're gonna hit the targets, they have to, they have to be moving to the green a lot faster than they are. 
Thank you. Um, that's a really great question. Um, a lot of the re so hopefully we're not just all rosy in our presentation and and we're we're being open and transparent that we are failing right we are failing at tracking towards hitting our targets on the mitigation side uh, in particular right with the with the emissions trends and trying to trying to you know speed up and do better on that and there's still opportunity to course correct but we are running out of time and hopefully that message has been consistent to council um, a lot of the actions that are in red are actually on the adaptation side because that's a newer area of work um, there's not a lot of uh, science and it, like it really is burgeoning I'd say like the you know the math around it the the um, economic rationale for investing like this even the tracking of assets and how they fare in extreme weather events is, is largely unavailable. Um, and then, and a lot of them fell to emergency management, which had very limited capacity until recently. So I think with the growing, capa growing capacity of community safety, now as a business unit, uh, with more positions there, and we're re really closely working with them on some of these, um, we'll see some of those actions moving. A lot of those kind of depend on that risk mapping work, getting the working group going, like that's the whole intention is to really start moving adaptation more quickly um, because we want to be better prepared every time for any type of extreme weather event that's coming to us and that governance model and putting the support around it um, we're hoping is going to help so you know it's an expectation that climate is taken seriously and put center of desk across business units uh, but not they're not just kind of it's not dropped on them there's a team supporting we have these working groups we have resources in terms of operating and capital dollars and subject matter expertise and that's what we're doing as a as our approach to trying to unstick some of the places we're stuck and move faster um, but in terms of mitigation especially community wide like needing to get 75 percent below 2016 by 2030 that's largely out of our control so what we can do is work with our partners and we have a whole team also on collective impact and engagement at, a, at environment and climate change and we have a network of over a hundred organizations in the Halifax network and we're trying to you know we've got the BTZX we're trying all kinds of things HCI 3 we're on the advisory committee like we're trying to get in everywhere to try and mobilize outside of the realm of our control as well. Okay, I'll come back. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Councillor Morse. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thanks very much for this report and for all of the work your team is doing. Um, I think you've covered a lot of the questions I had, but I, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about uh, how we're integrating our climate work uh, with emergency planning and uh, you know we we had some major events last year and i'm wondering if anything's changed as a result of those um, forest fires and the flooding of the sackville river have we pivoted or are we doing anything differently as a result of lessons learned there thank you through you miss deputy mayor to the councillor uh, that's a really good question and um, probably um, there are other people that may, maybe even the CAO would want to speak to this, but um, in terms of what we're doing at Environment and Climate Change, like we, we've been working with emergency management and community safety always anyways in the overlap of climate and safety. Um, but I think this, uh, the Resilient Communities Working Group and the Resilient Critical Infrastructure Working Group are really going to help us um, have a more kind of formalized structure, uh, really help identify the priorities and the issues. The whole idea of the governance model is that those working groups, it's not just to, it's not like your classical working group where you're advancing a project with a Gantt chart. It's, it's more, uh, let's get the right people in the room for the strategic thinking and the creative problem solving that needs to happen to really try and get past some of these barriers as they come up. So I think that having, and then having the kind of organizational support for those conversations and, you know, we're going to report quarterly up to the CAO. We're going to be providing regular updates to the executive directors. Um, we're, we really have the organization's support on, on this. So I think that's going to help us a lot. Um, um, and we work together on specific projects like the climate hazard mapping, uh, the storm kits, things like that, and we'll continue to do that going forward. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. 
Yes, and uh, but uh, with, will this working group also be involved with the regional plan and the update of the regional plan? Um, that's a good question. We, we've fed into the update of the regional plan as business units and divisions. Yeah. Um, I don't know timing wise if the working group specifically would be, but you know, there are executive directors that are gonna have eyes on each working group if they have staff in the working group. So, uh, and planning is part of several of the working groups as well. So um, yeah, I think that could definitely happen if it needed to. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I noticed that Executive Director of Community Safety, Bill Moore, um, has come into the room. I suspect he came upstairs to add to Shannon's answer on how the, you're good? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I, I just, just to respond to Councillor Morris's question, uh, Halifax Fire is now hiring, actually right now, for a wildfire mitigation uh, off a program manager. And so, you know, I think there's pieces in various different business units that are looking to address that bigger picture uh, when it comes to, you know, sustainability and mitigation of disasters. Um, so thank you for this work. This is great. Um, I did attend, obviously, your other presentation, but um, at Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee. But I did want to address a couple of things for you today. Um, with regards to the work that HRM is doing, we do have some uh, great partnerships that are taking place right now with the province. And uh, moving forward with um, various different uh, climate change initiatives, uh, either funded or in collaboration or you know, to create collective action, for example, which is awesome. But at the same time, I feel like there's maybe some pieces missing in that, um, you know, I've just heard that the province is gonna be uh, putting bike lanes on Peggy's Cove Road, which is awesome, that's great. Uh, but with that, considering the floods and the disasters, uh, with the floods and the loss of bridges and so on and so forth, you know, just trying to get a hold of what that's gonna look like as far as having that shoreline shored up. And so I just want uh, assurances that HRM is working uh, with the province on these initiatives. We have the opportunity to review them, to, to provide feedback, um, and those kinds of things. Because as time will show, Peggy's Cove Road will eventually become an HRM asset. We don't know when, but it would be good if it was built <laughs> in a sustainable manner uh, with our uh, team, at, uh, at our climate change team, actually feeding into that infrastructure conversation. So that's one question. The second question I have for you is around shared vehicles. And I know that this is you know, kind of under the umbrella of JRTA, but when we look at uh, supporting the municipality and our residents and businesses, especially those in the rural area uh, where they are underserviced as far as transit is concerned um, and tr transportation options, what opportunities uh, do you see in having more of a shared vehicle uh, car sharing uh, partnership uh, to support and enable uh, carpooling and car sharing in the municipality. And then my third question for you is around protection of wetland. And I know councils, you're gonna hear this from me over the next, what, how many more months do I have? Uh, seven, eight? Anyway, uh, when we look at uh, the municipality having uh, up to 1% of public land, um, you know, that is parkland, it, and yet we don't have anything, ex, uh, you know, any efforts to intentionally increase uh, our wetland protection other than the work that we're doing within the regional plan with developers and subdivision development and so on. Yet we've got the province looking at 30% or pushing, I think they're what, at 15% now protected land. Uh, I mean, the federal government has, has got, I think, it, uh, 30 by 2030 or, or some, something like that. So you see where the other senior orders of government are focused on land protection, whereas some of our policies is we're divesting of public land. Uh, so my question to you is, where are we at with having that conversation? Uh, maybe it's legislative um, control 
and uh, maybe there's options there, but, but I'd like you to just speak to what it is that HRM could be doing to ensure that we're protecting valuable and vulnerable uh, lands, such as wetlands uh, and watercourses and so on. And is there an opportunity to increase that 1% in our municipality and potentially stop divesting of our public land? Thank you. Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. Um, great questions. So, uh, I didn't know about bike lanes at Peggy's Cove, so no, they don't talk to us about things like that. Not environment and climate change specifically. That's okay. not to say that maybe they've engaged the city through other uh, departments okay. or something like that. But um, typically, no, I would say their public works team yeah. are not it's really right known on the to us. Line, right? There's not much of a shoulder there. Mm -hmm. I do okay. know that the province is um, redoing their their risk assessment, like climate risk assessment for the whole province. It was only done a few years ago, I think, but they're they're okay. updating it now apparently. I haven't got the full detail on that, but I wonder if maybe um, okay. it might almost be a need for the internal environment and climate team at the province to be linked up to that. the public yep. works team for something like that. But we do know the, uh, the climate team at the province, so I can just mention it uh, to them. So thanks awesome. for that. It, um, car sharing, I don't have really any educated opinion on this because it's really not my area of expertise. Um, I, I think it would be really interesting to talk about car sharing in relation to the integrated mobility plan and with transit. Um, and certainly our climate plan depends on the full, the full successful implementation of the integrated mobility plan by 2031 um, and uh, the increased adoption of transit and right and complete yeah. community so um, that's a really interesting um, thing to think about and I might just circle back with those teams and have a conversation on that. Um, and wetland protection, yeah, this is a really tricky one because we don't have uh, authority over our wetlands and what's done to them. Uh, and we, we actually have a wetlands working group that we've tried to kind of revive uh, between the city and the province and some experts in our community around wetland protection uh, because people can go and apply for um, destruction of wetland for development, et cetera, and it, it gets approved yep. without the city being involved, right? Yep. And um, and so, and we know that, um, you know, most of the wetlands have been destroyed in HRM, and the compensation that happens, if it's physical wetland creation, happens outside of the municipal boundary almost all of the time. Right. Um, and so, you know, that has impacts for even our permeability of our surfaces, like how much flood rain we can absorb. Okay. So we've been, we've been thinking about this and we had uh, an environment specialist specialist position, Emma Bocking at the time, who was a wetland expert. She was leading that working group. She left the organization, but her replacement is coming on board uh, next month. Okay. And so we'll be keeping going with that working group, but that's a really, um, I'd say like for us, our opportunities are in the green network plan, at the regional plan and, and with working with the planning department um, more than anything and then really thinking about protecting what we have, buffering what we have, yes. and then also some nature-based climate solutions and some green infrastructure. Yeah. Protecting what we have. Thank you, Shannon. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Cuttle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I kind of have this like bit of a pit in my stomach. Um, you know, I feel like when I get that feeling, it's mostly because there's something that needs to be said. And I feel there's a bit of an elephant in the room here right now. You haven't sugarcoated the fact that we are at a point that we need to take some serious action and see some serious change. I'm going to start with where Councillor Mancini um, started about communication. Um, you know, this is our update from December 2023. I can't share this with people because there's nothing in it. I read this part here about the Junos coming to Halifax. There's nothing in here about it being the green, greenest Junos. And I don't know if that, for that one night of that awards, if that's where I want to be investing time right now. I think we need to be investing our time in moving the needle on priorities. Um, 
you know, I look at this report and none of what we just talked about in the report that you have here before council today is in here. None of the KPIs, none of the information on the initiatives that we're working on, none of what needs to be done to move things forward. And I think that's what the public wants to see. We can't sell this to, you know, and it's not like I want to sell anything. I don't want to greenwash what we're doing. I want to know the nuts and the bolts, the tangible things that we're working on that are going to make a real difference about why we created this climate tax. Um, you know, going to COP is great. I think 70,000 people went to COP this year, which I think is crazy, crazy when I think about the environmental footprint of that conference in an oil producing country. I don't feel proud about that either. Um, I feel like there's big pieces that are missing, like the regional plan, to hear that that's something to think about and that that's not something we're already deeply embedded in and working on. Like, that feels, that, that's a concern to me. I look, about, I look at things like the, the building code. Yeah, we can affect the building code, but through our planning, we can affect the type of buildings that we allow and incentivize. Um, you know, we talk about in, in here the New Grams Grove, it being a wooden building, being lighter footprint on the environment. Meanwhile, you know, when we look at doing great big towers and concrete towers, we know those have a bigger environmental footprint. How are we informing the regional plan review about how to build a greener city? Like, I feel like these are opportunities that we need to take advantage of now. The storm kits, I think I brought this up last year. You know, we have the public safety office, EMO, CMTs. We have our partners in the community who are working with newcomers who can do that work. We don't need our climate action group to be doing that right now. We really need to be focused on the priorities of reducing our footprint and working on that infrastructure piece that might be difficult, but we are a coastal, we are a coastal city, we're a coastal province. We know that we have a lot of vulnerabilities and we need to start getting a solid plan on how, to, on, on how we're going to address those things. So do I feel great that we have Halifax? I do. But I think that we need to start tightening the screws a little bit here and saying, what are we doing and how are we going to do it? Because right now, I don't feel it. And I think that's the feeling that I have right now when I talk about that feeling in my stomach is that I don't, I don't feel it. And um, I, we need to take what was in this report and learn how to communicate that better and how to focus our energies where they need to be focused right now. So I love the idea that we're going to be a green Junos. I love the Junos. I love that they're coming to Halifax. But that's not something that I can go take back to my community and say, hey, this is what we're doing with Halifax. So um, I don't mean to be a downer here, but I think that we do need to be realists. Um, as you often say yourself, here's the reality. So it's one thing to put on the wall, here's you know, where we are since we you know, approved this plan five years ago and here's where we need to go and you know, that it's not a rosy picture. I don't think that's what Councillor Austin was referring to. I think what he was saying is where internally do we need to be focusing to make the changes? You know, coming to the table and saying, okay, here's the good things that we're doing, here's the challenges we're having and here's our, my thinking now about how we're going to start to address those challenges. I wonder, like, you know, is, like, do we need to have everybody in the climate and action team going to the different departments? Can we not bring people from the different departments into climate and action so that we're building skills internally around things? I, I, you know, I, I think like solid waste. They're experts in solid waste. They're an amazing team over mm -hmm. in solid Councillor, waste. Councillor, we're well past five minutes, and I want to give okay. a chance for the uh, team to respond okay. to that before we move ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you for letting me go on a little bit there because I feel very strongly about this, and I feel it is very important and urgent. Thank you. Shannon or Kevin? 
Mr. Mayor, through to the councillor, uh, thank you for those comments. I really appreciate it. And I'd say we'd always be open to feedback on things like the community update. So I think that was our third or fourth community update that went out. Fourth. It, fourth. It usually spans the last two or three months. It's done in collaboration with corporate communications. And it's really meant to be targeting the public writ large. Um, and so if you don't think it's hitting the mark from your perspective with your constituents, then um, I'd, l I'd love to dig into that. Um, there's a lot of different things we're doing to try and engage the public, um, and the public is uh, able to engage in climate in lots of different ways, some more than others, and so we try uh, in different ways to be really accessible with what we're sharing around climate. We're trying to not overwhelm. There's a huge feeling of climate anxiety, and so we're not trying to sugarcoat, but we're trying to have that balance of, of um, optimism and come and you can be a part of the solution, and there are things you can do. You don't have to be alone in worrying about this. Like there's a lot we're doing, you know, where we did the the human library at the Halifax Central Library that was very well attended where people could check out people like they were books that were subject matter experts with lived experience on different pieces of climate action, whether it's uh, mitigation or adaptation. And um, so the, and the community update was really done for council to be able to share with constituents because we had heard in the budget conversations last year and the year prior that residents didn't have a good baseline understanding of where we were. So if that's not working, I think we should talk with corporate comms and, and council about that. So I take your feedback. Um, just to, uh, I, I might have misspoke, but we are deeply, we were deeply engaged with the regional plan update as environment and climate change, as were all other business units. Councilor Morse's question was around the working group specifically, which haven't been created yet, and would they feed into this current draft? So um, just rest assured that we were deeply involved in collaborating with the planning department on environment and climate for the update. Um, the storm kit question, you know, we were actually just partnered with emergency management, ISANS, the YWCA, and partners like that for, um, to just to amplify work that uh, emergency management had already been doing and to provide some funds. So, you know, sometimes the partnership that we have is really just in the resource allocation from a funding perspective, and sometimes it's in kind with subject matter expertise, and sometimes we're leading the thing, right? And um, I, I, I like your question around where do the experts need to lie? Like, that's exactly what we're talking about with the mainstreaming. And so with some of the staff that we've hired, they some, some sit with us, and there's a dotted line to finance or a dotted line to communications or vice versa. Um, with transit, it's probably going to be sitting with us, dotted line to transit. Like we're doing all different types of, uh, slightly different than usual um, types of reporting relationships with the climate hires that we're doing. Um, and we're also working on climate training that's going to be mandatory for staff, an online mandatory training, and then also a full day course with human resources. And that stuff will be coming out um, this fiscal year. So we are trying to actually actually elevate the baseline education and awareness of climate across all staff. So hopefully that helps a little bit with that comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. In the interest of time, I'll skip straight to the questions. Uh, you know, disappointing that building code and also decarbonization of electrical system seem to be slower than we'd hoped, though I have some hope that the Nova Scotia Power's new plan is going to get us closer to where we want to be. It's not where we wanted to be. But for what we control, what I'm hoping is that there is a plan and some confidence between the CAO and, and you, Shannon, that uh, we're going to get up to speed. They're, they're, like what I saw in the report is there's a lot of stuff tendered or purchased and not here yet or staff who were just hired. So I'm hoping that we're going to be able to sprint and get to a place that next year there'll be fewer yellows and reds in the stuff we control and then hopefully the year after that none right i mean like like we have to you know as as councillor austin said almost poetically in the uh, cbc article i read this morning that we can't negotiate with the with the atmosphere right so so are we what what is our degree of confidence that we're in a position with the resources we have that we can get back to where we want to be because we've, we've committed deeply to the public to make sure that these things happen. Thank you. 
Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor, that's a really good question and really hard to answer actually. Um, you know, we have resources, but that's not what's getting in the way of some of the action. So, you know, we have the green light of the electric vehicle strategy, we have the money for the chargers, for the, for the vehicles, et cetera, but access, like successful acquisition of those vehicles is really challenging. And, you know, I think the conversation is that it will remain challenging for multiple years. So level of confidence that we are fully ready to take advantage of all the opportunities to drive that plan forward, that we have the resources, that we have the staff, yes, very confident, but with those forces that we are having a hard time working with that we don't control, no, I'm not confident. Um, we're, we're looking at some creative solutions, right? That's the whole idea of like we have an actual fleet uh, working group to try and work with procurement, with legal, with whoever, with partners to see if we can increase our buying power, if we can figure out different ways, if we want to even uh, think about something like not all new vehicles, you know, there's different policy pieces there. So, you know, we understand uh, the, a lot of the reasons why we're going slow on something like that and, try, and trying to find some solutions, but that's, it's very challenging. Um, same with the building market, right? So we have a whole deep energy retrofit plan for all of our corporate buildings. We've ramped up some staff capacity in the buildings group. We have resources, but moving those projects forward has been challenging challenging um, for a lot of reasons beyond our control, like even consultant and contractor availability, supply chain, and then the inflation of everything going so high. So um, those are the pieces that put us at risk, I would say. All right, that clarifies it. I think it just has to be spelled out somewhere between what Councillor Cutler was saying about like a little less sell selling of a sales sheet on Halifax and, and what, we got, uh, what we got with this report, uh, you know, pulling out this is what we can control and this is why we're not hitting these things in a more obvious way because I'm a little nervous about what the media reports are gonna be tomorrow, right? Like like it's gonna be a headline failing on our plan when in fact, uh, you know, to hear what you're saying, we're doing everything that's in the plan as fast as we can, but you know, if you go on any website right now to buy an electric car, it says, please give us a thousand dollars, you might get it in 18 months to two years. And I'm sure that's, you know, we're gonna face that for a long time. So, all right, thank you very much for that answer. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cuddle, quickly, we gave you your three minutes in your last five minutes, but I'll yep. let you go again. Oh, oh, not that much, it wasn't that much. Um, just, just really quickly, I just wanna reiterate uh, Councillor Lovelace's points around rural transit and a rural transit strategy and how important that is to us as a region, as a, as a regional municipality. We, need to f we really need to figure that piece out, whether it's through Park and rides, ride shares, rural transit models. There's a lot of communities that don't have any options, and they're asking for them. And so I think I think that needs to that needs to um, be more of a priority. And um, uh, yeah, I just I just want to I just want to chime in with that piece because I missed it, and just to reiterate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shannon and uh, Kevin. Ready for the question, colleagues? Thank you, colleagues, that passes. I just want to look, we're past our break time, but I want to see if there are things that, uh, I don't want anybody not to feel like they can discuss an issue they want to discuss, but if there are issues that can be dealt with without uh, discussion that could let staff not come back after a couple of public hearings, I'd like to consider that. 15-5-1, uh, you're gonna be here anyway, Ian, I think. Um, is there much discussion on 15-6-1? That's in Councillor Lovelace's name. Is there much discussion on that one? Is, just, do you want to put, put that forward for now? And yeah. Councillor Lovelace? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let's rock and roll. Uh, I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report and amending Administrative Order 50, respecting the disposal of surplus real property, AO 50, to ensure surplus land designated for affordable housing can support housing construction, including required provincial regulatory requirements for on-site septic disposal systems, groundwater, wetlands, and watercourse alteration. Seconded, Councillor Hensby. I think we all, we've already <laughs> demonstrated this yeah. is an issue. Thank you. Question? Okay. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. 
So that uh, carries, thank you. Uh, we have added items. Councillor Blackburn, do you want to put your added item on the floor? I don't think that requires a lot of discussion. Uh, I can do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So I move that pursuant to the Halifax Regional Municipal Charter sections 14.4 and 22.1, I request that Halifax Regional Council grant Councillor Paul Russell a leave of absence from all meetings, including Regional Council, Northwest Community Council, and Budget Committee until February 14th, 2024 to allow for medical treatments and recovery. I so move. Uh, nothing further to uh, add to that other than the fact I got a lovely text from uh, Councillor Russell this morning indicating that he just completed his last round of radiation treatment. And uh, so, uh, as I said to him this morning, now uh, let the healing begin. And uh, please know that uh, there is an entire room full of people here that uh, have his back and uh, will be uh, keeping the, uh, the seat here waiting for him for when he comes back on the 14th of February. Thank you. Here, here, Paul, if you're watching, we're all, every hand went up to second that. Ready for the question. Question. That's carried. I want to look at the end. 17.4 may require some discussion, but 17.1 is the minutes. Does somebody want to move the minutes of the in camera? Moved by Councillor Mason, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. All in favor? 17.2, is there discussions around 17.2? Is that something that could be considered without going in camera? Yeah. Councillor Mason? I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential staff report dated December 27th, 2023, and 2 direct that the private and confidential staff report dated December 27th, 2023 be maintained private and confidential. Second. Second, question. Councillor Mancini, ready for the question, colleagues on 17.2 in camera. That's carried. Uh, colleagues, is there discussion on 17.3? It's okay if there is, but somebody just wants to indicate. Move it. Councillor Mason. I'll move it. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private confidential staff report dated January 3rd, 2024, and to direct the private confidential report dated January 3rd, 2024, be maintained private and confidential. Second, Councillor. They were there, did it. I'll second it. Councillor Kent, thank you. Ready for the question? Has everybody voted? That's carried, thank you. So colleagues, by my count, that leaves two items. 15.5.1, it's the second reading. Is, does somebody want to propose that one or is there more discussion on that? Councillor Mancini. The following motion, the floor of the Halifax Regional Council adopt bylaw C1102, amending bylaw C1100, the campaign financing bylaw as set out in attachment one, revised, of the Executive Standing Committee report dated November 27, 2023, so moved. Second. Second by Councillor Lovelace. Uh, something on it, Councillor Lovelace? No, okay. Anybody, I wanna make sure people, if they have questions, ready for the question? Question. That's carried. The last item is 17.4. Will there be questions on 17.4? <coughs> Councillor Hensby, do you want to? I'll test the will of Council that uh, Halifax Regional Council adopt the recommendations outlined in the private confidential report dated January 9th, 2024, and to direct that the private and confidential report dated January 9th, 2024 be maintained private and confidential. Second. Seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Seeing no discussion, ready for the question. That motion is being voted on.
carried. Thank you. Before we go to notices of motion, Mr. Clerk, is that all that we uh, have I covered all our agenda items? Notices of motion. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move a motion to direct the Chief Administrative Officer to consider the information contained in the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables FOIPOP report and the RCMP ATIP report when preparing the staff report with respect to the Wildland Urban Interface Preparedness Strategies. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to propose first reading of bylaw S453, amending bylaw S400, respecting charges for street improvements, the purpose of which is to include select Halifax Regional municipality owned gravel roads. Thank you. There's no other notices of motion. We have a, two public hearings tonight beginning at six o'clock. Uh, I encourage people at home to watch. And uh, our next meeting after this is April, uh, what, 23rd? Budget committee begins shortly after that. We didn't go in camera. Yeah, we didn't go in camera. Okay, we'll take a break. We'll be reconvene here at 6 o'clock. Ian?
All right. You can, good to go. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everybody. Nice to see folks here at uh, City Hall. Thank you for joining us. We have two public hearings tonight. The first one is uh, a closure of Almond Lane, and the second one is um, around a development in, no, it's not. It's um, the amendments to restrict water lot infill. I didn't want to disappoint people, but that's what the second one is. So uh, the first hearing is on Almond Lane. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. The process will be we start with a staff presentation. We have questions of clarification from councillors, then we give the applicant an opportunity to present. After that, we go to the public hearing. Speakers can participate for a maximum of five minutes. So please keep your uh, comments respectful on topic and directed through the chair, same one. The clerk over here, the football player, fierce looking gentleman with the sign, uh, will announce when you have 30 seconds remaining and when your time is complete. After everybody on the list has been given an opportunity to speak, I will see if there are more speakers. So again, the first one uh, is on Almond Lane and respecting the closure of Almond Lane, and then we will get to the one on the restriction of the water lot infilling on the northwest arm. So, Mr. Clerk, is there any more presentation, any more uh, correspondence uh, around these uh, public hearings? No additional correspondence has been circulated for the first public hearing. Okay, so we will begin with um, item 12.1, and this is uh, a public hearing, uh, Administrative Order SC-103, respecting the closure of Almond Lane, and I believe we have Colin Walsh with us from staff, and he'll kick us off. Thank you, Colin. The, just before we do that, I know we have at least one elected or formerly elected uh, member. It's our, it's our tradition to acknowledge uh, elected and formerly elected uh, people. Uh, Michelle Raymond, I'm told, is, is with us. Where are you, Michelle? Uh, former MLA for, that would be Halifax Atlantic. Indeed, nice to see you. Um, and if I started to, uh, is there another one there? Is that Lisa? No. Yeah, Lisa Lachance, the MLA from uh, uh, Halifax Citadel is with us. Thank you for joining us, Lisa. And then we have a very distinguished crew of people, Orders of Canada. Um, a lot of people who've never ever been in jail. So thank you all for joining us here uh, this evening. Colin, the floor is yours on Almond Street. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Colin Walsh, project manager with Corporate Real Estate. Uh, the purpose of tonight's first public hearing is for council's consideration of administrative order SC-103, which respects the closure of Almond Lane. Street closures are enabled under the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, Section 325, which states that the Council may, by policy, permanently close any street or part of a street, and the Council shall hold a public hearing before passing the policy. Uh, this slide provides a brief overview of Almond Lane. Almond Lane is a six meter wide laneway which is located south of Almond Street and behind 2742 through 2774 Roby Street. Almond Lane was declared surplus to municipal requirements by Regional Council through the Administrative Order 50 process on August 23rd, 2022. If the recommended street closure is approved, HRM will subdivide and retain a three meter wide portion of Almond Lane immediately abutting Almond Street, which is required for the uh, future construction of a bike lane on Almond Street. This, this slide provides context for the recommended street closure within the context of the block bounded by Almond Street, Roby Street and St. Albans Street. Almond Lane is shown outlined in red on, uh, on this slide. The proponent uh, for this street closure seeks to acquire Almond Lane for consolidation with their abutting Richmond Yards development, uh, which is shown outlined in blue on the, uh, on the slide. If the street closure is approved, uh, the municipality would, would retain a public access easement over Almond Lane, which will permit its continued use as a public laneway uh, through the block. At, uh, at this time, Almond Lane uh, terminates mid-block and does not extend all the way from Almond Street to uh, St. Albans Street. 
if Almond Lane is closed and ultimately conveyed to the proponent, they have agreed to grant a uh, corresponding public access easement over their uh, PID 4150-3343, uh, show note wind in blue, which would continue the connection of Almond Lane from Almond Street to St. Alban Street. And the area of that proposed easement is shown outlined in yellow um, on the slide. And based on the information uh, presented this evening and included in the staff report dated October 6, 2023, it is recommended that Halifax Regional Council adopt Administrative Order SC. Colin, we, uh, we don't need you to read that. The councillor will read that when the time comes. Thank you for your presentation. Perfect. Thank you. And if there are any questions of clarification, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Are there any questions of clarification? If there's no questions of clarification, I'll open the public hearing. And the applicant, is the applicant here? Mr. Danny Shedra of Westwood. You wish to uh, address council. Good evening, sir. Nice to see you. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and members of council. My name is uh, Danny Chedder. I'm the president of Richmond Yards Incorporated, the developer behind Richmond Yards in the north end of Halifax. This is a project that's been under construction for the last three years, and there's two more years before completion. And part, why we're here this evening is part of our overall vision for the development. This development at Richmond Yards, when it's completed, will will how people will live and work at Richmond Yards, approximately 2,000 people. It's a fairly large development, as people could see as, as, as the project takes uh, shape. There's a sliver of land that uh, kind of separates the entire vision that we have for Richmond Yards. Richmond Yards is integrating the historic grid back into that part of the city. Both King Street and Clifton Street always end it at St. Albans Street. We've continued Clifton Street through Clifton Green and King Street through King Square uh, through our site to Almond Street. The third piece of this is got, well, what we call the North-South Passage. It's a third north to south thoroughfare that uh, a part of that uh, thoroughfare is owned by HRM and we would like to purchase this uh, sliver from HRM to fulfill our vision. The reason for that is is that Beyond our development, there's two uh, things that's happening. is the uh, crosstown bike lane coming down Almond Street, which we worked with HRM to accommodate uh, with removing, moving our development back. But the second piece is the uh, uh, priority transit corridor uh, that will eventually come down Roby Street. To really, ha if, if we were going to be a city of the future and have a priority uh, transit uh, city, uh, it's very important to do it right and acquiring this land would allow us to put our parking for this development on Almond Street, access from St. Albans Street, so therefore all the driveways along Roby Street would be eliminated and all the access to these properties along Roby Street would be off this new laneway called the North-South Passage. So it does fit in the vision for our development, it fits in for the vi vision of our city as a, f uh, a city of a priority transit corridor and uh, we feel like we've worked very closely with staff to, to bring this here tonight, and I hope that uh, Council would uh, see, share the same vision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cheddar, and appreciate that very much. There's no questions of clarification from Council. We'll move to the speakers list. Uh, nobody, Mr. Clerk, has signed up to speak, but if anybody wishes to speak to this issue of Almond Lane, they're free to uh, come forward now. Anybody wishing to come forward to speak to this? Anybody wishing to come forward to speak to this? Anybody coming forward to speak to this? Seeing that there are no speakers, I will, um, I don't think there's much that the applicant needs to respond to. I will ask for a motion to close the public hearing. Councillor Mason, seconded Councillor Lovelace, all those in favour? And we will go to debate. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Put the motion on the floor that Halifax Regional Council adopt Administrative Order SC103 as set out in Attachment 3 of Staff Report dated October 6, 2023 to permanently close Almond Lane, Halifax as a street and authorize the Chief Administrative Officer to direct the clerk to 
certify a copy of the policy passed by council incorporating a survey or a uh, made his bonds description on of Almond Lane and to file the certified copy of the policy in office of the Halifax County Registry of Deeds and the Minister of Public Works. Second. Second to Councillor Mason, Councillor Smith. Nothing, nothing on this item. I, I think it was uh, very clear with the staff presentation and the applicant presentation on the purpose. And it's a small sliver with not much current public use. So I, I support this and uh, look forward to when the public can use it better as a, a thoroughfare. Thru Thank you. <clears throat> Nobody else, are we ready for the question? That is uh, carried, thank you. I want to thank Colin and I want to thank uh, Mr. Chedra, like some other councillors who've had a chance to see this project developing and we appreciate your willingness and enthusiasm to work with staff uh, on being, as you said, a city of the future for transportation, bikes and uh, buses. Thank you very much. Okay, <clears throat> that's carried. Um, we're gonna move to project uh, 2023-01544 MPS. Municipal Planning Strategy Land Use Bylaw Amendments to Restrict Water Lot Infilling on the Northwest Arm. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Again, the process will be that we start with a staff presentation, then questions of clarification. Uh, there is no applicant, in essence it is us. After that we will go to the public hearing. Um, speakers can participate for a maximum of five minutes. Again, I point out the intimidating figure who will hold up the signs. Hold a sign up, Mr. Sir, there letting you know when uh, your time is up. Um, Mr. Clerk, any other correspondence on this? Correspondence was received and circulated all members of Regional Council. Very well, okay, we'll begin. We'll begin with staff. Mr. Burnell is with us tonight. Sir, take it away. Hello, Council, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Reese Burnell, I'm a planner with the strategy, uh, strategic products uh, team with Halifax Regional Municipality. Tonight I'll be presenting on uh, planning project dash 2023 dash 01544 regarding the NPS and LUB amendments to restrict water lot and filling on the Northwest arm. Just to start with some site analysis context. So the property in question or the area in question is the Northwest arm in Halifax. The picture to the right shows uh, the water lots along the Northwest arm. There are 155 water lots in total encompassing about 51.56 hectares in area. The Northwest Arm is regulated by two planning areas. The north side of the Northwest Arm is regulated by the Regional Center plan area, and the south side is regulated by the Halifax Mainland plan area. These water lots are designated and zoned water access within both of these planning areas. Just a little background. Uh, so currently infilling activities on the Northwest Arm are regulated uh, and fall under the jurisdiction of the federal government through Transport Canada and uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. As a result, HRM currently does not have jurisdiction to regulate infilling on the Northwest Arm. Although HRM could not regulate in, uh, as it, at this moment regulate infilling activities. HRM is able to regulate the use and development of uh, land once a water lot is infilled. In May of two, 2007, Regional Council passed land use uh, bylaw regulations within these permitted legal uh, boundaries for water lots to help disincentivize infilling on the Northwest Arm. In October of 2023, Justice Canada and Transport Canada gave their support to HRM uh, to have a limited jurisdiction over water lot uh, infilling activities on the Northwest Arm. This limited jurisdiction would require applicants receiving ministerial approvals before uh, for infilling on the Northwest Arm uh, to be compliant uh, with HRM's municipal land use regulations. With this limited jurisdiction in mind, uh, staff had put forward amendments to the Regional Centre Secondary Municipal Planning Strategy, the Regional Centre uh, Land Use Bylaw, uh, the Halifax Secondary Municipal Planning Strategy, and the Halifax Land Use Bylaw. Uh, these amendments would restrict infilling of water lots uh, on the north of Sarm to the following permitted uses. Uh, these permitted uses include uh, public infrastructure, 
utility uses, publicly owned or operated ferry terminals, parks on public land, municipal, provincial, and national historic sites and monuments, and retaining walls. There was a public engagement piece uh, for this project. Uh, public engagement was facilitated through a mail-out notice um, to property owners within 200 meters of the Northwest Arm. This, uh, in um, this uh, was a total of 464 property owners uh, within these 200 meters. Um, Respondents were able to uh, send through email or phone call their um, their comments regarding the proposed amendments. In total, 114 respondents uh, came back with their comments of, and concerns regarding the project. 108 re uh, respondents were in support of the, the proposed amendments. Two individuals opposed the proposed amendments, and four individuals did not specify whether they were for or against the amendments. Key concerns were outlined from the public. There were general concerns with regarding to infilling from the public, um, mostly on the impact of uh, that infilling could have on recreational activities within uh, the Northwest Arm, this being boating, uh, sailing, and paddleboarding, among other, other, other recreational activities. There are also concerns on the impact of the lobster fishing, uh, fishing due to infill on the Northwest Arm and potential environmental impacts due to infilling on the Northwest Arm as well. There are also comments regarding the amendments that were proposed. Um, one of the main concerns was uh, what would be considered a retaining wall and how would they would be regulated. Uh, to um, address these concerns, staff uh, included a definition of a retaining wall uh, into the proposed amendments to have more clarity of what we're, of what we're proposing. Um, and we also included more regulations in terms of how uh, how far a retaining wall can project into the water lot uh, with regards to infilling. Uh, there was also some clarity that people wanted on uh, what would be considered infilling. Uh, staff included a definition of water lot infilling to provide more clarity into that. Um, and then there was another concern about how crib wars would be regulated. Uh, staff also included a uh, definition of cribbing for wars to have for more clarity of what we're looking for for that and their permittance, permittance within these proposed amendments. With this being said, uh, staff is recommending the following recommendation to council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Reese, is there any <coughs> questions? Councillor Cuttle? Um, I was just wondering uh, if you could please uh, just talk a little bit more about the definition of infilling and of retaining walls. Um. Apologies for that. I'm just looking at the definition right now. But, uh. So with the definition for infilling, um, the definition uh, specifically says that water lot infilling means the placement of any fill material within a water lot, um, but this does not include cribbing for any approved wharf under the Canadian Navigable Waters Act. Um, so we had a definition in terms of um, what fill material would mean in terms of uh, water lot infilling, which we further explain. Fill material means sand, gravel, rock, clay, soil, other natural uh, materials. Um, so these would be uh, the materials specifically with regards to what would be would be infilling. Um, and then there was a, with the retaining wall, right? The question about that? Yeah, so within our definition of retaining wall, um, we included definite as it means a vertical or near vertical structure that holds back sand uh, gravel, rock, clay, soil, or other fuel, fill material, uh, and prevents movement of material downslope or erosion on the site. Um, so people just had uh, some questions about specifically, because uh, first off, we had retaining walls into the proposed amendments, but we didn't really elaborate um, on in terms of what that retaining wall would look like and what that would be composed of. Um, so just to provide further explanation, that's that's kind of what we inserted into the proposed amendments. And and how will the retaining walls be restricted from? Yeah, oh, yeah, that point? too. Um, so the retaining walls will be restricted by, essentially they would be restricted by um, 
in the regional center there's a reference line which specifically is uh, surveys the line between um, the land boundary and the water lot boundary and they'd be restricted by two meters from that reference line to um, for infilling uh, beyond that reference line into the water lot and that's that's the maximum that they would be able to project into the water lot all right thank you yeah. thank you councillor hensby just furthermore on retaining walls um, is there a description on the both report and trying to have clarification on retaining walls they could be either uh, engineered manufactured building blocks concrete whatever or they could be as far as um, stone walls or it could be uh, uh, crib work so I'm just trying to get a clarification of what the retaining wall may be constructed of but I'm also kind of curious about shoreline rehabilitation if they want to put rock liners back down where the shoreline may have washed away a bit and stuff and they want to reestablish that shoreline would they be using the the present shoreline configuration that was there or could they go back and historically refer to the profile was made many years ago so I want to have clarification of, of what shoreline profile we uh, we're, we're talking about and also the province of Nova Scotia do they have any jurisdiction I know there's a reference in the report about Miss Pally Chester but I always thought the below the ordinary high water mark the province had some jurisdiction so I want to clarify why is there no provincial intervention or, in, or provincial uh, acknowledgement of should there be any provincial intervention between the ordinary high water mark and the low water mark? So I just want to have clarification on those points. Let's see, Luke has joined us. Luke Willett, Principal Planner of Strategic Projects. Uh, in terms of your first question, the retaining wall, the structural elements wouldn't be um, something that we can actually control in land use bylaw. That's just kind of an engineering thing. And there could be, and I'm not sure, but there likely are some requirements that the federal government has or the province in terms of structural elements and what you can use in terms of fill material. Um, in terms of the shoreline, the profile in terms of heritage, so what happened uh, in 2007 is we, uh, on the, but on the mainland side and peninsula at the time, they adopted the shoreline that existed um, when the amendments became effective. Now there were further amendments back in 2011 uh, that involved the Bedford um, Basin and at that time they kind of like almost readopted so the shoreline would have been adopted as 2011 on the mainland side based on the, the Bedford Basin amendments that came later. On the, um, so in terms of determining the shoreline it's probably be not um, an easy task because they would have to go back to aerial photography and try to determine roughly where that line is and that would be done by a, a land surveyor. On the peninsula side when we adopted the regional center land use bylaw in 2011, uh, 2021, we uh, decided to hire a firm to actually determine a reference line so it's based by a land surveyor so it's one that's static and it's not moving and it's quite easy to make a determination because there's coordinate points throughout uh, along that um, line. Um, it is offset by probably a meter from the actual shoreline it's like give or take because if we had wanted to go much more um, definite it would have probably cost over a million dollars to do that survey but we could do it a bit cheaper by having a bit of a tolerance and I think the tolerance is about a meter or so from the actual shoreline um, so in terms of your question for the heritage uh, profile I guess of the shoreline um, likely there's a bit of that that would be within that reference line um, but you know like it depends on when when you would be taking that that shoreline heritage, uh, how far do you go back? Um, you know, it's kind of based on erosion. I know on the on the mainland side because it's based on the 2011. Um, I guess the flight for aerial photography would be based on the 2011 time period. So any erosion that would have happened following that, um, you know, you could have room to infill without being beyond the shoreline. In terms of your, your question about jurisdiction for water lots and promise, I mean, uh, Mr. Trace might be able better to answer that than me. I, I know there's a Beaches Act that kind of comes into play and they were, the province is certainly involved in the 2007 amendments, um, but they're looking at it more from a Beaches perspective uh, and is there a beach uh, still on the Northwest Arm? I guess for a portion of it maybe, but for most of it probably not. John? Mr. Mayor, through you to Council, 
Uh, I, I would just simply add that the municipal planning bylaws don't supersede or, or otherwise take on the provincial. The Provincial Beaches Act would also apply to the extent that it applies at all in, in the Northwest Arm. So you have to, any, anybody who is looking at building a retaining wall or hardening shoreline or, or any other activity still has to meet all the provincial requirements as well as any federal and now the municipal uh, uh, bylaws. And one last question, how many of the 114 respondents, how many were actual water lot owners? Um, I'm not sure, just off the top of my head, but quite a, quite a few of them were, and they like uh, they would clarify if they were or not. So probably on the top of my head, maybe about you know 12, 12 of them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There's no other questions. Then I'm going to open the public hearing, and since we are the applicant, uh, there will be no applicant uh, speaking. We've heard from staff. I'm going to go right to the list. Um, I'm going to give the first 10 names on the list and then people after that if they wish to speak can indicate. Greg Akins, Alan Shaw, Michelle Raymond, Nancy Anningson, Anthony Rosborough, Michael Scott, John Hennigar Shue, Judy Robertson, Danny Chadra, uh, Philip Saunders. Uh, Greg Akins. Come right here to the uh, microphone here, the stand up one and the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, yeah, um, my name is Greg Akins and I'm a uh, marine um, consultant, a professional mariner. I've been doing uh, marine risk analysis as my specialty um, across all Atlantic Canada, all the way up to Montreal and Quebec. And I did uh, a <clears throat> risk assessment on the Northwest Arm in the context of the infilling issue um, for Transport Canada, um, I guess a couple of years ago when this issue first came up with the application to infill. And um, essentially, uh, the, the, what it comes down to it's, uh, for a risk assessment is you're looking at um, marine safety, and so safety of life, and it's a pretty basic uh, equation. Up to a third of the arm could be lost to infilling um, if, 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 it, if, if all lots were infilled. And so you look at a probability of risk of collision in a risk assessment, and it's uh, obviously if you have less water, same amount of boats, um, you, your risk of collision um, goes up and therefore um, it's a safety um, issue. And so I think that's uh, an, an important um, point. The other thing is that it gets worse each year because we have uh, more and more of the uh, personal watercraft who um, greatly exceed the, um, the speed uh, limits on the arm and are driven by people. I think their qualifications, they have a driver's license and a credit card. And uh, they, drive, <coughs> they, they drive at uh, excessive speeds through the arm, and so they're basically an accident waiting to happen. Again, you narrow the waterway, you're increasing the risk of a, of a very bad accident, and PwC is responsible for most of the serious physical harm accidents across the country on the waterways. And my final point is that uh, it's not only an infilling issue, we talked about uh, cribs a minute ago. Uh, if, you, if somebody was able to um, establish a dock all the way out to the end of their water lot, you're essentially restricting the waterway in, in a similar way to infilling. And so I think that needs to be a consideration and there should be some regulations regarding how far out in their water lot they're allowed to uh, establish a docking system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Alan Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Uh, my wife Leslie and I have lived on the arm for 33 years and have used it almost all our lives. We have worked with the Ecology Action Center, neighbors and friends for the last three years to stop arm infill, urging all levels of government to take action. I want to thank Mr. Brunel and congratulations for all of your hard work leading up to this most welcome proposal uh, for HRM to regulate water lots, pre-confederation and other. On, on the arm. We thank and congratulate Council as well for voting in favour and all staff at HRM for their hard work. So many have put in years of study, research, letter writing, phone calls, meeting and connecting with officials at all levels of government. We appreciate and thank you all for getting us to this very positive place. We know how much work remains to be done and offer our support in every possible way. We want to emphasize the point that the vast majority of the people using and enjoying the arm do not live on the arm. Only 155 families do. 
The Wag Wallet Club has 2,300 family memberships, and CEO David Greaves tells us that this means 6,500 individuals use this facility. David estimated that the squadron has 2,000 memberships, meaning three to 4,000 individuals. In AYC, somewhere around 400 memberships at 1,500 to 2,000 individuals. Then we come to the St. Mary's Boat Club. As we understand, no memberships, but used by thousands who otherwise might have no access to the arm to row, canoe, paddleboard, and kayak. People from all walks of life and especially important to newcomers. Furthermore, these four clubs have numerous events year-round bringing people to the arm to attend memorial services, weddings, birthdays, holidays, etc., and most of them would not be members of clubs. The arm is important to all of us. Should all pre-Confederation water lots be filled in, as already been said, 31% uh, of the arm is gone forever. Arm infill has sped up in the last two decades, and this will continue because of the domino effect. Even some on our street who have worked so long and hard to eliminate all infill have speculated that if an infill takes place, then they too might have to infill their water lots to protect their access to the water. This must not be allowed to happen. The arm has an active lobster fishery in winter, dive boats reside on the arm year round, tour boats in spring, summer, and fall, and a number of parks on or very close to the arm. Any infill limits these uses, from sailing lessons for children to tour boats taking visitors from our cruise ships. Any narrowing of the arm causes erosion issue and stirs up sediment, several hundred years of industrial contamination, and dangerous red lead anti-fouling paint. Climate change is a fact of life, and sea levels are rising, and Nova Scotia is sinking, both causing, for example, Build Nova Scotia to having raised new boardwalks and wharf expansions by a whole meter. Some of this, a lot of this has already happened. Obviously, the arm is equally affected. Arm infill is public water being appropriated to create private land. From the, the Big Ma who looked after these waters so well to the settlers who operated industries on them, to now when our prime concern must be to preserve and protect them for ourselves. For the public good, let's do what's right, protect the arm for all, forever. In summary, we agree with what's proposed Please vote in favor of HRM regulating any infill on the arm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Michelle Raymond, Nancy Anningson, and Anthony Rosborough. Michelle Raymond. Hello and good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, and thank you very, very much for this. Um, I have to say this is a really good news story, and as I think you all know, there have been decades of work that have gone to bringing all levels of government to actually take up their responsibilities, and I would say responsibilities in regards to an absolutely critical public resource. Um, I always, I tend to look at things from the point of view of the environment and of history, but the protection of the Northwest Arm and the waters of the Northwest Arm is the protection of past resources and current resources and future resources. Um, I look at the historical things. I'm aware, I'm fortunate enough to have lived on the Arm for almost 60 years now, and I have watched particular pieces of shoreline as they've changed, as the, the shoreline itself has come and gone, as the tides have come and gone, and I see tides rise higher and higher, and I'm well aware, as I'm sure you are, that there are, um, there are both historic resources which are present uh, and that have been mapped going back 250 years, and that there are current landowners who probably want to protect their, uh, their, their assets, their gardens, and so on, but which, uh, who are in fact facing rising waters, and we look at this daily ourselves. We see rising waters. Um, 
but there's the protection of historic resources. There's also the protection of environmental resources. There's a rich intertidal zone, which uh, is very important to the fisheries, not only in the arm, but outside of the arm. Uh, there's a long, long tradition of fishing, which continues to this day. I've seen it change myself over 60 years, but it remains, and we continue to see the native fishermen setting buoys, uh, fishers setting buoys daily. Um, and of course, it's an important, a very important piece of recreational, um, a, a recreational environment, and it has some of your, uh, the city's most important uh, recreational infrastructure there. I know you've invested very heavily in it, and I hope we'll continue to. Um, but if the waters are restricted and this very narrow channel is further narrowed, it is in some places as narrow as I believe. Uh, 500 feet or less. If this channel is further narrowed, then you're, you're going to be dealing with, uh, you know, greater pressures from the tide. I mean, we all remember the Bay of, we see the Bay of Fundy. Um, so we have recreational, natural, private, and public resources, as well as environmental resources. But you spoke a few minutes ago about the city of the future. And I always think of, uh, you know, I think of the reason for citing Halifax, which is what it was, was it was produced as a defensive garrison. It was put on a peninsula because it was easily defensible. And that peninsula has Halifax Harbor, and it has what I call the back harbor, which is the Northwest Arm. And the Northwest Arm is not just a nuisance. It is not just a barrier to transportation. It's a really important transportation resource, which I hope in time will be developed because it allows for water transport, all kinds of flexibility, and personal use. Now, I will say that the personal watercraft are something that could afford, perhaps, to have a little bit of um, attention paid to the, their use. But these are, these are the things that allow keeping that flexibility. And water, of all things, is one of the most flexible things you're ever going to have. And if you preserve as much water as you can in the back harbor, you're going to be preserving the future of this city and the viability of the city, as well as its own economic health and the recreational health of the citizens of today and tomorrow. So that, thank you very much. And I really hope that you will be voting for this because it's, I think it is a good news story for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nancy Anningson followed by Anthony Rosborough. That we're speaking, oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. I'm delighted that we're having this discussion. Um, my name is Nancy Anningson. I am a longtime Halifax resident. I live in the West End, and I work with the Ecology Action Center, an environmental charity working in our communities, uh, trying to protect the environment and prepare us for the impacts of climate change. Um, in February of 2021, a concerned coastal citizen sent me a newspaper ad that had a private citizen on the Northwest Arm proposing that they wanted to infill out 1,668 square meters of infill into the Northwest Arm. The reasons they stated in the advertisement were to protect the shoreline, to reclaim land lost to erosion, and to maximize their use of their property. This was rather alarming, horrifying. Uh, I said to the person, this can't be right. Don't worry, <laughs> we'll figure this out. We'll get to the bottom of this. And it turned out it was right. There was this odd jurisdictional glitch that individuals could make application to the federal government, to Transport Canada, to infill out for a whole variety of purposes. The province was not in a position to restrict that from happening and to, to make decisions on that, and Halifax was not. Now, as we know and as the staff report outlines, Halifax did try, has tried, and put some effort into disincentivizing infilling out into the arm back in 2007. But even with those efforts, there are a, a group of folks out there in the world who are very skilled at exploiting soft spots, uh, opportunities, ambiguity. And we've seen a whole lot of boat houses all around the arm that don't have a boat in sight or a paddle or a life jacket. They have leather couches and televisions. So it was a terrible situation. 
a whole bunch of us rallied together and said, this can't be right. This is not shoreline protection. This is shoreline massacre, and it's an offense to the community. The Northwest Arm is one of those special places that citizens on, in Halifax use to reach the ocean. Um, and it's such an important waterway and such a vibrant coastal ecosystem. So we raised our voices, as you know, because you've been hearing from us for a long time. We wrote, all of us and yourselves included, uh, wrote 2,200 letters to Transport Canada about that particular application. We distributed, made and distributed hundreds of signs that were displayed all around the city. We had more meetings, calls and emails than um, many issues that I've dealt with over the years. And we mobilized and thankfully, so did mayor and council. You, you've been loud, you've made some noise, so have our MPs, our senators, our countless community members and organizations. And after all of that effort, we entered a bit of an uneasy holding period until September 2023, when thankfully Transport Canada has given us this special opportunity and Halifax has seized it. And for that, I am so grateful. I'm so thankful to the Planning and Development Committee who've been working on this. This is not easy work. Um, I'm glad you've been doing the steps of the consultation. It's more limited in scope than I would have liked to have seen and the Ecology Action Centre would have liked to have seen. But I know it's speedy and you've already heard from us so, and we're heading in the right direction, so I'll keep that to myself for now. I am concerned, I'm not a planner. I don't like reading planning language. I have read the staff report countless times. I will offer a caution, and that is that the retaining walls issue, I think, is a soft spot still. I hope that it's not. I have a lot of faith in, in the folks at Planning and Development, but I also know from the work I've done in Coastal over the years that people will find the opportunities to exploit and stretch and bend and accept fines to do things they're not allowed to do. Um, I don't want us to be back here in a number of years. Um, if you say you can make a retaining wall that's within six meters, I can guarantee you, you will see six meters used, if not 10, if not more, it'll be death by a thousand cuts. So I, I am not a planner, but I hope that the language, especially about retaining walls is strong enough. There is no reason to be infilling out into the Northwest arm, especially with climate change. So please make sure this is strong enough. Don't let us get exploited. Don't let us be in a terrible enforcement situation. Please ensure that we get it right for this opportunity. And thank you so much for doing this. Please vote this through. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anthony Rosbro, Michael Scott, and uh, John Henniger Shue. Anthony, good evening. Members of Council, uh, Your Worship, Municipal Staff, Clerks, thank you for welcoming the public's input and involvement in relation to this important issue. Uh, my name is Anthony Rosbro, and I am a, a lawyer and law professor at Dalhousie University. I'm a lifelong sailor and a member of the Armdale Yacht Club's Committee of Management. Um, I grew up on the Purcells Cove Road, and the arm has been central to my family and community. I'm here this evening to speak in favor of the proposed amendments, as well as to provide some observations uh, and suggestions for clarifying its intended purpose and scope. First, I'd like to impress, though, upon uh, regional council, and I believe other folks have as well, that the view that the Northwest Arm is indeed a public asset. In my role at Armdale Yacht Club, I oversee the club's educational and learn to sail programs, and I've been in this highly involved uh, volunteer role for over four years. And during that time, our educational programs have expanded tenfold. Uh, last year, we received over 260, that's 260 enrollments in our learn to sail programs from community members. And a core program we offer is called Broader Reach. Uh, and this is, this is a no cost opportunity for newcomers and underprivileged youth to get on the water and try sailing. So we partner with other community organizations. And we use sailing and on-water recreation as a way to bring people together uh, and build community. Um, our efforts have been recognized by Sail Nova Scotia, Sport Nova Scotia, and we've recently been awarded uh, an award from Sail Canada. Um, Broader Reach is also the subject of a short documentary film uh, produced by CBC that you can find on YouTube. So, and so contrary to the perception uh, that some of the large homes along the Northwest Arm shores might give, um, the Arms Waterway is used by people from all different backgrounds uh, and communities. Uh, many participants in our programs reside in other parts of the municipality, um, some traveling in from as far away as Hammond's Plains or Porter's Lake. 
Um, the vast majority of sailors in our program, um, including adults, don't own a boat or have access to one outside of, their pro of the programs that we offer. Uh, and some participants have enrolled in our programs year over year uh, because it's the only affordable, reasonably affordable way of continuing to learn how to sail. And so as Nova Scotians and Haligonians, we take pride in our rich maritime history and our connection to the ocean, yet so few of us have access to it. And so we celebrate the blue nose on our dime and our license plates refer to our province being Canada's ocean playground, yet the perception is still that that playground is very much a private one and not a place for all of us. And so if we want to build vibrant communities uh, in this city and a future where on-water recreation is accessible for everyone, we need to preserve important public spaces like the Northwest Arm. So I call upon Council to see the importance of these proposed amendments as something that's in all of our interests and a part of our collective future. The Arm is unlike other areas of our harbour or bodies of water in the municipality. Um, it's very narrow with only one way in or out. Um, it's highly affected by tides, as we've heard, and vessel traffic and other other attributes. Um, so these wide-ranging and varying uses render it necessary to consider a careful and bespoke approach to municipal regulation. And so with that in mind, I have some brief remarks about how we could improve the proposed amendments. And the first, of course, relates to that definition of infilling. So, so there are many access points to the Northwest Arm, uh, boat ramps, boat launches, wharves, piers, that require activity for maintenance that shares some overlap with infilling. And we ought to be sensitive that those kind of uh, maintenance and good upkeep um, don't, don't sort of require perhaps a development permit when that's not in the spirit of the amendment. <coughs> Second, the exceptions listed in the proposed amendments uh, need greater, greater clarity. Um, the proposed amendments list a number of permitted grounds for infilling, so for example, historic sites and monuments and utility use. But Council should ensure that development permits issued for infilling on those grounds are reasonably connected to those uses or necessary for those uses. In other words, we need to make sure that those grounds don't provide a blank check for infilling. Preservation of historic monument ought not to allow an entire lot to be infilled, for example. So the grounds at which a development permit should be rejected ought to be clearly set out. So with these caveats aside, I think the municipality as a whole should be applauded for taking uh, leadership on this issue. And I know firsthand it was no easy task to get here. It's the work of many. So I'll repeat that the arm is a place for connection, learning, and enjoyment of our city's natural beauty. And let's do the right thing and ensure that this priceless recreational asset is pre uh, preserved for generations to come. Thanks very much. Thank you. Folks, we have a rule that we don't have applause uh, during council. We're not going to arrest anybody, but uh, please uh, re refrain from uh, such dramatic uh, examples of exuberance. Michael Scott, John Henniger, Shu, Judy Robertson. Thank Good evening, you, Your Honor. Good evening. Um, I don't have very much to say, but I'd like to look at this from the perspective of a visitor. I'm not a visitor, but I am a come from away. And one of the things when I first visited ha Halifax that struck me was two things, actually. The Northwest Arm and how fabulous it is as a place for recreation, enjoyment, and beauty. And the other is the public gardens. And when I left the city and subsequently came back to live here, those are the two places that I remember as being iconic. And so when I heard that there was even the possibility that people could infill, uh, notwithstanding the reasons and the ownership and so forth, uh, it struck me as beyond absurd, I mean obscene. And to me, it's sort of, a, imagine this, imagine that somebody had permission through some backdoor means to put a driveway in the public gardens or a parking lot. I mean, okay, nobody has ownership rights to do such a thing, but to me, allowing infill into the Northwest Arm is pretty much equivalent to that. So I'm very glad to see that this motion is coming forward and encourage you to please get it done. Thank you. Uh, John Henniger Shu, Judy Robertson, Danny Chedra, and Philip Saunders. Uh, good evening. I'd like to speak really enthusiastically in favor of this uh, motion. Uh, 
I've uh, spent the last years of my life uh, hovering around the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic, and one of the things that I learned when I went there was that uh, we have uh, lots and lots and lots of photographic evidence of the public use of the Northwest Arm. And, uh, you know, there were times uh, in the past where uh, there, there could be thousands of people gathered on the arm and around the arm to look at uh, canoe races and uh, sailing races and uh, so on and so forth. And it's, it's, it is one of the premier public spaces in, 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 in our community. And I think that uh, the, uh, the quality of, of our community going forward is going to rely on the proper conversation between public spaces and private spaces and, prop and, and maintaining the proper balance. And, uh, and, and, and infill the proposed infilling on the arm is, uh, is a proposal to take, take away public space uh, by stealth and uh, put it into, uh, in, into private hands where, where people would be prohibited from going. And uh, that's, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't comport with our history on the arm, and it doesn't comport with the, the way that we need to be going forward uh, in a progressive, uh, towards a progressive city of the future. And uh, I have, uh, I have just to close a, uh, a warning from a great Canadian philosopher, uh, Joni Mitchell, who, uh, who said, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Beware what they seek, or we'll end with Northwest Creek. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judy Robertson, Danny Chandra, and Philip Saunders. Good evening. Good evening. This um, <clears throat> morning, uh, Mayor, Councillors, staff. I'd like to thank you, really, on behalf of all the citizens of Halifax, because this is about all the citizens of Halifax, for taking this initiative, uh, because I think it's really important. Um, I'm lucky enough to have grown up on the Northwest Arm, and myself and two of my sisters own properties. All of us have pre-Confederation lots on the, uh, on the Arm, and we are all in favor of you moving forward with this. I hope my sister is. <laughs> um, the, you know, the intention of the pre-Confederation lot was to put your little fishing boat out front and have your fishing nets. It was not about infilling and taking fill from uh, construction sites and dumping it in the arm to make it inert. Um, because obviously when the, a lot of uh, uh, rock is broken up in Nova Scotia and it cannot be dumped into a lake, it can be dumped into salt water to become inert. So the arm uh, cannot become the dumping ground for any development. Um, the arm is basically the commons, the water commons of Halifax. Uh, the Halifax Rowing Club is one of the oldest rowing clubs in North America and the Cogswell Regatta is the oldest rowing regatta. I believe in North America, and if we continue to encroach on that water space, and if 30% of the arm could be taken up, uh, you know that regatta will not exist anymore. The sailing programs, and we've already heard from different yacht clubs, but you know it, it puts in jeopardy the use of the arm, the use of you know the safety in the arm. I teach navigation, I teach personal uh, survival, marine survival courses, and radio courses. So I'm really involved with uh, marine training in Halifax, and you know I see a proliferation of boats on the arm, a, a variety of different boats. But if you take away 30% um, potentially of the arm, then uh, you're causing, you're going to be creating a much more dangerous environment. It's already hard enough to organize all the boats in the arm, and uh, those numbers are only going to grow as people enjoy the arm even more. Um, sorry, my little notes here. 
Um, and as uh, Anthony Rosbro said, he's with the uh, Armdale Yacht Club. And uh, there is something about federal land there. And Armdale Yacht Club, I believe, is owned by the federal government, the property. So I would never want to see that property to be infilled. Um, <clears throat> and we also talk about how far you can, uh, you know, the, these crib wharves being built out. The arm uh, was dug out by glaciers thousands of years ago, and pretty well everywhere on the northwest arm there is a natural drop off. And if that, uh, you know, can somehow be put into consideration about how far the crib can go, because I have to say the property we grew up on the arm, we had a crib wharf, it went to the edge of the drop off. And it, most of them are out, you know, maybe six, eight meters from the shore. And then it drops off, and it's deep. You can put any boat there. You don't have to build out any further than where the drop-off is. There's only, actually, in front of my place in Dead Man's Cove, where there's no drop-off. Everywhere else on the arm pretty well has it, except right up by the rotary. Um, you know, we have this beautiful gift of beauty and history that Michelle uh, alluded to with the history of the arm. And to take away, um, you know, it, that, that history part could be so easily destroyed and uh, it has the potential to be destroyed. And, you know, this initiative that you're taking, um, you know, if we step forward a couple hundred years and if we were to allow infilling, people would look back at our generation and say, what were they thinking? And I would say, well, they weren't. But we are thinking now. And we're being very progressive on this, and I applaud you for doing that. Um, yes, and we talk about uh, fishing in the arm. I do see the lobster boats going up and down the arm. Now that the water in the arm is clean, and we can thank HRM for having done that, and so we have a much cleaner body of water. All you have to do is go up the Dingle Tower and look down, and you can see the drop-off. You can see the cleaner water. So we've been making these efforts to make the arm and make the harbor a safer and a better place, and so people are back using the arm because people weren't swimming in the arm because it was dirty, and now it's clean. So, you know, as we move forward and we need to be a progressive community and you know I see that's what you're doing for us and I really hope that uh, you will uh, continue to move forward with this motion and I was going to use that line about you know pave the parking lot well you know I guess we're all on the same page here but if we infilled paradise we'd put up an infill lot thank you thank you very much Danny Chedra and Philip Saunders uh, good Logan. evening. Uh, I grew up in Dartmouth. Still love Dartmouth, and the only reason, and the only reason I moved from Dartmouth to Halifax, is the waters of the Northwest Arm. So uh, to be attracted to such a body of water for us to fill in the Northwest Arm, I don't think we would be. I would be in favor of it. We've been a resident of the Northwest Arm for 23 years and we like it the way it is, and we want to preserve it. So I would say my family's in favor of what council is uh, bringing forward to try to protect this body of water. I would like to bring to your attention, though, uh, a few things that I want to ensure that maybe council should be aware of. I was one of the original developers of Regatta Point. And Regatta Point has a beautiful public walkway. And my vision, and hopefully it's the vision of this council, is to someday see that public walkway continue to Horseshoe Island. And to do that, it will require some infill of the arm, but at the very end of the arm where it's not really navigable by pleasure craft. And I'm hoping that that portion of the arm, which is at the very end, could be um, cross-hatched or something to allow for, hopefully in the future, for, and why is it so important is because uh, Previous speakers talked about the Wake Waltic, the Yacht Squadron, the Armdale Yacht Club. These are all private clubs that you have to pay to belong to. The ordinary citizen does not have access to those clubs and therefore does not have access to the water. Continuing a public walkway from Regatta Point to Horseshoe Island, it could be another park. We have Dingle Park, which as our population grows, it will become over capacity. So having an Armdale Park at the very end of the Northwest Arm with bike lanes and uh, public walkways would be a beautiful addition to our city, but that will require some infill. So although I'm opposed to infilling of the Arm, I would hopefully that council will see my vision 
of our, our, you know, and especially the councillors from Herring Cove and Purcell's Cove Road, because that could be their waterfront park. And uh, the, although the St. Mary's Boat Club is a public park, but there's no bike lanes and there's no public transit. So really, it, although it's a public access, the public has limited access because getting to it is very difficult. So maybe I'm here tonight for the general public to say, yes, we, we want this policy, but with the one exception is along the, the Armdale Rotary, if we can keep that aside for maybe in the future, seeing another park at that end of the arm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Saunders, Philip Saunders, I see we've been joined by another uh, serving member, which is Andy Fillmore. Thank you for joining us, sir. Mr. Saunders. Uh, good evening. and. Uh, <laughs> My name is Philip Saunders. I uh, teach at the Dalhousie Law School, so I'm here with colleagues and friends and taught in the Marine Environmental Program for a number of years and have been interested in this, uh, the subject of infilling uh, and the jurisdiction over the arm and other waters in the municipality for some time. And I, it's appropriate I'm at the end of the parade because I'm about to rain on it a little bit. Uh, I understand why people are supporting what they can get. Um, what they can get from this uh, bylaw, unfortunately, is not nearly what Halifax Regional Municipality should be able to do. And that is to, on its own power, constitutionally, ban infilling with exceptions. Not relying on the friendship of members of the minister's staff in, uh, in Ottawa. I noticed the the actual operative paragraph here, that this sustains so long as the minister's staff make the recommendations necessary. We have elections, and we're going to have one couple of years. Are we going to be doing this again? Uh, my basic point, uh, which I'll try to uh, simplify, I, I sent a, a report to council staff a couple of years ago on the legal arguments supporting uh, HRM jurisdiction over uh, the seedbed and subsoil of water lots, whether or not they are infilled. Uh, and it was my opinion then, and it's my opinion now, uh, and I will redistribute that report to anybody who wants an updated version of it. It's my opinion that quite clearly under the constitutional structure and a regime dating back to the Keene case in the UK in 1876 and passing on through numerous cases since, that the, eight, the Northwest Arm and a number of other bodies of water in the municipality are part of the province of Nova Scotia. Under the Doctrine in Kane, they also become part of the adjoining municipality. Uh, the constitutional argument, as it's phrased in the staff report, simply says, well, over these waters, uh, navigable waters and fisheries and oceans have jurisdiction. And I would add a critical word, they have some jurisdiction and so does the municipality. The entire structure of the division of powers and how it's resolved in Canada is based most often on concurrency. And HRM, under provincial legislation, has concurrent jurisdiction over that area. Uh, the critical uh, point is that this seems to be geared to situations where the municipality will have their planning guidelines adopted by the federal government. If you think about the navigable waters permits and whether or not they are in conflict with provincial regulation or municipal regulation of land use, you think of dual compliance as the Supreme Court of Canada has frequently. If the navigable waters unit issues a permit for constructing a, somebody's whatever, all they care about is the navigation. It's, it's nothing to them with municipality said, no, you can't do it at all. The two are not in conflict you can be in compliance with both laws. And as such, concurrent jurisdiction can survive. As because we can do it, we should. Because it's not just the Northwest Arm, which is the most favorable description you could get of a place where you shouldn't be infilling, it's other places, like the frontage in Dartmouth. So my preference, I see you know, the way the wind is going. I understand why the people who fought for this for so long, the right impulse, we have a few years, it has to go through because that's what's available. But we should be moving towards a bylaw that 
on an open discussion and debate in this council of the ability of the council to take the action that it is constitutionally capable of taking, uh, then move to a bylaw that is stricter and assumes the jurisdiction that the municipality rightfully has, rather than relying on a promise of a minister staff who might not be in that office in a couple of years' time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's the, the end of the list of those who signed up. We'll now just take people who wish to speak uh, as they uh, raise their hand and be recognized. So we'll go here and then here. Just ask you to uh, come forward, give us your name, where you reside, and the floor is yours. I'm David Lewis. I came to Halifax with my parents when I was 17, and I now live at 1343 Hollis Street. I have a small wooden boat on a trailer, and I am on, I, go, I launch it on the northwest arm in June, July, August, and September uh, at the uh, launch site at the base of Jubilee Road. What a delight it is to be there. But you must understand, you won't understand unless you have been there in July and August, how busy it is. I'm out there in my sailboat with no motor, oars and sail, that's how I get around. There are uh, classes from the Armdale Yacht uh, Squadron of young children learning to sail, and just across from them, the Wagwaltic Club. So you can visualize this cluster and this cluster, and then uh, when you get up as far as Point Pleasant Park opposite the Nova Scotia Squadron, another cluster. So there's all of us out there. It's a delight, but it's crowded. So uh, my, I decided to come down today because to uh, thank you for providing this facility for me. I live in a rental apartment, I have a boat, I sail it alone, and I'm able to do it. But it, it is very crowded in July and August, and I wanted you to know that. Thank you very much. Yes, welcome. Just tell us your name, where you live. <laughs> Uh, good evening, councillors. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to be here. I think we're seeing uh, real municipal democracy in action, uh, and I'm excited to see that. My name is Joanne Roberts, and I live in Danny Chedra's development in, in Regatta Point, uh, not right down on the arm, but I can attest to his vision. I get to walk on the seawall daily from my home and it is a delight. Um, I'm gonna just echo Phil Saunders a little bit. Uh, I applaud you for doing this. I am speaking in favor of the amendments, and uh, I want to congratulate planning staff and your member of parliament who's here, who I don't always agree with. Some will remember me as someone who ran against him. But we, we agreed on this, uh, that there should be no infill in the arm. And I think he's worked very hard to make it happen. But this is not bulletproof, and I think Philip Saunders has it right. I, I hope that in passing this, council will then consider, do you have the fortitude and the finances to bravely go and ban infill so you don't depend on a changing federal government? Uh, because you know what happened in 2014. We'll just leave it at that. There's another government that thought differently, uh, and that is still possible with a few of the, uh, often you keep civil servants and I hope they'll all stay in favor of what you want done in the minister's office, but that isn't guaranteed. So you may have to bravely go and take a decision that may be challenged uh, so that we can find out if concurrent uh, laws can exist. I believe, like Mr. Saunders, that they can. Uh, I think municipalities are losing some of the jurisdictional ground they have. I think you should hang on to it. I think we're going to need your wisdom and your grassroots democracy for a long time to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Who else would like to come forward? Just raise your hand and 
recognize anybody else who wishes to come forward? Is there anybody else who wishes to speak on this motion? Is there anybody else who wishes to speak on this? Is there anybody else who wishes to speak on this? If not, then um, I will uh, ask for a motion to close the public hearing. Councillor Mason, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, all in favor? Aye. Council, what is your, I want to thank everybody who spoke tonight and all those who've come out. There's obviously a great deal of interest in it. Uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Cuddle? Sure. Um, I'd put the motion on the floor. I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt the proposed amendments to the Regional Centre Secondary Municipal Planning Strategy and the Halifax Municipal Planning Strategy, the Regional Centre Land Use Bylaw and the Halifax Mainland Land Use Bylaw as set out in attachments A, B, C and D of the staff report dated December 6, 2023 to restrict water lot infilling on the northwest arm. Second. second, Councillor Mason. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you for everyone who has come out this evening to show your support for this motion. Um, you know, as has been mentioned, we are an ocean province. We're a coastal port city that we are founded on a harbour. And recreating, sailing, working, um, fishing is, on the ocean uh, is, part of our, is part of our history. Um, you know, I really see the Northwest Arm as an extension of our public common. Um, it's a place where people canoe, sail, kayak, boat, uh, do polar dips at the end of uh, South Street, picnic and paint in, in Sir Stanford Fleming Park, um, as well as uh, all the other things that were mentioned by the people here. It's, um, it's amazing to see the number of people that come down to the Northwest Arm to enjoy its beauty and its water. Um, it's a very, very special place as someone who, who also enjoys being on the water in all different kinds of ways. Um, you know, this space, it's protected from the ocean, open ocean. It's a, it's a safe, sheltered, special body of water that is remarkably right in the heart of our city. And it's, it's still usable to, to go out and, and, and use. There's, there aren't big ships there. Um, I, I acknowledge the issues with uh, some of the speeding boats, um, but that's, that's another issue. Um, you know, I think that this is really about, um, you know, protecting the public good and the environmental good over private interests. And this is a, a natural asset that deserves to be protected for its own integrity and in the marine life that it supports. So um, I hope uh, everyone here today, we can support this motion. This has been a long time in the making. It's been, it's been several years. Um, I've looked back at my email threads that go back to uh, January 2021. So that's a good solid three years. And um, I'd be very happy and excited to see this, uh, these amendments passed this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Mason. Uh, the hour is late, and yet I still would like to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, it was uh, really gratifying to walk in the room and see so many people, though I was briefly afraid you all wanted to speak. So thank you for your <laughs> restraint today. Uh, and, and it's been a long time coming, and there's some people who spoke today who have been uh, consistently talking, talking to us and to me about this for the 10 years, that uh, 11 years that I've been here. Uh, and I'd like to thank our federal partners and MP Fillmore for the recent clarity that we've been able to get from the ministers uh, to make sure that uh, we could comfortably go ahead with this. And I think it's entirely reasonable that we should have a bylaw that speaks to what we value as a community and what we think is important before we allow development permits to be issued on, on infill in the Northwest Arm. So I'm glad to see we've finally gotten here and that we're taking this appropriate control and, and advice of uh, uh, this process uh, to make sure that the, what the municipality values is crystal clear to the minister uh, without stepping into uh, the federal or provincial jurisdictions when it comes to navigation or beaches or any of those things. So I'm glad we're here. I'd like to thank my council colleagues who've worked so hard on this, and I'd ask for your support. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kent. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm happy to support this. I think that one of the uh, um, presenters spoke to a significant challenge that is often um, at play in the district that I represent, um, which includes water lots in and around the Eastern Passage, uh, Fisherman's Cove area. They, I, and, and I think that, that that kind of consideration draw, and, and this kind of, of innovative way to, to, to protect and, uh, these, these areas are vitally important and they draw out these kinds of conversations because because how, how many other times would we as a council have the opportunity to have this many people in the room with this kind of knowledge, historical knowledge and insight. So um, uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this kind of move to protect this important space. The Dartmouth side um, and my district in particular has a lot of water frontage, front, water frontage that has historically been lost to heavy industry. I think about the Imperial Oil space and and uh, the the Fort Clarence that's there and the historical um, space that and 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 activity in the waters of the harbor um, associated to many areas that are within district three so I'm pleased to support this I think this is the water is equally important as it's been noted here is the land um, often I reflect on the islands that are in District 3, uh, McNabb's Island, Lawler Island, and, and um, George, uh, Devil's Island. And the water is part of that. So I, I, I'm happy to support that. I hope the council will support it. And again, thank you to not only the, the citizens that came out tonight, I'm sure there were lots that also contributed through the journey that got here, and staff for being open to this type of uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I too want to thank everyone for coming out and, and speaking so passionately on this issue. <clears throat> for my residents in St. Margaret's Bay, uh, you know, we're, we're thanking you because this will, I'm sure, create more discussion of protection of our coastline. And yes, we are a municipality and we do not have jurisdiction over our coastline. But clearly, as uh, uh, Philip uh, had alluded to, Philip Saunders, there's more work for us to be doing to ensure that we have a progressive municipality and protect our fisheries. St. Margaret's Bay in particular, uh, and all along uh, the coastal line, there are numerous pre-Confederacy lots. So I think you've, you've started more homework for us to do. So I just wanted to thank you because I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion to ensure that we don't stop here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, I will just also uh, say um, please that we are where we are. And I, a lot of people here have been involved in this. Uh, Alan Shaw, you've been on this for a lot of uh, years uh, and for all the right reasons. So I thank you for the leadership that you've shown. Uh, our, our MP, and I got to give a tip of the hat to my old seatmate, uh, Pablo Rodriguez, who was Minister of Transport, took this on, and uh, you're, uh, I know you nudged him quite a bit, and perhaps some of us did well. Uh, that's where we are today. Thank you all very much for being here tonight. Ready for the question? Question. That motion is unanimously carried. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Commissioner, could you please arrest all those people? We gotta thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, staff. Thank you uh, for all that you've done. We are, I believe, adjourned. Thank you.